Spotlight is an artist portfolio development program where Music CC provides skills for artists specific to their individual needs over a period of nine months to one year. These training sessions include stage performance skills, vocal training, and helps us to identify those artists who are ready to take their talents internationally. Music TT conducts auditions every year, so to be in the know, go visit their website and follow all their social media platforms right now. Some Spotlight artists have been cast in international productions like The Lion King in London and Summer on Tour in Italy, Bali, Singapore and Canada. Some have even been nominated and received awards at various local award events. Spotlight is open to all genres, however, Music TT is making special links with international agencies, producers, and industry executives that has a special interest in artists and music with Caribbean flavors. It is recommended that those who apply have moderate to significant performance experience and are actively creating a catalog of music. Hey, this is Ruel Lynch. And as a music producer, I am always listening out for the latest inspiration for my beats and information on the music business. That is why I am sharing all the information about the Trinidad and Tobago International Standard Recording Code, TTISRC. It is a code that will improve our local industry because it will measure, track, and index sound recordings from our country. Plus. This code is required by digital distribution companies to sell our music online. So for me, any track I'm producing for my artist will have this unique code. Join the movement with me and get the international standard recording code for all your new releases. I'm Tanil Amore and I'm a singer-songwriter from Trinidad, but I have been living all over the world and I'm currently living in the States, which I'm sure you can tell from my accent. My music is a mix between pop, reggae and hip-hop. I sing and I rap. And last year I put together a proposal to Music TT for support in the work that I'm doing and was successful in receiving support from them. I'm extremely grateful for that because I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing without that. I would encourage anyone who's thinking about putting together a proposal for Music TT to do it. I think that Trinidad has some of the most talented artists that I've ever met and I've worked with people from all around the world including Shaggy, Mr. Vegas, Bungie Garland from our very own Trinidad Tobago, John Legend, Pixie Lott, the Black Eyed Peas crew, Michael Franti's team. I'm working right now with some of the producers that were a good chance, the rapper. The progress that I've been making has been incredible. I am currently actually in Las Vegas because I'm working with Erica Badu's management team now. And I've been in LA for the past month. I am working with a bunch of producers here. I've been working with Trini producers as well. The most recent was track seven. We did a song together and also I did a song with Caleb Hart. I've been doing a lot. I have a song called I Am A Girl that was picked up by the United Nations as their anthem for International Women's Day. In LA I'm working with some of the people at The Record Plant, one of the best studios in LA, to do a relaunch of the song I Am A Girl that will be released later this year with some massive features on the song. With the help of Music TT I put out two videos. One of them was called Bad Name which speaks about the importance of consent and is in support of the Me Too movement and time's up, so obviously very relevant to what's happening in the world today around gender equality and female empowerment. And then I put out another song called The Grace, and that song features some voices from women in Tanzania because I have an organization in Tanzania called EPIC, where we drill clean water wells and do community growth and development. So on The Grace, I sampled some of the women's voices from Tanzania and used them on that song as well. The video for The Grace was shot and edited entirely with the support of Music TT. Same thing for Bad Name. I think that it's so important that the government continues to support 
the work of our incredible artists. Truthfully, the talent in Trinidad is some of the best that I've seen. So thank you to all the team at Music TT for supporting what I'm doing and supporting me in this current project. Looking forward to working with y'all some more. I have a lot of things in the works, some of which I can't even talk about yet, but I'm very excited about. I'm gonna continue doing everything in my power to represent Trinidad in the best possible way. Support Music TT, they're doing great things. Red, white, and black all the way. Always love watching that video from Tanil. <laughs> So good morning all, and thank you for joining us again today. This is day three, we've made it. This is day three of the music conference, the Reverb Experience 2021. We want to thank you again for all the love you shared yesterday via your posts and encourage you to definitely keep them coming. Post those screenshots, those selfies, the I am attending flyers, etc., and be sure to tag at Music of TT and hashtag Reverb Experience and Reverb, and sorry, and hashtag Music of TT. I'm just stuck on Reverb at this point. For those of you that were unable to attend yesterday's lineup, which focused on the theme Data Driven Future. We are grateful, but in case any of you missed it and would like to check it out, you can visit our Facebook or YouTube page. The full lineup of sessions from day one, two, and three will be available for viewing till the 31st of October. It will not be available after that. So today's lineup is all about the theme festival culture. The Caribbean, as we know, has a predominant festival culture when we look at our entertainment sector. We, we are heavily focused on in-person events and didn't incorporate much tech except to run the show, of course, which, as we know, since the beginning of COVID, has not been to our favor. So today's session looks at the challenges, best practices, incorporating tech, innovation, and music cities. That said, here's today's lineup. So today's keynote is titled Reshaping the Festival Experience and will be presented by Dr. Joanne Tull, who is an academic researcher and consultant in Caribbean creative economy development with a particular interest in festival entrepreneurship, festival statistics, cultural heritage and development, cultural industries, impacts and strategy. The focus for this keynote will be on Carnival, which is one of the largest revenue generators for Trinidad and Tobago, for those of you who are our international audience here today and which has been shut down due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Performance halls are closed. There is no congregation in public spaces allowed. Well, that was recently lifted to some extent. Um, bars, lounges, hotels, everywhere where the bellowing streets and sweet sounds of music could be heard. So what's next? How can we better be able to future-proof our live music, festival culture, and more? The keynote will be followed by three panel discussions, Future of Live Streaming, which will be moderated by Music TT's very own Mate Manmohan, Greening Festivals, brought to you by New Fire Festival, and Businesses and Live Music, brought to you by Sound Diplomacy. After the panel discussions have ended, we invite you to access the Zoom networking link via the conference website, reverbexperience.com, that's R-V-R-B experience.com, where you can pose questions to the panelists about the day's topics, meet and greet, and share about some of your activities. Then we head back over to our YouTube and Facebook page for the music showcase featuring Music TT's Spotlight program alumni and the current Spotlight participants. So on this note, Please stand by as Dr. Tull takes the stage shortly to present the keynote, 
titled Reshaping the Festival Experience. I am Melissa Jimenez, General Manager of Music TT. Here's hoping you have a great day. And Dr. Tull, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Good morning. Is everyone hearing me? Thank you, good morning. And do give me a moment, allow me to share my screen. Let me just pull up the correct one. Technical difficulty. Right. Hmm. Having some technical difficulties switching between this screen and my screen. for some reason. It's not allowing the present to, sh to share, which should not happen. Hmm. Right. Do let me know if you can see this screen in the chat and let me know. Music TT Export Academy is an initiative geared towards music business education and capacity building through workshops, conferences, and webinars. Music TT partners with stakeholders in the local music industry to host conferences annually. You want to win a gold medal and you started training last week. It doesn't happen so. So why disrespect this industry by trying to do the same thing? It does not work. It will never, ever work. As Music TT seeks to build capacity in the music industry, topics are determined by current trends that can have an impact on revenue generation, as well as highlighting opportunities that have export potential. What I got out of it, I got a lot of clarity in terms of understanding how um, the differences of exploitation, because we hear the word and we're afraid when we hear exploiting the music. And so I was able to understand how the positive sides of exploitation of music really works for you as a songwriter, as an artist. Reverb is Music TT's webinar series where veterans of the music industry share their knowledge and experience. It's streamed live on the last Thursday of every month and a replay of the webinar is posted on our YouTube page. 
be sure to subscribe to be notified. It's Rome, and um, I just want to say that I appreciate what Music TT is doing in terms of the different ventures that they are putting in place to try and help promote the music industry as a whole. Oh, Music TT, yeah. I must say, um, from the live music district straight to the Spotlight program has been yeah. amazing to me. I have done lots of performances. I've grown throughout those performances as well as the Spotlight program. It has made me an all-rounder when it comes to being an artist. I want to say thank you to Music TT for giving me the opportunity to, to showcase my talent. This has been uh, an amazing, an amazing opportunity. I would like to commend Music TT on all the work they've been doing on artist development and artist awareness and getting them ready and kind of creating a platform for a lot of the younger artists to kind of get themselves into this space and get them to people like me. Which is fantastic. My God, it's been such a pleasure being a part of the third cohort of this Music City Spotlight program. We learned so much. We learned so much in this program about branding, about marketing, about photography, you know, your image and marketing yourself out there. In this cohort, I got to do a single. Y'all, that was the best experience working with Daryl, one of the best songwriters in Trinidad. I couldn't have asked for anything better. I was really, really excited to work on my new single with the team provided by Music TT. Thank you. I was able to not just sing my heart out, but show off some of my writing skills as well as learn how to improve on it. And I'm really happy with the music that we were able to create. Hey, what's up everybody? This is Daryl Gervais and I am here to fully endorse the TTISROC codes for any single person that I'm working with. Um, for those that don't know, I am a songwriter and producer and I love the fact that we now have these because it's a perfect way for us to track our music. It's a perfect way for us to start laying a claim into the world of music coming from up to an island republic. so much from Music TT Spotlight program. This professional advice, guidance, knowledge. If you want to get that edge in your creativity as an artist, I will highly recommend you be a part of this program. I really recommend the Spotlight program because it's it come for artists. It's just all about developing you as an artist, no matter how far along you are, no matter where you want to go with it. It's something I would recommend you. Spotlight is an artist portfolio development program where Music CT provides skills for artists specific to their individual needs over a period of nine months to one year. These training sessions include stage performance skills, vocal training, and helps us to identify those artists who are ready to take their talent internationally. Music TT conducts auditions every year, so to be in the know, go visit their website and follow all their social media platforms right now. Some Spotlight artists have been cast in international productions like The Lion King in London and some are on tour in Italy, Bali, Singapore and Canada. Some have even been nominated and received awards at various local award events. Spotlight is open to all genres, however, Music TT is making special links with international agencies, producers and industry executives that has a special interest in artists and music with Caribbean flavors. It is recommended that those who apply have moderate to significant performance experience and are actively creating a catalog of music.
Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us this morning. A special good morning to Chairman and CEO of Music TT, all other specially invited guests, stakeholders, and students of the CCIs. Good morning to you all. Permit me before I begin to offer a commendation to Chair and CEO and the team on this outstanding initiative, our Reverb, RVRB, I believe they pronounce it Reverb which has brought us together for the last three days to discuss matters pertinent to our futures in the arts and culture. I am quite grateful for this opportunity to share my perspective on a subject that has often drawn me into interrogating its relevance to our development. And so this is where I want to begin my discussion. I am quite aware that the idea of the festival beyond its aesthetic value has increasingly come to the forefront and continues to hold our attention, not just here in Trinidad and Tobago, but across the region. And I see these values taking the form of contributing features, as I'm showing here, that collectively have spawned a festival experience of varying forms and contexts that has come into significant demand. It is these on it is these contributing features that highlight the festival relevance that have led me to reason that the festival experience essentially comprises two key elements, which I consider to be the culture of experience and an experience of culture. And I'll come back to that a bit when we get further on into the discussion. Now, whether you agree with my idea of the festival experience, what we do know is that the festival has always been an interlocking element within the broader landscape of the arts and culture. And within the last three decades, as you see on this slide here, um, it has become very pivotal to the entire cultural and creative industries ecosystem, notwithstanding of the COVID pandemic. As my colleague and co-author, Dr. Deborah Hick Gordon at ICS UWI Mona has mapped out here for us, she has indicated that there are over 18 CCI sectors with 40 plus subsectors. Just yesterday, she was telling me more come in, more come in. And if you look at her mapping, I'm sure you could see the festival and the festival experience located across each of those sectors and subsectors in some form or fashion. It is therefore not, or it ought not to be surprising though there, of course, remain some misbelievers amongst us, that the festival over time has generated some notable effects on the wider socioeconomic landscape, as I have indicated here. And if you notice, development impacts not only deal with economics, but certainly if one is to consider transformative development, it must take in consideration the sociocultural features as well as you see transform of social cultural landscape there on one, one of the edges of the star. Those impacts at this time, as we all know and appreciate, are considered in jeopardy at, because we have been forced indoors, separated from each other, a major contradiction to the arts and showcase of the Caribbean festival experience. Although this lamentation has been raised primarily for the carnival here in Trinidad and Tobago, it is to be acknowledged that other traditional but non-secular festivals such as Ramlila, Diwali, Huste, Orisha festivals have all contributed variously to these impacts of blind here. In a similar way, through the, through the context of creation, production, and showcasing, mainly through gathering. So how has the rest of the world been coping? It would seem that festival operators across the globe transitioned over the past two years. It's almost two years, you know, I'm counting. From online showcasing that encompasses performances as well as talk shops, as you see in the corner day, Ake Festival, which was a mixture of performance and talks by persons from across the African diaspora, to returning face-to-face -face Yes, we've been seeing a lot of that across the U.S. I highlighted three that got a lot of attention in the media um, in the past year, in the summer period, sorry. Uh, Milwaukee, interestingly, experienced a dip 
and many of the vendors were not satisfied and they felt it was because of the strict um, protocol rules. Whereas on the other hand, La La Palosa and Rule La Miami, which is a big hip hop, um, pop music um, festival, had about 75,000, there's an error there, 75,000 over three nights. And of course, that was a concern because many were not vaccinated and many were not masked. But with all these experiences, other festival operators looking at what has happened online and in person, what we are seeing emerging is the hybrid. And the hybrid, it's felt, is the way in which we will find our festival experience evolving. I like to take it as having a, a, a bit of both worlds in a sense. And so it is likely that we are going to see more of what has been attempted by the Brooklyn Book Festival, which is one of the smaller of the three there, then a Leeds Festival and the National Arts Festival of South Africa, which is a major global festival, um, has been subject to a lot of research in this area as a matter of fact. So I'm quite looking forward to seeing what colleagues will say about that festival, having transitioned now to that new dispensation of, of online. Well, of course, in the Caribbean, we are not to be left out. Um, initial responses to the pandemic did see us going into the digital environment. Last year, I did a quick study when we were first impacted by the COVID to ask festival operators across the Caribbean um, how it was impacting them. And the survey does zero in on Trinidad and Tobago, but this data here is specific to festival operators across when I asked how they were using the digital environment, and whilst about 35% said they were not using it, um, you will notice that others did indicate that their focus predominantly was on streaming live content, recording and uploading content. And if we recall for the past year, we certainly did experience many examples of that in varying forms. Um, these are some of the notable ones. Um, in the corner at the, um, at the top there, one will notice that the artist was also supported by corporate sponsorship. As you see at the bottom, and I don't know if you can see clear enough, there's our Caribbean Airlines hanging in there with Jamaica, which is a carnival band out of Jamaica. And it would seem to me, though, that when I looked at these um, forms of the festival experience being put up there, it was largely premised on the traditional model of showcase and consumption with the use of the digital platform as a stage. Indeed, the initiatives are to be considered significant as part of charting our futures where the festival experience is concerned, if only because they have shown us what we can do beyond the old normal, if we dare to. However, because there remains a lag in other important areas of infrastructure, research, development, innovation strategy and policy, digital strategies, including strategies and mechanisms for monetization in the online environment. We have really found ourselves at a place where our festival experience has gone offshore and not necessarily export to places where the traditional mode of the festival experience is based, based on gathering can occur. And I think at this point in time, this is perhaps one of our most notable Examples, I believe that the artist is still on tour at this point in time, and we know that Miami Carnival is coming up soon, and um, he is not the only artist who's out there, but he, as far as I am aware, he was the one who would have developed a tour, and this is why I use, this, if you notice, he has the term there, premium experience. So there's the sensibility of the experience that we seek to inculcate here, um, with that aspect of the carnival being transparent over there. And I'm saying offshore because we can't do anything here at this point in time as we try to, to grapple with the pandemic. And so the, the term for me at this point in time seems most appropriately to be offshore. We can certainly discuss that more if time um, permits. But I like to say that the pandemic is a wake-up call because if we are to be honest, you know, we already had a few of these issues to work on with regard to engendering a sustainable development model through the festival, even before COVID. And these have always been my pet peeves of, as I've listed there. 
And so as a result of these challenges, if I take a tap back, the festival experience as traditionally operationalized here and across the region finds itself possibly might be out of step with the realities of the global festival economy because of the fact that we continue to have these challenges, which would of course inhibit our natural progression towards online in a full-fledged and, and, and in a way that will reap those financial economic benefits, as well, of course, um, in terms of being able to go hybrid as well. So then how do we ensure a sustainable future in such a context? And I want to propose that we return to the drawing board starting with the basics in order to discern and define how we reshape the federal experience. This must be tied to some form of active ongoing operationalization that realizes real opportunities and generates change while at the same time securing desired outcomes. I like to use the term praxis to refer to such as I've recently written in a forthcoming piece to be published at UWI Press entitled how to tell a soca music story, trying to develop a critical framework for Caribbean popular culture preservation using the repertoire of Marshall Montano as a guide and framework for strategic action. And I would have made the point in that piece that access allows for flexible formulation such that indigenous thought and action can be infused towards the outcomes being sought. And so it is possible to arrive at different praxis for various contexts. And if you've seen my 2017 paper on festivals looking at Cari Festa, um, you would see I advanced the notion there for of a Caribbean festival praxis. More recently, having developed this one, culture-driven praxis, um, you could have community development pr practice, you could have innovation praxis and so on. The point is that whichever one is being cultivated, it is being uniquely formulated with consideration for the nuances within the context to which it is being applied. So for reshaping the festival experience, I want to suggest that the notion of the festival experience, as I posited before, that being a culture of experience and an experience of culture is tied to practical mechanisms, which I have acronymed as PARTY. Easy for us to remember in the context of festivals in Trinidad and Tobago, even when it is a spiritual um, festival, it's a celebration. And so PARTY is offered here as a framework for action that can guide how we seek to further build on our festival experience, attain the outcomes that we are seeking. So if we PARTY, it means that we will be seeking to pivot. That is to imagine new dynamic ways of sustainable festival capital. And this is where all of the new technical trends, technological infrastructure that is now within reach because of digitization needs to be explored and located. And I will speak a little bit more about that as I close in examples resilience and sorry actualize which is a strong praxis and we've already talked about what that could look like in terms of how we define festival experience and what that can mean for us resilience and resilience for me is not an abstract noun it's a verb according to wood which allows us to identify create where necessary utilize the existing resources and capabilities that we have to push through test which has always been my favorite which is measure something that we often drop the ball on um, sometimes we do measure and sometimes we don't see it as a priority and we know that in the region to date we are still lapsed in terms of having frameworks such as satellite accounting systems that would allow us to properly measure our festival ecosystem and lastly yield strategically create platforms of learning and engagement to give support ongoing expansion and formalization and certainly at the department of creative and festival arts uwi we do try to do our part same we have at mona at the ics we have at cable with our new faculty but i think if we are to be honest to ourselves we do need to dig deeper in terms of how we what we establish as those platforms and how we roll those out
so that if I were to get some practical examples based on what I said there, pivoting for me is developing and harnessing the requisite digital infrastructure needed to operate opportunities for monetization, for example. Um, this is something that is still a gray area. Um, I know some work academically has been done in terms of music by my colleague Farley Joseph, and I believe that more of this work has to be done, not only in terms of what may be monetization opportunities for the music industry, but of course across the other sectors of the CIs, and of course including the festival experience. We must start to examine new modes of merchandising and forms tangible and intangible. Um, there are people in the diaspora, I'm sure, would certainly whip out the, the credit card to have an online moment with one of our master um, artists within the festival arena, whether it's visual arts, mass arts, pan, or in terms of the masquerade itself or music. Adoption of tech systems for engendering a safer and more reliable experience. So for example, use of facial recognition, um, cashless systems, VR augmented reality, touchable tech. These are all things that are within our reach and to my understanding are already here. We need to start deeper and see how we can use these things within our own festival um, context to enhance that festival experience and at this time to make it a safer place. Um, pivot also needs to be that we develop the appropriate protocols. Um, I know there's some work being done through the CDB uh, for Barbados in terms of establishing a handbook that could be a standardized way, a means of following that we could, of course, um, begin to contemplate that hybrid approach. Actualize. This is the song practice. So this is a festival experience based on what we consider to be an authentic indigenous culture of experience, identifying the elements that make up this, determining which can work in person, and of course, those that are even more dynamic online. And this will in turn generate a range of emotions within, the, within festival attendees and ultimately encourage them to identify with and even own the festival experience, the festival event. As one might imagine, the cultivation of such an experience of culture would in turn order well for interventions to pivot, such as in terms of things such as merchandising. Resilience. As a verb, it requires correct matching and utilization of existing resources and capabilities. And where there are gaps, building up on those capacities to push through this, and in this regard, mapping exercises and of places, venues, communities, useful to determine what exists, generate hybrid opportunities. Resource, resource audits are equally important to identify and match the requisite resources in terms of finance, HR systems, intellectual property to realize the outcomes there where that is concerned. And where financial resources seem non-existent, planning and strategizing on collaborative opportunities, exploring new sources of revenue streams is, is being encouraged. Test, perhaps my favorite, for those of you who know my work, consistently measuring impacts at all levels, not just at the governmental level, community level, at the level of the festival entrepreneur. There is the indicate the effect of COVID-19 on the festival to some extent, how much of have we amassed? There are persons out there who have done their, their small little studies in various ways, such as I, how I did one last year. Do we know what remains of the sector? Do we know whether people have transitioned into other areas? Um, are there any success stories for those who have remained in the sector? Um, do we know how they have sought to pivot, for example? Do we know what they're thinking about as futures? So we need to audit our festival programming not just in terms of what we have as a broad spectrum of festivals, but even microing into the festivals themselves to work with festival operators to look at what we've done before and look, about, look at what could possibly be changed now in this new context. And of course, that extends to auditing the festival experience as well. And lastly, of course, measuring impacts. Yield in order to harvest, we have to build and implement appropriate training programs, internships, mentorship programs, incubator 
models. And harvesting is very important because the festival economy and by extension the festival experience is very much hinged on people. And without people, of course, we know there is not much left where the festival is concerned in terms of how that culture of experience and experience of culture um, maintains and holds through time that encourages people, of course, to return to that festival time after time. It is, in, it is through harvesting, as I have indicated here, the yield factor is what would assure sustainability down the road and continuity. And so I want to close by leaving you with this comment from Alexander Lee. The landscape of life has forever changed by the COVID-19 pandemic. With users primed and ready to experience events in the metaverse, festivals are entering virtual space and virtual spaces are developing a presence at in-person festivals. In the near future, it might not matter whether attendees experience events physically or virtually, the experience will simply be equivalent and persistent across board. And if you want to learn more about these things, I must put in my plug, you can certainly check Dr. Tull out at ACAM. And of course, I close here. Thank you very much for listening. Happy to answer any questions if time permits. Thank you. Hey, this is Ruel Lynch, and as a music producer, I am always listening out for the latest inspiration for my beats and information on the music business. That is why I am sharing all the information about the Trinidad and Tobago International Standard Recording Code, TTISRC. It is a code that will improve our local industry because it will measure, track, and index sound recordings from our country. Plus. This code is required by digital distribution companies to sell our music online. So for me, any track I'm producing for my artist will have this unique code. Join the movement with me and get the international standard recording code for all your new releases. Music TT Export Academy is an initiative geared towards music business education and capacity building through workshops, conferences, and webinars. Music TT partners with stakeholders in the local music industry to host conferences annually. You want to win a gold medal and you started training last week. It doesn't happen so. So why disrespect this industry by trying to do the same thing? It does not work. It will never, ever work. As Music TT seeks to build capacity in the music industry, topics are determined by current trends that can have an impact on revenue generation, as well as highlighting opportunities that have export potential. What I got out of it, I got a lot of clarity in terms of understanding how um, the differences of exploitation, because we hear the word and we're afraid when we hear exploiting the music. And so I was able to understand how the positive sides of exploitation of music really works for you as a songwriter, as an artist. Reverb is Music TT's webinar series where veterans of the music industry share their knowledge and experience. It's streamed live on the last Thursday of every month and a replay of the webinar is posted on our YouTube page. Be sure to subscribe to be notified. Hi, morning, everybody. How are y'all? Um, that was a great um, keynote there by Dr. Tull. I mean, again, I felt like I was back in university because she dropped so much knowledge on us and so much insight into the industry and what's going on. Um, I'm hoping that Dr. Tull could join us later this evening for our question and answer session because I'm sure everybody has lots of questions they want to tackle with her. But good morning. Uh, my name is Marty. I am a project officer at Music TT. Again, I'm just going to be here just to moderate. I don't have, I'm going to try and keep what I have to say very brief, but I'm going to just try and steer the conversation on the future of live streaming. Uh, we have three really exciting panelists with us this morning, and I think the conversation is going to be really interesting. I mean, from just what we had talked about in our little pre-meeting, um, I think some minds are about to be blown. 
So let me um, introduce everybody one by one. So we're gonna go ladies first. Um, we have Tisha Jack. She's an event manager at TCJ Events and is an experienced Caribbean event planner and consultant with a MSc in international event management from Surrey University. That's correct, right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, then we have no stranger to review, <laughs> Mr. Karen Rose, uh, who's an online business strategist <laughs> and a Caribbean entrepreneur. Um, sorry. And he's hosting Digipreneur FM podcast, owner of the Digipreneur Academy, and all around guru in anything to do with digital and online um, business. Thank you for and having finally, me. And finally, we have Mr. Shem Brewster, who is a QAAMER. Um, Shem, you correct me if I'm saying that wrong. That's right. Um, virtual live event for virtual live events in North and South America for Bloomberg Media. He's also experienced producer working in live and virtual events services. So uh, welcome everybody to the panel. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. So we're gonna just jump straight into it, right? Um, we are, since the COVID pandemic started, we kind of had a kind of, in Trinidad, especially the whole live industry and performance um, industry just kind of shut down. Um, people were trying to figure out ways to do it. Um, I know you all have been some of the pioneers and what can happen, but I just want to start talking about the traditional um, ways things have been being done, especially in Trinidad and the Caribbean. And what's your opinion on that? And I'll, I'll stop with you, Tisha, uh, if you don't mind. I think you're muted. Sorry, you was the last part you said you just broke up there a little bit. Sorry, yeah. So we just want to talk about the traditional way live events have been being done, right? Um, virtually in Trinidad over the last like year and a half, and right. what have been your experience, particularly with dealing with customers on that? Right. Um, so for the most part, what we've seen happening is a heavy reliance on social media. Um, so the Instagram lives, the the, the, the YouTube lives, um, you know, and not many have, I guess, pushed the envelope yet. And that's what we're going to talk about to kind of get them to, to encourage them to be able to do that. But what I've seen happening is either a combination of being brave and having the production ready to have your show live, as in everything happening in real time, or doing a pre-recorded show and then uploading that as a as a live stream so that's more or less where we've seen persons leaning towards over the past couple of months okay and um karen is this um we're gonna get real into this topic later but i want to talk about the what have you been seeing because i know you again you deal with a lot of clients who have been trying to do this um have you seen a resistance from anybody trying to switch over to this kind of live or virtual hybrid type system going on? Um, yeah, there's there's been a uh, there's been a lot of resistance period towards um, doing a more push for video. Um, I think with respects to companies, companies are still trying to figure out how can video and live video um, work within their their business construct. Um, and trying to figure out how to start to create content and then more importantly, do it live. So there is some resistance towards it. And then from a smaller scale in terms of, you know, creatives and entrepreneurs and, and people deciding to jump on and do live streaming, you're seeing a lot more people do Instagram lives because it's one of the easiest ways to go live. Um, the, the platform is popular. It's easy to get on live. So we see a big push to doing it there, but we don't see too, too much of a push to do it outside of Instagram Live and start to get a bit more technical. Uh, and then Tisha touched on some really good points as well. So excited to hear what Shem has to say. Yeah, and Shem, so, I mean, you, I know, I mean, I've been following what you've been doing for a while. And even before the COVID-19 thing, you've been doing streaming events. I think for probably the last five years, I've seen you, you know, doing streaming for all these different companies out of the US. Um, how have you seen the increase in volume 
and those type of things on your side of it? So there's there's something that I um I recognize before before COVID everything was more based for the people who wasn't able to come to the meetings and stuff. Everything was based on in persons. Now because of COVID, everybody is realizing that the um that the online experience is as equally as important as the as the um as the live experience. So because of that, a lot of a lot of money and a lot of um thought is going into making sure that the online experience is good. And because of that, we have a lot of development now. Um one thing that kind of opened up my eyes now is the relationship between all what we do and mark and the marketing and the marketing departments of companies. So like for example, um I, I work I work with Bloomberg, but I am in the marketing department, which when I first got the job was was a big eye opener for me because normally I'm technical, A V, um, doing all the streaming, the actual doing the actual work. But now I have to see what are the marketing goals now and then align that for my area, which is North and South America, and and what goals that they have for that. So it's definitely grown significantly. Um, there's a lot of money being pumped into it. And um, uh, Bloomberg had a forecast that in by 2028, 2028 and 28 and 2030, that the American market will worth what's um, 60 billion and the global market is going to be worth 200 billion in, um, in revenue for the hybrid events and online events. Okay, wow. So we can see it definitely a huge growth and expansion of that market. Um, so Shem touched on something there, um, the production of the events. Um, so maybe teacher, you could get a little bit into that. So uh, as as it was before COVID, maybe um, these streaming style events uh, would think was an afterthought. You know, you, you create your whole event, you do everything, and he's like, ah, oh, man, we need to stream it. So let me just bring in a video guy and stream this event. Um, so, I mean, how have you seen that change? And is that something that goes into your planning when you're kind of looking at events for customers now, you know? Right. Um, to be honest, it hasn't changed. <laughs> uh, that is still the general mindset uh, that we probably just need to roll up with one camera or two, hook it up and go live. <laughs> Not realizing that there's a lot of work that has to happen before. And for me, from my end, because I am more into the planning side and not so much the tech side. So I have my tech guys who will support. For, for me, it's always what is the experience that is coming into this live or coming into the stream. So there's a lot of work that has to go into, you know, what we call the production runs and plannings and what is to happen where and what you find happening is, is that a lot of people underestimate um, what has to happen before you actually hit that go live button. So for me, it has been, you know, a lot of teaching along the way and revelations for clients, just realizing um, how much work has to be put into these things that even if it's a 30 minute show, you're probably going to spend 30, 40 hours in planning. Yeah, just to get that short stream that you see, you know. So um, for me, a lot of it is still, um, a lot of people still have to appreciate what is required. And it's not just, uh, as you said, put a camera up, get a good looking quality and press go live and stream. And stream what we would have been accustomed to seeing if we were there in person. For me, live streams kind of have to push the envelope up a little more in terms of, um, how you get the audience engaged and i guess we'll get into that further as we talk yeah right and I, I remember karen saying something yesterday in his keynote talking about the whole experience i mean karen could you touch on that a bit more especially for that like diy artist that has to kind of do everything himself and i mean what are some of the things he can do to really make his his stream more than just instagram live on his phone while he's you know on stage singing you know yeah most definitely so i mean there's 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 levels to streaming and um when uh when the pandemic hit last year 
Uh, me and Tisha, like every other day, we're always sharing notes about everything that we learned about streaming and the things that we needed to do to, in order to up level. Um, and while Tisha works, you know, more on the corporate side and planning the events, for me, I created my own digital show and I turned my own room into a studio. So I had to learn how to do streaming. Um, rather than using my computer and a webcam, I invested in a DSLR and a capture card so that I can stream with DSLR like quality um, rather than just using something where I'm not going to get the cleanest picture. Um, I invested in tools, something like, um, like this called a stream deck that works as like a hard switcher that you would use in newsrooms where if you wanted to switch different camera angles, um, switch to videos or cutscenes, you can program everything into this hard switcher. And that's going to be able to give you a nice, smooth show to transition to different types of assets. Um, learning about the different types of live streaming software. So two of the big popular ones is, is OBS. And then if you're a Mac user, I use something called Ecamm Live. So if you're, if you're deciding that, you know what, you want to do more than just an Instagram Live or a Zoom, you know, you can actually produce your own style shows where it comes off as professional grade. So if you decide to jump into when you learn things like an OBS or an Ecamm Live, um, StreamYards to a lesser extent, uh, you're going to be able to create a nice experience. And then the other thing, too, in terms of people need to start looking at, you know, how do they upgrade their audio? Because it's one thing to upgrade the video. The next thing is audio. So rather than just using your computer microphone or um, uh, a headset for your phone, investing in actual audio equipment, that's going to be able to upgrade your sound. So those are a couple of things to upgrade that experience. Um, and the equipment doesn't have to get overly expensive, especially when you are starting out. But those are some components that as soon as you start to bring into the mix, your level of quality for your live streaming is going to be 10x than, like I said, just going live on an Instagram or just going live on Facebook or Zoom. Right. And something you said there. So um, with all these upgrades, you said it doesn't cost too much. Um, what could, like, I mean, I know you might not have these metrics offhand, but, like, the return on investment and something like that, do you see? Did you like when you started to invest in these kind of things? Did you see a vast improvement in the numbers on your stream or engagement by your audience? You know, every everything for me was immediate because what I did was when I started, I documented the process of putting together my studio and learning to live stream. So my first couple of live streams that I did was done like my very first one was done from my iPad and using the iPad's mic. The video was terrible, the audio was terrible, um, but it was like the very first time I went live, right? So the very next session that I went that I went live, um, I actually got my Ecamm Live um, software and it was still my, my webcam for my computer, but Ecamm gave me some functionality to, to be able to switch between different camera angles and switch between like a slideshow so people progressively saw me testing things out. And again, I brought people along for a journey. So there was a bit of a story behind it. Now, when I launched my web series, Digital Age, there was about two months that had transpired from the very first time I went live with just my camera on my iPad to finally getting all of my equipment, my DSLR, my microphone, um, my audio interface, and then learning more about um, Ecamm Live, two months had transpired. And because people seen the documentation of me experimenting from absolute terrible quality, when Digital Age episode one live and we had cutscenes, we had commercials, everything was clean, people were like, oh my goodness. So there was a buildup to the very first show. So there was a good size audience. And then by that time, too, I had already secured my, my, my sponsors. So, again, they believed in the vision of what I was doing. So I had my sponsors that I was able to get on board. The audience was, was tuned in. Um, and we just, again, we just created a, a show-like experience from start to finish. But the buildup really became, the buildup really happened in documenting the process and letting the people come in as a part of that process throughout the entire process. 
Right. So, I mean, I guess that speaks to the importance of the narrative, right? Um, so maybe Shem, is, is that nar the importance of that narrative evident in the kind of bigger events that you all do? Or, I mean, is it more, this is the production and this is the solutions for the live stream is. Yeah, I like, I really liked, um, what Karen said there. Um, he was talking about Ecamm Live and, um, Ecamm, I like Ecamm Live. Um, Ecamm Live could get you more, let's get you that, that great quality you're looking for. Um, more for the corporate stuff, they use um, more Wirecast and VMix to do the productions um, for the bigger shows. Uh, um, again, Ecamm Life is amazing for for someone that's really getting into it, and and even bigger companies use it too, because I um I think it's really it's really cool how you can move stuff around in it. Um, there's something he said also too that is critically important, and have. And it's really control how how you're able to fund it is by he's talking about getting sponsors, but it's a, it's about aligning yourself with the marketing departments or companies and helping to to push what they kind of want to push in a way. And while doing that, doing your stuff. Because um the cost of this equipment, for example, OBS is free. So you could you could download OBS and get into it and, and start doing it, but the course could get up there, um, depending on what what type of stuff that you really want to do, and um, and the type of quality. And we're trying to make sure that we have the right quality because the right quality, um, as as I was taking care of, I think it was two days ago you spoke. The right quality will have um, will help with your engagement, and then the engagement will then help with numbers and different things. Um, so so getting the right quality is important, and if you get these sponsors on board. With your stuff, you might be able to start, you know, running from the blocks right away. You know, getting the right gear and getting the right stuff, making sure the audio, definitely the audio is on point, um, video and lighting is on point. And um, yeah, I I think that from what he said, everything from what we do is just get scaled. It, it starts like that because he has the um, the the building blocks, but everything scales up for bigger events. Um, so. <laughs> From from using a DSLR, they'll be using the um, Black Magic Ultra 4K cameras, and everything will be running fiber optics, and all the audio will be done by Dante, and everything. Everything going to be digital, but the average guy, like us, we could we could more or less have a very high quality also by having the right stuff in place. All right, so Tisha, I actually want to bring you in on this thing here. So um, they talked about sponsors. I, I prefer to think of them as partners. But um, so when we when we look at these partners, is, does that factor into your planning? Do you like involve your partners, like your corporate partners, when you're planning event, or do you just present them with something and then they could kind of negotiate? What's that relationship like? It's a combination of the two, actually, because <clears throat> I think if we have to be realistic with our local landscape, um, in approaching the um, the corporate sponsors they kind of want to know that what you say you're going to do you're actually able to do and what you are able or what you say you're going to promise them that you can deliver on right so sham kind of touched on it just just now in terms of saying that <clears throat> you have to have some kind of you you have you have to start yourself like you have to show that you know you are uh, really interested in this you have made some kind of investment for yourself some public sponsors some public sponsors appreciate that you know i'm listen i'm going to support you from the jump and we work in with you and usually when that that happens yes you have to integrate them into decision making from the jump so some of our artists you will kind of see that um you know from from them building up their sponsors have been rolling with them from the basics while they're trying to figure it out to getting better and better and better Whereas there are some that have to put it out on their own and then the corporate sponsors jump on after that. So I think in terms of, to answer your question very directly, how they are involved, it depends on at what stage of the journey they, they come into. But definitely once they are on, on board, they are, as you said, a partner and you have to get them involved, um, understanding what they would like to get out of the partnership because you're right, it is a partnership. And as much as they are supporting you, they ideally need to get something out of it. 
So you have to understand, you know, what matters to them, what what will make sense for them, what is going to, how are they going to measure their return on investment into you so that you can kind of tie those things into your production, into your, how you package your, um, how you package your event. And I want to just also bring back something that Karen said too. Um, that experience in terms of building up from you know, showing people the behind the scenes, again, that, that gives you additional mileage for your sponsor because your it will kind of tie back into your sponsor showing you, you showing that your sponsor, sorry, is supporting you from the ground up. People like to see the mess. And I don't know why we always think that what we put out always has to be polished. People appreciate the journey and they have a greater appreciation for the final product when they kind of understand that they were there with you throughout the process. So I think particularly for musicians, that is something that we need to tap into more. You know, show us when you're going into the studio, show us when you're writing the music and tie those things into your final production as well. You know, at the end of the day, all these events are experiences and stories. And I think once we tie that into how we do it, corporate will buy into that even more as well because they are also now buying into your story. Let me, I, I just want to add in a couple of things. So when I started, right, I didn't even, I did not approach, when I had the idea for Digital Age, I didn't approach sponsors at all when I had the idea. When I was documenting the process, um, it was just all on me, right? What I did was I invested my own money. And that is key because a lot of the times we don't want to invest our own money and put our own skin in the game. So I had, I had my own money saved up and I had, had invested and bought all of the equipment. Now, what I did was after I got everything and I realized, okay, this is the idea for the show, Digital Age. Now that I have all my equipment, I could step things up. I started to think about who would also benefit from the content that I'm going to be putting out. I know that my thing is going to be about showcasing companies, products, services, um, and Caribbean entrepreneurs that are building in the digital space. Who, what companies are also trying to tap into that exact same artist. And then I found three partners that pretty much were on the same or similar mission than me. And because I had documented my process, that was some assets that I showed them to show them. I was able to show them to say, this is the idea of, of what we are trying to do. I also built out a digital age website so that the sponsors had additional real estate so that they could brand, they could, they could get their logos and stuff with links back to their websites or products and services. And then I also um, did some demos of an, what an actual branded stream would look like. So I was showing them like, okay, we're going to have the, 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 the logo um, popping up in the corner. We're going to brand the segments. We're going to brand the timer. So I had all of these things documented and I had a demo live stream done so that when I reached out to them and I, I gave them the story of what we are trying to do, I showed them all of the different assets that they are going to be able to use to leverage, to be able to draw people back. It made um, an easy decision for them to say, hey, you know what? Yes, let's do it. You are aligned. Plus, you have a body of work. You're not somebody that just popped up out of nowhere just looking for money. You have been consistent in your messaging for some time. And we can see that you have been doing this for some time. So it made it, I, I made sure I tried to make it as easy as possible for them to say yes to getting on board and aligning with, but most importantly, you know, don't just run to sponsors right out the gate and think they're just going to give you money. At the end of the day for them, a lot of it is a business, it is a business decision for them. So you need to figure out ways for your partners to one, be able to work with you. Like what are they going to be getting in return? How are they going to be able to brand and then also come to them with some type of demo or something that you can show them so it doesn't just look like, again, they're giving you money and, and you're not really getting uh, too much in return. Okay, so, I mean, we, so uh, again, we'd say that that corporate partnership is kind of essential in this, in what what's happening next with live streaming, right? Because, again, it doesn't make sense for you to just stream to your audience and nobody else is benefiting off of it. Other people can give you money or give you product or whatever it is um, to get the opportunity to be part of your journey and, and really partner with brands like that, right? So, I mean, 
I yeah, I think it's 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 not just that. It's 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 also because Ashem touched on the quality that you ideally want to get to and the reach that you probably eventually eventually want to have is going to be pretty costly. Like you're not even going to glaze over it. A, a proper high-end production is going to be costly, right? So the the reality is that you will want to partner with persons to help you cover this cost so that you are able to to deliver the kind of product that you want to. And we're just saying that in the process that you don't approach it as well, I just want want your money, you have to find ways of how this partnership will benefit um the the corporate sponsor as well. Well I think I think um I think uh, Karen Karen said something about investing in, in yourself. I think that's I think that's the foundation of it. I think about putting as much as you can into it and doing the best as you can and presenting that because any visionary within their marketing department will, will be able to see where they could then take what you have if it, if there was to add the right resources to you and then develop more or less develop you. Um so right now, I I know definitely know up here, and and I actually know a company in Trinidad that that doing now um it's called Songforge, um they they are putting a lot of information, and a lot of um and money into buying gear and buying stuff to get this stuff to the right place and even up here there's a there's a whole drive now for AV companies AV companies <laughs> that was doing corporate AV everyone has become broad, broadcast studios now. Everyone has a hybrid department now. Everyone has this infrastructure. The nice thing about the AV companies up here is that they, because they already had the infrastructure for the gear, they already, they already had the gear to do it now. All, all they need to do now is just focus on aligning with um, a corporate sponsor, a, a, a partner, aligning with a marketing department, and, um, and more or less bringing in extra every, revenue um with the hybrid events and the live events and um yeah and everything then kind of move forward and from there moving forward all events moving forward is going to be hybrid there's no doubt about it there's no there's no company that's going to get away from it um attendees are going to ask um hey can i click on your app to see this and even the companies themselves are recognizing that hey I have 400 people here live, but you know I can reach 2,000 people by putting it online, also too. So even from a marketing perspective, it makes a lot of sense for them um, to do it. So I think that we are we are in some a very exciting times concerning how this is going. I um I want to throw out a question um, to Tisha concerning um uh, from a meeting planning. What what have you seen in Trinidad? What have you seen concerning people's um, social media um, strategy? Strategy in terms of what? How they treat with these events? Yeah, yeah. like how like how they treat with the events. Like you, you have these clients, and what what are the social media questions that comes up concerning it? Um, if I have to be honest, a lot of them are still grappling with what the options are at least the ones that i have come across there are some who've gotten it and figured it out and are running consistently um but for me at least in my experience i'm still seeing a lot of um heavy reliance on social media and then if it's not social media it's zoom right but in my in my space and as you if you have to bring it up that that environment sometimes is not always suitable or what you want to achieve is not always suitable for just a social media situation or a Zoom, depending on what you're trying to, to achieve out of it. So um, you can let me know if that answers your question, but it, it is still a lot of um, just, I want to do this event and we want to go live on Facebook, YouTube and, right. and whatever else. Or um, I want to do a Zoom event but for me a lot of and because it's not totally on topic but just to say that there are a lot of other platforms that you know some corporate companies have tapped into because of the type of event that they were trying i, I think what i think what has to happen is is we kind of have to break down the because 
people that are listening are, are, are just going to hear, you know, live streaming and live yeah. events, yeah. but not know that there is a wide variety of different types of events that require different things. So if you are somebody where, you know, your, your company is trying to do a live event and it's going to be a lot of talking heads and you work with an mm -hmm. event planner, you know, how are you guys handling, you know, the, the, the keynotes, the workshops, the networking, there's, there's specific types of, of platforms that are going to facilitate that, that Tisha will be able to get into. And I think, again, as the conversation goes on, we could talk about the different types of events or what types of things they would look at. Right. I think from an individual level, from quality, I think because we know that virtual events are here to stay and hybrid events are going to be happening. I think if you are somebody that knows that you are going to be speaking on a regular basis and you know, um, coming to to, to to live events, I think at oh, bare minimum oh, oh, you should be learning. Oh, 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 to... any any vein of the of the of the organizations, yeah. Yeah, I, to... I think you need to know, like at bare minimum, what you can do to up your own quality. So even if it's as simple as investing in a webcam and getting yourself a microphone. Um, just knowing the bare minimum of what you need to invest in in terms of up your own quality so that you can participate in some of these events. But again, as we go, I think we can start to talk about um, the different scale of events, different types of events, and 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 uh, what what is required, what does that look like, and best and best practices. Cool. Yeah, so that's actually transitioning really well because I w I really wanted to talk about um, not just the types of events, but the types of interactivity for events, right? So um, I know from working in it on, on my own here as well, I'm working with different artists and stuff, everybody's more interested in just doing an event where they either just capture video and push it out as a stream, right? There's no interactivity, there's no feedback from an audience and people feel, oh, that's the best way to do it for some weird reason, I don't understand why. Um, I don't know if the artists but they are the future thinking ones, the thinking about, I, I want to be able to see my audience and interact with them. And there are like a hundred different ways to do that. I mean, can we talk about what the interactivity looks like from the basic, a guy with his um, camera and a microphone, what kind of interactivity routes can he take all the way up to the big corporate um, telecommunication companies doing these streaming events that, millions of people what kind of interactivity how, how how do we negotiate those kinds of things and what are our options from let's start with the small man um i guess everybody's going to take it i i can start um i think as you said let's start on the most basic level right um audience engagement in this virtual world is higher on the list, I guess, of if you were to do a face-to-face -face event. Because with the face-to-face, -face, you know, you're in the room, you can feel the energy, you can kind of feed off of that vibe. With virtual, it's a little harder. And, you know, from the basic level of, of seeing what's coming up in your comments and you, you know, that's where it starts first, right? So most events where I've had attendees say that, you know, they really enjoyed it, the chat section was on fire, right? And that is really on the most basic level, whoever is the person live on camera that's engaging with their, with their audience, calling them, having certain call to action, asking them to do things to respond in a certain way. Um, the next level from that is you are, while you're performing, if, you, if the platform that you're on or the way that you set that up facilitates you actually having persons have their cameras on so you can see, you know, how they are responding in real time. Um, as the event gets bigger and bigger in terms of your, your attendees, um, that is going to become harder because, of course, you're, if you're trying to reach two, three, five, ten thousand persons, that is going to be a little harder. And that's where the whole hybrid um, aspect comes into play because then hybrid allows you to have a smaller audience in person so that you kind of get that energy, but you're still reaching a wider audience. Um, I think Shem will be great to tap into this because I've been seeing what's happening internationally and the technology to do those things that blow mine. Um, and we haven't really seen too much of that happening here in terms of concepts and, and how some of those artists have been able to do that for the past couple of months. Okay, so from a, 
from an entertainment perspective, um, I can't remember the artist, but you remember that guy that went to, that had the um the event on um that PS4 game. Um, can't remember the game now. Are, are you talking? Are you thinking Travis Scott and Travis um, Scott? You're right, Travis Scott, and that was um oh god, that was the shooting game. Um, um, I think that was Fortnite. 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 There yes. we go. Yeah. yeah, and that that um the guys that worked on the guys was one of the one of one of my friends from Miami, and it was it was pretty cool to talk to him about it, and how they more or less put this virtual reality stuff of him and, and the shooting and the the camera angles and stuff to have this integration because if you know anything about Fortnite, which I, I don't really know, I know that it seems that you could be dancing, you have particular dances and stuff that you could physically have your character do in the game. So they have this guy here and they have this virtual conference and you. You um <laughs> you having your avatar more or less dancing from there. And I think that kind of open up how stuff that's a good example how stuff kind of open up. Um on on a corporate level, I saw something about two months ago where um there's a company, I can't remember fully remember the name of the company, but they have um iPads on wheels, more or less. And the person log into the iPad, so their faces on the iPad and um and more or less, you have control like a a, a PS4 or a, a, um, Xbox controller. And you actually control this iPad with a stick and on wheels, and you can move around and more or less integrate with people and talk to people. Right, it is a two-way communication, and um, that was pretty cool. That was pretty cool to see, considering engagement. But um, most of the engagement normally happens online, as Tisha was talking about inside of those um comments. Where the comments will be fire. And um, and what they do is that they have a special team to to just manage that. So for the smaller events, it's fine. You can have one, two people. But for the bigger events, we get to the thousand, two thousand. They have a special team calling stuff out, and then they have a from there they, they filter um the the content to the presenters uh, by using something called confidence monitors, which you don't see. Um, they hang it up and have them all around. And they they look around and they choose, and they they call stuff out. They'll be like, "Hey, um, that, that was a great comment from Marty, based in Trinidad. Marty made a great example of of what we tr trying to talk about and stuff like that." And they they have that engagement going, and um, and other people then chime in and stuff. So they have people, a team of people managing it, and um, and and from there, everything tend to help the engagement and help things move forward and what like i know i have a, I have a lot of questions <laughs> for what's going on home back home but... I want, before you ask the question i want, I want to add to the engagement conversation yes. so with respects to with respects to um live streaming one of the biggest ways to build the engagement is to have you working with a platform um, that allows you to highlight people's comments that bring people's comments onto the screen so people can actually see the comments coming in and going. Um, then you have one of my one of my personal favorites in terms of engagement for live streaming is if you look down here, I use something called a Roadcaster Pro. The Roadcaster Pro has an entire MIDI pad that allows me to now add in um, sound effects. What I can also do is I can have people phone call in and treat my entire live stream setup like a radio station. So while I'm live, like right now, if we were, if, if I gave up my phone number right now, somebody can call in, the roadcaster can pick it up and I could bring in that phone call right into the live stream. So when you start to <coughs> add different components like this to your live stream, it breaks up the monotony. It adds more engagement to your live streams. And again, these types of things only um, just make your live streams even better it's, it, it doesn't make it boring right so i just want to add those two things in in terms of engagement shem go ahead and ask your question yeah i um i know that budget you know is having to try to sell this to to the to the corporate people in trinidad or the government whoever has the money is maybe the hardest thing to do but um what's what struggles you guys what what are the biggest struggles you guys have and convincing the decision makers to show them that hey you know this this is going to have a great impact on your brand this is going to have a great impact on what you plan to do and what you're trying to say um that's that's mainly what my question is so 
before you even think about live streaming, the biggest challenge is companies don't like to create content. They like to create ads. So getting people, I mean, when you're doing a live stream, this is content. You got to put together a run of show. You got to have a topic. You bring in speakers or if, if it's your own internal staff, companies around uh, Trinidad, not even just Trinidad, because this is a Caribbean thing. We don't like to create content. Instead, we like to focus on just creating ads. The most we are willing to do is we will sponsor events. You know, you'll quicker get money for somebody. If you say you want to do a concert, you'll get that money, no problem. Or you'll get it a lot easier than if you are trying to create content and or get content sponsored. So just getting companies in that frame of mind to think, create content to build your brand, to generate leads and generate sales is like a key starting challenge. Tisha, I know you have even more. Um, I think it's just, right now it's, it's a mindset, a mindset change that is required across the board. Um, we've been accustomed to doing things a certain way and the last couple of months have shown us that we need to all step out of our comfort zones if we have to continue, you know, not even continue, if, if we have to, 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 to do what we love doing, right? So as, as you said, Shem, hybrid is where we're going. Like there's no if, buts, ands, or maybes. So for, so for us, we are, or oh, you're hearing a lot of comments, I can't wait to do this again, but the reality is you're gonna do this again at, on a 2.0 level. You know, because now we should realize that our audiences are not just, um, you know, who can physically walk into a venue. You know, for, for this particular sector, we have to start thinking outside the box. And this is what the, the, the you know, the, the concept of live, live streaming is going to allow us to be able to do brain audiences that are not just the ones that can physically walk into a venue, but also those who can enjoy the content. And I think the, the keynote speaker touched on it. The diaspora is ready and willing to put in their credit card numbers to consume this content. And I think we we always have this mindset that the audience that we're trying to reach is just where we're ge geographically located. But if anything, these last couple of months have taught us is that our audiences are way beyond our shores. So for me, if we take anything out of this, it is understanding that when we start doing our shows and our festivals and all these things again, how can we incorporate the whole you know, concept of live streaming and get everybody to realize that, hey, this thing can be a way bigger than the 5,000 persons that can fit or even 3,000 because we're going to be in this panini for a little while. And we're going to, we're going to have control numbers physically for a little while, but that shouldn't stop us from, as Karen said, creating content and getting the, the content out there to reach audiences that are not physically able to consume, but can do it via a live stream. Right. One of the reasons why I was asking, because I had a conversation with a good friend of mine, um, Brennan Virgil, he's a um, song engineer. Um, for the 18 band and he's in atlanta now and we had a really good conversation i was asking him why why they're not streaming the live stuff um that they have back home i think that uh they they, they tour. i think they're on tour now so they're going to different states i think that that experience i think people back home this is my personal experience you can correct me if i'm wrong um back home would like to see um these our artists outside um Trinidad doing what they're supposed to be doing what they're doing and enjoying themselves and stuff. He he sent me some short clips and um and I I fully enjoyed it. You know, I fully liked what he, what he was doing. They put stuff on Instagram all the time. I saw Patrice Roberts and um I thought it was pretty cool, but not only for the people back home, but I think that we we are missing out on a market here within um the United States to to then stream to other parts. Cause I personally will pay to see one of my really good friends produce a show. I will I will pay for it to see it. Um, and there there are there are people up here definitely that will um put um fifty sixty US you know into it and to pay for the streams and and it's just from from that point it's just added quality and then and stuff like that. So that's the reason that's the reason why I had all these questions because I wasn't I mean, understanding why. Go ahead. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't understanding why um. 
I wanted to see what was the what was the walls that was there that was preventing stuff like that from happening. So so here's another big wall, and I'm gonna serve this one up for Tisha. Another big wall is companies think digital means cheap or cheaper than live. So because they don't understand what goes into digital and the cost of digital, right. when they hear about some of the costs associated with going digital, their minds are blown because it's like, but wait a minute, if, if the physical in-person event was 30,000, how is the digital event 30,000? I thought this is supposed to be a quarter of the cost. So Tisha, please jump in on that. Um, and I would want to hear Martin's view on this from his side as, as well, right? But yes, I roll his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because for me, honestly, yeah, every quote, the one you have to justify the most is the production cost. And it's the one I always have to negotiate the most. It's the one that you have to tell the fellows, listen, we need to do this because we have to show them what it is. And then the next time they'll appreciate, you know, why that it is. Because as I said, it's a it's a mindset sh mindset shift, it's a culture shift. But, but you're right, it is costly if you want it done properly. And I think, you know, going forward is not just doing it, but how, putting the information out there, um, let, you know, people openly talk about what these things will actually cost. So when we start budgeting for these events, now we appreciate that this is what it's going to cost. Videography versus that production is two different costs. You know, whereas, you know, you're putting up a camera to record and capture, but now you're talking, pushing out to that software, that backups, that's a whole bunch of things. You know, so I think that's what it is. But Martin will probably be well poised to add to that. Yeah, so um, I can talk on it from a procurement side for the government, because, yes, we had to do a lot of... Um, hybrid style events at the beginning of the pandemic when, when stuff was still kind of open. And then um, coming later down, we just had to move straight to purely digital and explaining the cost to the powers that be and the time that it takes to do these types of events was a bit of a challenge because some of these people still have the mentality. I was like, oh, well, we have no audience. We have no security. We have no this. We have no that. Why is this event costing the same amount or more? Than, than, than if we had all these things and we had to tell them, well, look, all this planning has to take place. There's way more planning to do a virtual event than it is to do a live event because we have to figure out all the technical details. Or everybody has to have the proper internet connections. I mean, the list of things needed is, is to me, more demanding because I've done enough, enough of these to see. A live event, it, we ha you're moving into a venue that's already set up to do a live event and you just go. You know, the planning takes a few, depending on the size of the event, it, it doesn't take as much time. But um, I think generally the newer um, ministers that have been put in place, like at the Ministry of Tourism and stuff, and our online ministry, the Ministry of Trade, have begun to understand the, the reasoning for the extra cost to do these things. And they've seen the results that, oh, so this is con evergreen content. So this is not just an event that happens and then we never see it again. This is content that's going to be there forever that we can use to now continue to market the country or, or, and the brands that are involved. And they definitely start to, starting to see the worth of it. You know, So it's not just like, oh, we do an event and that's it. They can now see why it costs money. You know, Right. Yeah, and I, I think to that is, is, is also, as I said, we have to spend a little time now just helping people understand what it really is. Because in, in all fairness, and I'm not going to talk as if I knew everything from the job, I didn't. I had to do a lot of research and a lot of reading and a lot of trial and error and feeling and that kind of thing. And Martin, to your point, I a thousand percent agree with you. This virtual life is way more work than if you had to do an in-person event. But as you said, you reach and the, the analytics and the, you know, to me, it's a little more in terms of your return on investment for a virtual or digital than the in-person ones where you can't be bringing it for the ghost home and you never hear about it. But now we have this high production recording that we can now sell, we can now put out there, we can now, there's so many things that we can do with the content. 
And I think if we start to really talk about that more and open up that more and persons think we can do it first, then, you know, we always have to have somebody that has to do it <laughs> for everybody else to kind of get it, you know? So, yeah. Cool. I am... Um... I'm I'm now thinking, considering what you guys were saying, do do these companies in Trinidad do they, do they have like like the right people in the marketing department? No, because because as you know, Karen says something very important versus uh, advertisement versus content. You know, um, everything now is going to be content driven. Every uh, content driven, and um, and you know, we use cell phones and stuff to consume it. But how, how, how do we have the like the right people in, or, or are we, or do we need to educate the right people in this department to show them that in marketing, you know, it's, it's one in six, you know, they put out one and they get back six, back in it, and content, uh, as Marty was, you know, saying is, is evergreen, yeah, it'll, it'll always be around, and they can reuse it, and they can show the matrix, and they'll be able to see the analytics and stuff behind it to me it's like a no-brainer that's why it's, it's really puzzle it's, it's serious i mean it's really puzzling me concerning um the walls there because it's you know so, to me it's a no-brainer you know so i i'm often referred to as as the the anti-hero in when it comes to digital marketing because i'm always at the agency's next and marketing department's next of every single company and the reason being is because the majority of the companies that I have worked with in the past or, you know, I have line of sight of, the marketing team has been traditionally trained. They've gone, they've done their, their bachelor's, their master's in, in strategic marketing. And, you know, if when it comes to traditional marketing, print, radio, news, you know, they, they know that hands down. However, they're banking on that and their positions are secure. So they don't necessarily need to upgrade their own skill sets and frame of mind to deal with the marketing landscape of today, especially when the, a, a lot of these companies are outsourcing marketing to the agencies and the agencies themselves are just creating static content and posting it on social media. When the marketing landscape is changing every single day, me and Tisha go back and forth all the time. Yo, there is new updates to, to, to live stream platforms that, that, that she uses. There's new ways of monetizations for some of the things that I do with respect to live stream. When the companies themselves, their own marketing departments are not keeping up to date, you're not seeing anybody pushing the ball. I mean, so there's pros and cons. If you are somebody who is an independent consultant or an independent company mm -hmm. and you are specializing in these things, well, man, oh, man, you have all the runway to make all the money right now. But at the same time, a lot of the companies are not pushing the ball. They're not upgrading their own skill sets to be able to understand, you know, what can be done. So that I hope that answers your question. It needs to happen. I would love to see more of the marketing departments upgrade their own skill sets, but that is a slow, slow process right now in the region. Right. Okay. Um, so, th th so Shem, you're talking about walls and barriers. I think one of the barriers that we didn't address as yet, and I think, Karen, you're probably the perfect person to address this, is that uh, payment barrier, right? So we, we know that we have financial um, restrictions in the Caribbean with being able to be paid for our um, live streams. Um, I have been able to navigate around those things, but maybe you can talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, so with anything that we do in the Caribbean, right? And I, and, I, and I touched on this yesterday. One of the biggest problems that we have is that we consume a lot of American content or content from other markets. They have rules, regulations, systems, tools, platforms that greatly differ um, for them than for us, because they nine out of 10 times the company was built in their in their country and they have the full access to the suite of tools. That being said, when we in the region are looking to do anything, we need to think about payments first. Whatever the platform is that we are using, whether it's an email marketing platform, whether it's a social media platform, if it's a live streaming platform, when it comes to monetization, before you read anything, just skip to the section to see if you could even get paid. Because if 
the platform that you are using and you want to monetize, if you cannot receive the money, then don't even bother wasting your time trying to get to learn the platform itself. So when it comes to things like live streaming, we got to get creative with how we receive our monies. So most platforms, like let's just take into, let's just use Eventbrite as an example. That's a platform that I use if I want to create an event and I want to embed it onto my website so people can buy digital tickets. We know Eventbrite has upgraded. Now they have Zoom integration, so they automatically create the event or, or give people a password and, and do that whole funnel. But Zoom pays you out through PayPal. So depending on what country you are in the Caribbean, the majority of countries in the region are not eligible to receive funds from PayPal. So if you're in Jamaica, you can't use a you can't use Zoom to monetize because Zoom integrates to PayPal and Jamaica is not eligible to receive funds from PayPal. Neither is Barbados, neither is Guyana and a couple other countries. Here in Trinidad, in order for us to receive funds from PayPal, we need to have a JMB bank account with their new Visa debit card or a Visa credit card to be able to receive those funds. It doesn't connect. We're not able to receive funds via MasterCard. So whatever platform that you are using, you need to think about, you know, can I receive the money first? And then if you can't receive the money, then we need to look at, well, how else can we get paid? Or is there additional steps that we need to do? So one of the things I do for my own virtual events is that I know that a lot of the people in the Caribbean don't have a credit card. So if I want to, another additional option I would do would, would be, I would create a product on my own website and I would have people go to my website and pay me through my WePay integration. However, once I do that, I need to be mindful of the people that have paid me through that integration on my website through WePay. How am I getting the details of the, the virtual event to them? Because if I was using Eventbrite, and the reason I like to use Eventbrite is because everything is automated and I, have to, I don't have to worry about nothing. But if I'm going to do it through my website, what are the additional steps I may need to do to be able to get the information to them? That way I could still you know, receive, their, receive their funds. If I'm using a Caribbean payment processor, people are able to use things like the new Visa debit cards that are connected to their bank accounts and pay you online. If I were to use PayPal, that means people can only pay me with the credit card. So these are some of the things that we need to be thinking about when we are planning what platform are we going to use, how we are going to get paid, you know, what is going to be the easiest way for, um, for people to pay you, but also for you to be able to receive the money. If I can yeah. just add to that, Martin, no, no. If Go I, ahead. Um, no, I was just going to say that is that is going to be a huge consideration for us moving forward um, with with the future of these events because the, rea <clears throat> the reality is that we will want to be able to have persons pay to be able to consume the content or to watch the shows or to quote unquote attend festivals or whatever event it is we're doing. So. Um, for me, what the experience has been thus thus far, again, as Karen said, a lot of these platforms, as much as they might have integrated um, payment solutions where persons can register, pay, get a ticket, and move, and move on, which is ideally what you want to happen, a lot of those payment systems that work with these platforms are not available in Trinidad. So what we might have to do or what we will have to look at is um platforms or probably build our own i know we have people very capable of doing it here we have to build our own system or platform where we can have persons quote unquote buy their tickets and be able to receive the money into our local accounts um when we roll out of these visa debit cards that is going to be a huge check mark because the issue before would have been the low credit card penetration in the country so i think we're getting there really slowly but you know um the i think the next step will be how can we have um a system where these persons or these artists or these creatives who want to hold these events how are persons going to register how are persons going to pay and then how am i going to get that money into my bank account in a timely manner because the reality is this is then the money i need to go 
paid people who are producing the camera crew, my manager, and all these different things. So I think that is a critical conversation to be had next as we look forward to the future of this of life through the interview event. Okay. So um from from what I from what I'm hearing is that, you know, and I know we had this conversation before last week about the um the payments and the, some of the limitations, but so what some of my some of my thoughts about that is that if let's say this was to get fixed, I believe that uh a great set of revenue will be able to come in from the world considering getting trenders up. Especially here in the States. There, there are a lot of trend audience here that um that consume or want to consume or very interested, just like myself, what is going back home, what's going on home. And um, I think that if we, if if those walls fall, I think that there's there, there's no problem in people paying um, local content um, creators in Trinidad. And, and that in itself could be a whole new industry. Also from a lot of local content creation, um and trend that perspective it will then help them because of competition natural competition it will then help the quality then to go up because then they'll be competing against not only regional caribbean and regional they'll be competing against the world concerning it so they, they'll be looking at different things and different methods and different um systems to make sure that their quality on on point so that would then force the industry to have a, a better product so uh, it Mm -hmm. Go ahead, go ahead. Finish up, finish up. Yeah, so it will kind of force the um industry to have a have a better product, and also if this problem was not there, then bring in a lot of different foreign exchange, a whole lot of different things into the country. So it's not that we can't, and this is this is one thing I want to drive home to everybody watching. It's not that we can't. We can get paid globally. The issue is the people that are putting on the event, do you understand what you need in order to get paid? That is the real problem. Because let's just say if you wanted to go, if you know you're a big event promoter and you're going to be putting on a lot of these, a lot of these events, you know, this is a good opportunity now to start thinking about opening up a bank account in, say, the U.S., you could go open up a Stripe Atlas account. You could go register your business in the U.S., open up a bank account over there and then be able to open up a U.S. PayPal account. You could pay your U.S. taxes or whatnot and go that route. If you know that this is a if this is a serious business for you, then that is an option for you. If you are somebody where, again, you don't want to, you know, open up another bank account in, in another country. Now the question is, you know, we have local Caribbean payment processors. You know, you got to look at, you know, what platform can I use that may be able to, 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 to work with one of these platforms, or again, what are the steps that I need to take to be able to get paid? You know, do I need to hire a virtual assistant who is going to, you know, after the payments come in, do I need to hire a VA to manually add them to a system? So there are things that we can do. The thing is, is that we just need to be aware of all of the options, all of the pros, the cons, the limitations. That way, when you are planning your event, you know, hey, okay, I have opened up a bank account in the U.S. I have a, a registered business over there and I've opened up a, ba a bank account and I've signed up a U.S. PayPal. Well, guess what? Now you could use all of the platforms and the payment processing isn't going to be an issue. Again, for me, I'm a smaller person. So when I do my workshops and people from you know different, different parts of the world are coming in, I know what I've done is I've learned how to integrate Zoom into my WooCommerce platform and I made sure I learned how to do that because WooCommerce works with WePay. So once people come to my website and they pay via WePay, I have the integration with Zoom to automatically send out the information so that they can register. And that is my workaround for not having to be able to um, put PayPal or integrate PayPal into Zoom. I try to stay away from PayPal because I'm in Trinidad right now because there's a higher uh, percentage that PayPal takes. PayPal is 5.4% off of every sale in US. I don't want to pay that. WePay is a lot cheaper. So I've learned how to use WePay into my website and work with Zoom. So again, the, you, the, the things you can do is just to have people thinking about learning the options. That way they can make the, the, the most effective choice um, for their event planning.
this conversation is going really good and we're running out of time and i did want to try and touch on one other thing before i finish um karen i think music tt is going to have to get you back to basically do a whole workshop on just this okay so we're going to be in contact with you for that um mm -hmm. because i think this is very very important and people don't understand the how to negotiate those things properly you know they still have these fears and and they, they, they think oh well it's too much work i'm not doing it so i'm not gonna bother to try and even integrate monetization or anything so they always just say they throw their hands up in the air it's like nah not bother and, and i think it's it's a lot it's a, it's work but it's a lot easier than you think it is you know yeah even even something as simple as okay like um i would go live for free on my platforms on LinkedIn, on Facebook, uh, YouTube, and whatnot. Monetization can be something as simple as I have my, my WePay link pinned in my comments for donations. So if people want to donate to me, they can hit the link, type in the amount of money that they want to donate and do that. Whereas other platforms would have integrated with Zoom to be able to collect those fees. So that doesn't always have to be your situation. You could go learn about a WePay, a First Atlantic Commerce, learn how to use PayLink. So again, if you want to start to do live stream, you could be able to accept donations during those things. Um, I recently learned, I recently seen that, you know, Facebook has content subscriptions now. And what intrigued me about that is Facebook content subscriptions is if you are producing content, whether it be via live stream or whether it be produced video, the two options they pay out through are PayPal and direct wire transfer to us. So we are seeing some more ways to monetize. And again, I always will tell people to start with payments in mind, because once you know how you can get paid, that automatically will disqualify or qualify, you know, what platforms you use and what types of content and the different ways that you're going to be able to monetize. So, yeah, I know that, again, that's a critical thing. Um, and I know Tisha, Shem, they could talk about all the platforms that break those down. And again, once you decide when you are making your event and you know how you're getting paid, you know, rock out, have fun. All right, so so I just want to touch on this one thing. So let's do a case study based on all the things we talked about this morning, right? So Carnival 2022 is is happening, whether it's an in-person carnival or virtual carnival. We don't know exactly what's going to happen yet, but I know from the plans that NCC is having, there is going to be some sort of carnival in 2022, right? It may not involve a street parade. It may not involve all the competitions, but something's happening. So let's imagine that we were able to do the Dimash Gras. So if, if you don't know what the Dimash Gras is, it's that event on the Carnival Sunday that um, crowns the king and the queen of the carnival. Uh, traditional, it used to have the Calypso King competition involved in there too. So if we were to do this kind of Dimash Gras competition or event virtually, and we were, we're trying to push this out mainly to the diaspora and people who's interested in this, I mean, what kind of planning would we need to do? How do we see this event happening? Are we looking at um, multiple camera setups? Where 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 would be a, a place to stream it to? Let, let's start thinking about it, you know? This feels like a Pandora box. Okay. <laughs> um, definitely, I think we, we need to explore it because it's one of the comments that I made on my personal page and, you know, coming out of everything this year. There are events in Carnival, and Carnival is not just a street parade. There are events that we can still put on, live stream, monetize the whole shebang, and you know, get it going. So if we have to use this the Dimash Gra example, listen, my, my heart will skip if we get this right. So, so I think it's a combination of looking at the show that we are a custom doing because at the end of the day you're going to be putting on a show on us on the stage in the queen's box because of the size of the costumes that we have to have right um but what is going to be different is how is the audience now going to be watching watching the show so if we are to live stream something like this the the show is not just going to be what is happening on the stage the show is going to start from 
all the behind the scenes and all the you know what is happening how are these costumes rolling on right or how are the the, the the artists getting ready to come on to to perform the event is going to be how are we preparing for the march graph virtually because as sean said it will be who are market inside of it why do i want to pay to watch this if you guys start showing me how is the team preparing all the behind the scenes stuff then i'm going to be super excited to see what the live thing is so when do we need to start almost now um because that's just now and for me as i always say these virtual events are starting with the end in mind so what do we want persons to see? What do we want persons to consume? What do we want persons to, to experience? And then build backwards from, from, from there. So yes, it's going to be a ton of cameras because it's the stage angles, it's the coming onto the stage angles, it's the behind getting ready angles. Um, it's, it's proper sound, it's internet, like you've never had internet before because you're going to need backup upon backup upon backup. Um, you know, so it is going to be a production and it's going to take a lot of planning, way more planning than if you were doing the, the in person event. Um, I believe I could um I could add to this. Um I believe that the right structure to one of one of the right approaches to do it, and I've seen it done, is that you, you have like a, a space and more like a, a this production space. And you you have all the production elements there from cameras and to get, get a little more technical, make sure everything's in 4K running um, um, fiber optics. Um, we can have a LED wall background so we could change the background so we could change different sceneries and stuff like that. So you more or less have this production. I won't call it a studio because it's bigger than a studio. It will have to be a, a pretty big space to do it. And then um, you more or less have a run a show. You, you know, produce what is going on from an event planning perspective. You know, you plan it out from there, and um, have somebody call on the show. Um, but I think that there's a lot of. I think that the um, in Trinidad, you guys sh should be able to pull it off because you guys have the infrastructure down there, more or less, to do it. Um, you have the infrastructure to do it, and I think that it will just be based on the imagination of the person who's putting it together. And then having the technical know-how, how to pull it off, which I think is there. So um, lighting, sound, I won't stay too long in this because we have so much time. But um, I think that there, there are facilities in Trinidad that could pull this off. It may not be outside, you know, but it, it, it might be able to be done indoors in a more controlled environment. And the content could be world-class content. I think somebody budgets that, I don't know what the budget for 2000. 20 carnival next year but maybe some of that money could be allocated into um developing these spaces and these because there are people in Trinidad that i know people in Trinidad that have actually been song forge and the other guys that have these these places here that could do it and i can maybe develop a whole new market and um developing um these virtual bigger studios to pull off a virtual carnival yes we, we want to be on the road but there are ways that we could be on the road inside you know, I I, I want to say that I have I have full confidence in the creativity of all of our planners to be able to pull off a a wonderful virtual event. I think the only the only worry I have is do people understand the business model surrounding virtual events so, so that it actually brings in profit? Because I feel like everybody feels like they don't want to do virtual because they don't know how to recoup a lot of these funds. And they feel like they only have to rely on the sponsorships. And if they don't get the sponsors, then everybody's up in arms saying that the government doesn't want to support anybody, but they need to understand or need to learn, you know, what are, what are the new um, business models that surround virtual events and live streaming? So I want to see, you know, again, if you are a, a if, 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 if events is your thing, I want to be able to see you guys utilizing things like Eventbrite, learning how to, to, to use these platforms to be able to get your e-tickets out there, have a seamless integration into um, whatever virtual event platform you're using so that people can add to cart buy they get an email and when it comes time to watch the event they can click a link and go right into the live experience there are so many different platforms out there that allow
for a seamless integration from the payment side and then right into, you know, again, clicking a link and going into the virtual event. So I want to see more um, people, companies, event planners, just learning more about the business models surrounding virtual events, the different platforms that they could use so that they could charge for e-tickets and then have a seamless experience where nobody's fussing about, you know, they didn't get a tank, they didn't get a ticket, they didn't get a link. You know, if you didn't get a link or end up in your spam, you know, can I log back into my account and be able to see the upcoming event and click on it? So that's going to be the big thing that I would like to see because I don't, I don't just want people to rely on sponsorships, start learning about the different business models, the different ways to sell content and monetize content. That way we can decrease and be, uh, decrease our reliance on getting sponsorships in, in order to have a successful event. Yeah, and I mean, I think um, the, the part of it that's needed is that, um, that pre-marketing because the audience has to be built in to this thing because traditionally, um, like this event particularly is just shown on on the, the national channel, and I, I well I wouldn't know what the viewership is there, but it's definitely not monetized in a way that it can be, you know. So I mean, I think building in the marketing from the the beginning, maybe building that narrative. So we could go in all the um, um, mass yards and film what's going on with 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 these um, the, the costume designers and see what's going on, what 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 they, where their head is at. Interview them and have that as part of the narrative and start creating some content from now that people could start buying into, like you were saying, Tisha. So have them start buying into it from now, getting that behind the scenes. So when the show is live and ready to go. You already have this built-in audience of thousands and thousands of people who are ready to buy any tickets and um i mean i guess it's a bit of a gamble but I, I, all events are a gamble right i mean we, we're doing this long enough and we know that there's always a gamble with events because um a bad storm could come tonight or whatever it is and it's just ruin everything for you so i think yeah i think it's just as i said you know it's it's starting with the end in mind if we know that is what we want to do then we need to start just looking at what is required to make that happen and as we established it's not going to be a walk in the park but you know it's exciting times ahead because we we have to realize that our market is not just here you know so as i said we already it would have been a tv production so there are some elements that you would have had in place now you just have to have a few extra and you know, to be able to push out the live stream, but more importantly, the content that is going into this live, into the live stream. So it's not just going to be, oh, well, I'm going to cut to a commercial because this, this is the spot of it. What else can I show to bring people into the experience to help them appreciate? And, and as you said, if the marketing for this was planned and done in advance in a way that people have bought into this thing and now we start to create out what we call the new marketing world of four more, the fear of missing out, then they're like, okay, no, I'm seeing, I've been seeing the, con the content, I really want to know what this is. And then what is going to eventually happen when things are quote unquote normal, then people will want to come and fly in to experience this thing real time because they would have had this virtual experience. So it's a it's it's going to take some investment. We're probably not going to see the the rewards the way we will quote unquote want but as we said this is all evergreen content this is about pushing what we have and what we own this is us and what we didn't touch on in this whole live stream and thing is the whole idea of intellectual property and i think that's a whole other conversation but that is something that we we'll also have to be mindful of once we start pushing out this content via stream you know music and copyright and all those different things and that's something else that we have to look at but Again, it's a to care of monetization. This is another way that you can you you can earn because then if you are putting all this this content, then reproduction of it and you have IP right on it, then that's money money that's for you. Revenue for you that it can come in after the fact. You know, so, so mm -hmm. to to add to Tisha's point, right? One of the big challenges is we need to learn about the various ways, the hundreds of ways to monetize. We don't just need to monetize the content. 
So I'll give you an example. Let's just say we're doing a road to Dimashgra, all right? And we know that at the end of the entire journey, we're going to be watching that show. If there is a segment that is talking about, you know, um, the building of the, the building of let, let's let's use costumes for example. Let's just say we're going to be doing a road to carnival, right? And one of the one of the bands decides that they're going to be showcasing how they build the costumes. Now that's content that people could pay for, but you know what else people you know what else could happen? Let's just say, what if the people that are watching want to create their own costumes? You can do things like affiliate sales. So if you know that there are vendors that are selling these things, you could set up commission links online where, where anybody that clicks on the link, um, the company can make a percentage of it. If you're using you know, goods that you could buy on Amazon, you could set up an Amazon store. So if people want to participate in the building of the, the costume, they can go onto your Amazon link and buy all the necessary components. And then you, the company, would make commission off of those sales. You can do digital courses. So yes, we can watch the content. But again, what if I want to learn how to build the costume alongside with you? I could then subscribe to your digital course at a fee and learn how to create the costume as well. So monetization isn't just limited to the content. The content is a driver of traffic to the various different streams of income that you can create. And again, we need to learn about the new way of conducting business online because there are hundreds of ways to monetize content. And we are only ever concerned about one, you paying a fee to come into a live event when there are so many other ways that you can create that content. Another thing is, if you have a website and you're pushing content to your website, simply, again, being able to sell either ad space or connecting Google AdSense, and as traffic is coming into your platform, you are raking in money from people just coming to your website. So there's a lot of ways to monetize. We just need to learn the wide range of them, and then you're not going to be so reliant on just one aspect having to perform well in order to recoup your costs. Yeah, I think that's a really nice place for us to conclude. Just that mindset change needs to happen that we don't need to, as you say, just depend on event sales to get. Because, I mean, there's no reason why this industry can't be booming way more than it is, you know? Um, so, again, I want to thank all our panelists. Um, I hope to see some of you in our networking session later once you can make it it'll be great um i know people are going to have tons of questions um so again thanks everybody again for being part of this um the discussion was great i mean i know we could talk again for another three hours on these topics so uh hopefully we can have these conversations a little bit more in the future and um it was great thanks so much thanks for having me Thank so you for having me. Thanks, man. Hi, guys. I'm Aaron Eiffel from the Spotlight Program, and I support the TTISRC because it helps foreigners, locals, Caribbean people identify Trinidad and Tobago's music. So this album that we release, you all could find it streaming on all of or on my platforms and you will be able to identify that as well. So yes, I support them. Check out the album and yeah. It's Rome and um, I just want to say that I appreciate what Music TT is doing in terms of the different ventures that they are putting in place to try and help promote the music industry as a whole. Oh, Music TT, I must say, um, from the live music district straight to the Spotlight program has been amazing to me. I have done lots of performances, I have grown throughout those performances as well as the Spotlight program. It has made me an all-rounder when it comes to being an artist. I want to say thank you to Music TT for giving me the opportunity to, to showcase my talent. This has been uh, an amazing, an amazing opportunity. I would like to commend Music TT on all the work they've been doing on artist development and 
artist awareness and getting them ready and kind of creating a platform for a lot of the younger artists to kind of get themselves into the space and get them to people like me, which is fantastic. We've come so far, not far enough. Some days we fall, then we're rising up. Until it's real, name in the stars. No time to stop, forever forward. I'm Tanila Moore, and I'm a singer-songwriter from Trinidad, but I have been living all over the world, and I'm currently living in the States, which I'm sure you can tell from my accent. My music is a mix between pop, reggae, and hip-hop. I sing and I rap. And last year I put together a proposal to Music TT for support in the work that I'm doing and was successful in receiving support from them. I'm extremely grateful for that because I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing without that. I would encourage anyone who's thinking about putting together a proposal for Music TT to do it. I think that Trinidad has some of the most talented artists that I've ever met and I've worked with people from all around the world including Shaggy, Mr. Vegas, Bungie Garland from our very own Trinidad and Tobago, John Legend, Pixie Lott, the Black Eyed Peas crew, Michael Franti's team. I'm working right now with some of the producers that work with Chance the Rapper. The progress that I've been making has been incredible. I am currently actually in Las Vegas because I'm working with Erica Badu's management team now. And I've been in LA for the past month I am working with a bunch of producers here. I've been working with Trini producers as well. The most recent was track seven. We did a song together and also I did a song with Kayla Hart. I've been doing a lot. I have a song called I Am A Girl that was picked up by the United Nations as their anthem for International Women's Day. In LA, I'm working with some of the people at The Record Plant, one of the best studios in LA to do a relaunch of the song I Am A Girl that will be released later this year with some massive features on the song. With the help of Music TT, I put out two videos. One of them was called Bad Name, which speaks about the importance of consent and is in support of the Me Too movement and Time's Up. So obviously very relevant to what's happening in the world today around gender equality and female empowerment. And then I put out another song called The Grace and that song features some voices from women in Tanzania because I have an organization in Tanzania called EPIC where we drill clean water wells and do community growth and development. So on The Grace I sampled some of the women's voices from Tanzania and used them on that song as well. The video for The Grace was shot and edited entirely with the support of Music TT. Same thing for Bad Name. I think that it's so important that the government continues to support the work of our incredible artists. Truthfully, the talent in Trinidad is some of the best that I've seen. So thank you to all the team at Music TT for supporting what I'm doing and supporting me in this current project. Looking forward to working with you all some more. I have a lot of things in the works some of which I can't even talk about yet, but I'm very excited about. I'm gonna continue doing everything in my power to represent Trinidad in the best possible way. Support Music TT, they're doing great things. Red, white, and black all the way. Hey, what's up everybody? This is Daryl Zerbe, and I am here to fully endorse the TTISROC codes for any single person that I'm working with. Um, for those that don't know, I am a songwriter and producer, and I love the fact that we now have these because it's a perfect way for us to track our music. It's a perfect way for us to start laying a claim into the world of music coming from our twin island republic. I am Leah Sophia and I'm a Spotlight artist. I endorse the TTISRC because it ensures that me and my fellow artists get paid. Hey yo, my name is Jess Liz and I am a Crouching Big Women artist and I put my stamp of approval on the TTISRC because they allow me to get my royalties and get Hey, this is Ruel Lynch, 
and as a music producer, I am always listening out for the latest inspiration for my beats and information on the music business. That is why I am sharing all the information about the Trinidad and Tobago International Standard Recording Code, TTISRC. It is a code that will improve our local industry because it will measure, track, and index sound recordings from our country. Plus, this code is required by digital distribution companies to sell our music online. So for me, any track I'm producing for my artist will have this unique code. Join the movement with me and get the international standard recording code for all your new releases. Music TT Export Academy is an initiative geared towards music business education and capacity building through workshops, conferences, and webinars. Music TT partners with stakeholders in the local music industry to host conferences annually. You want to win a gold medal and you started training last week. It doesn't happen so. So why disrespect this industry by trying to do the same thing? It does not work. It will never, ever work. As Music TT seeks to build capacity in the music industry, topics are determined by current trends that can have an impact on revenue generation, as well as highlighting opportunities that have export potential. What I got out of it, I got a lot of clarity in terms of understanding how um, the differences of exploitation, because we hear the word and we're afraid when we hear exploiting the music. And so I was able to understand how the positive sides of exploitation of music really works for you as a songwriter, as an artist. Reverb is Music TT's webinar series where veterans of the music industry share their knowledge and experience. It's streamed live on the last Thursday of every month and a replay of the webinar is posted on our YouTube page. Be sure to subscribe to be notified. Spotlight is an artist portfolio development program where Music CT provides skills for artists specific to their individual needs over a period of nine months to one year. These training sessions include stage performance skills, vocal training, and helps us to identify those artists who are ready to take their talent internationally. Music TT conducts auditions every year, so to be in the know, go visit their website and follow all their social media platforms right now. Summer Spotlight artists have been cast in international productions like The Lion King in London and Summer on Tour in Italy, Bali, Singapore and Canada. Some have even been nominated and received awards at various local award events. Spotlight is open to all genres. However, Music TT is making special links with international agencies, producers and industry executives that has a special interest in artists and music with Caribbean flavors. It is recommended that those who apply have moderate to significant performance experience and are actively creating a catalog of music. Oh my God, it's been such a pleasure being a part of the third cohort of this Music TT Spotlight program. We learned so much, we learned so much in this program about branding, about marketing, about photography, you know, your image and marketing yourself out there. In this cohort, I got to do a single. Y'all, that was the best experience working with Daryl, one of the best songwriters in Trinidad. I couldn't have asked for anything better. I was really, really excited to work on my new single with the team provided by Music TT. Thank you. I was able to not just sing my heart out, but show off some of my writing skills as well as learn how to improve on it. And I'm really happy with the music that we were able to create. I've truly learned so much from Music TT Spotlight program. 
this professional advice, guidance, knowledge. If you want to get that edge in your creativity as an artist, I would highly recommend you be a part of this program. I really recommend the Spotlight program because it's a good camp for artists. It's just all about developing you as an artist no matter how far along you are, no matter where you want to go with it. It's something I would recommend to anybody. Hi guys, I'm Aaron Eiffel from the Spotlight program and I support the TTISRC because it helps foreigners, locals, Caribbean people, identify Trinidad and Tobago's music. So this album that we release, you could find it streaming on all, all online platforms and you will be able to identify that as well. So yes, I support them, check out the album and yeah. I'm Tanila Moore and I'm a singer-songwriter from Trinidad but I have been living all over the world and I'm currently living in the States which I'm sure you can tell from my accent. My music is a mix between pop, reggae and hip-hop. I sing and I rap and last year I put together a proposal to Music TT for support in the work that I'm doing and was successful in receiving support from them. I'm extremely grateful for that because I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing without that. I would encourage anyone who's thinking about putting together a proposal for Music TT to do it. I think that Trinidad has some of the most talented artists that I've ever met and I've worked with people from all around the world including Shaggy, Mr. Vegas, Bungie Garland from our very own Trinidad and Tobago, John Legend, Pixie Lott, the Black Eyed Peas crew, Michael Franti's team. I'm working right now with some of the producers that work with Chance the Rapper. The progress that I've been making has been incredible. I am currently actually in Las Vegas because I'm working with Erica Badu's management team now. And I've been in LA for the past month. I am working with a bunch of producers here. I've been working with Trini producers as well. The most recent was track seven. We did a song together and also I did a song with Kayla Part. I've been doing a lot. I have a song called I Am A Girl that was picked up by the United Nations as their anthem for International Women's Day. In LA, I'm working with some of the people at The Record Plant, one of the best studios in LA, to do a relaunch of the song I Am A Girl that will be released later this year with some massive features on the song. With the help of Music TT, I put out two videos. One of them was called Bad Name, which speaks about the importance of consent and is in support of the Me Too movement and Time's Up, so obviously very relevant to what's happening in the world today around gender equality and female empowerment. And then I put on another song called The Grace, and that song features some voices from women in Tanzania because I have an organization in Tanzania called Epic, where we drill clean water wells and do community growth and development. So on The Grace, I sampled some of the women's voices from Tanzania and used them on that song as well. The video for The Grace was shot and edited entirely with the support of Music TT. Same thing for Bad Name. I think that it's so important that the government continues to support the work of our incredible artists. Truthfully, the talent in Trinidad is some of the best that I've seen. So thank you to all the team at Music TT for supporting what I'm doing and supporting me in this current project. Looking forward to working with you all some more. I have a lot of things in the works, some of which I can't even talk about yet, but I'm very excited about. I'm going to continue doing everything in my power to represent Trinidad in the best possible way. Support Music TT, they're doing great things. Red, white, and black all the way. It's Rome, and um, I just want to say that I appreciate what Music TT is doing in terms of the different ventures that they are putting in place to try and help promote the music industry as a whole. Oh, Music TT, yeah. I must say, um, from the Live Music District straight to the Spotlight program has been amazing to me. I have 
done lots of performances. I have grown throughout those performances as well as the Spotlight program. It has made me an all-rounder when it comes to being an artist. I want to say thank you to Music Titi for giving me the opportunity to, to showcase my talent. This has been uh, an amazing, an amazing opportunity. I would like to commend the Music City on all the work they've been doing on artist development and artist awareness, getting them ready and kind of creating a platform for a lot of the younger artists to kind of get themselves into the space and get them to people like me, which is fantastic. Oh my God, it's been such a pleasure being a part of the third cohort of this Music City Spotlight program. We learned so much, we learned so much in this program about branding, about marketing, about photography, you know, your image and marketing yourself out there. In this cohort, I got to do a single. Y'all, that was the best experience working with Daryl, one of the best songwriters in Trinidad. I couldn't have asked for anything better. I was really, really excited to work on my new single with the team provided by Music TT. Thank you. I was able to not just sing my heart out, but show off some of my writing skills as well as learn how to improve on it. And I'm really happy with the music that we were able to create. Music TT Export Academy is an initiative geared towards music business education and capacity building through workshops, conferences, and webinars. Music TT partners with stakeholders in the local music industry to host conferences annually. You want to win a gold medal and you started training last week. It doesn't happen so. So why disrespect this industry by trying to do the same thing? It does not work. It will never, ever work. As Music TT seeks to build capacity in the music industry, topics are determined by current trends that can have an impact on revenue generation, as well as highlighting opportunities that have export potential. What I got out of it, I got a lot of clarity in terms of understanding how um, the differences of exploitation, because we hear the word and we're afraid when we hear exploiting the music. And so I was able to understand how the positive sides of exploitation of music really works for you as a songwriter, as an artist. Reverb is Music TT's webinar series where veterans of the music industry share their knowledge and experience. It's streamed live on the last Thursday of every month and a replay of the webinar is posted on our YouTube page. Be sure to subscribe to be notified. I don't want to go into the chat room. You don't want to be going into your chat. Guys, <laughs> help me out here. I'm not good at this stuff. What now? What's the message about? Check, check, check. I hope I'm being heard. Message again. So, hi everyone. Thank you for joining this session this morning. Um, it's part of Music TT's Reverb Experience. Um, my name is Jerry Williams, Creative Director and Founder of New Pyre Festival, which is a Premier Sustainable Lifestyle and Cultural Festival in the Caribbean. Um, today, or uh, this session, we're going to be discussing festivals going green. And um, we're going to be joined by, or we are joined by um, three other panelists. I'm going to introduce them shortly. 
In fact, I'll introduce them right now. So we have Vanessa David, who is the lead dreamer and doer of Global Villages Development Consultants and co-founder of Good School Americas. And she's also a co-creator of the Edge Effect podcast. So you're going to hear about that podcast and how you can um, participate in that. We have Anne-Marie Rooks, who is a facilitator and founder of JTB Homesteads, uh, who is also a co-creator co of the Edge Effect podcast. And Anne-Marie is joining um, also and going to be speaking in her capacity or from her experience personally as um, our waste management coordinator at New Fire Festival, her organization, JTB Homestead, being one of our collaborating entities. And then we have Sean McCoon, who is a manager at Environment Tobago, and um, who also is involved in the organizing of the Friendship Festival. So fellow panelists, after some technical glitches, you guys know I'm not um, savvy at this stuff. Um, we finally got it sorted out. I want to apologize to everyone out there tuning in, but thank you for your patience. Um, I just had some, some issues with the technology. Um, I had mentioned to my um, fellow panelists that um, what I wanted to do was begin by laying out a philosophical sort of foundation for, for this panel. And that is going to require that I, that I read something that I prepared just so we have the, 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 the philosophical and ideological understanding of why it's important that festivals and events generally adopt a more environmentally responsible um, approach to how they do things. So I'm going to start with this foundation and then we are going to go through um, with the panelists giving an intro uh, into where they are going to be speaking from as well, all right? So historically, festivals have served as exposés of the culture of the people, of the places where they occur. But what is culture? The most succinct definition for culture is, culture is how we live. Culture is therefore the everyday lived expression of the collective values, beliefs, aspirations, attitudes, and behaviors of a people. So more than just a specific set of artistic or creative highlights on stage at the festival, there is a demonstration of the general culture of the people happening off stage. But culture is not static. It changes. Culture is not static. It changes. And it changes in relation to context and eventualities. Those changes are not always deliberate and are not always positive. But sometimes they are deliberately engineered and they have dire consequences. Our present day global consumer culture is one that was deliberately engineered. And now the greatest threat facing humanity is a consequence of that engineered culture. The words of US economist and retailing analyst Philip Bo in 1955 succinctly captures the thinking behind this cultural engineering, which commenced at that time and sums up the direction that global economic thinking and culture has taken ever since. Congruent with the strategies promoted by the Council of Economic Advisors to President Eisenhower, as the US was trying to ramp up its economy post-World War II, the book famously proclaimed in the Journal of Retailing, and I quote, our enormously productive economy demands that we make consumption our way of life, that we convert the buying and use of goods into rituals, that we seek our spiritual satisfaction and our ego satisfaction in consumption. We need things consumed, burned up, worn out, replaced, discarded at an ever increasing rate. Doesn't that perfectly sum up our civilization's attitude towards consumer goods? Having developed and established the most sophisticated, robust, and effective mass media and telecommunications apparatus in the world, it was not long before that newly engineered U.S. consumption culture spread throughout the world. This new culture is perhaps the most insidious development in the last hundred years within Western civilization, which has been waging war, perhaps unintentionally, upon our natural environments. It has helped to expand, exponentially speed up the ravaging of our, of, our, of our planet and has brought us to the threshold of the greatest threat to the lives and livelihood of the vast majority, majority of humanity. Perfect, a perfect storm of planet-wide ecological catastrophes, including climate change. 
And we have arrived here, even while the best of, destructive, of the destructive consumption culture is enjoyed only by a minority of the world's population at the expense of a majority. At the moment, the COVID-19 pandemic has captured all our attention only because the consequence or threat is immediate, obvious, and relatively specific. But the truth is that the pandemic as a threat to humanity pales in comparison to the brewing ecological cataclysm. However, while we were able to quickly mount an unprecedented global response to COVID-19 involving measures such as the complete shutdown of the global economy, which before the pandemic would have been considered as totally un unrealistic and unthinkable, we seem rather reluctant and resistant to making even the basic changes that are required to overcome the greater threat. The necessary re-engineering from that consumption culture, the unprecedented paradigm transformation required of us to overcome this existential challenge has implications for all aspects of human society, all activities and all enterprises. And that includes cultural, the cultural creative sector, which includes cultural events. The massive importance of this transformation must be reflected in popular culture. It must be endorsed and championed by popular culture icons and must be reflected in our cultural activities, such as festivals. As was the case with our easy compliance with pandemic response, such as the shutdown of economies and the halting of social activities, I would hope that event organizers would just as easily agree to a call by a fellow industry practitioner to make our events ecologically responsible. It would be a shame to think that we would sooner abide with not having any festivals or, culture, or cultural events at all than we would agree to endeavor to make our festival, festivals and cultural events ecologically responsible. And that has many more direct and indirect benefits for society that I can begin to elaborate here. But I've always known the truth is, as was demonstrated by our easy compliance with state-driven pandemic response measures, that it is always with our government that the greatest potential for driving societal slash national transformation lies. In the case of the pandemic, our government simply proclaimed new rules and laws and stated the consequences for disobedience, and everyone fell in line. The fact that they could utilize state powers to so responsibly direct people's behavior mean that they could always use those powers to drive changes that are necessary for the meaningful transformation of society. All governments must act now in a manner that reflects an understanding of this crisis and an intention to be the leader in the needed transformation. However, I'm a firm believer in the idea that whenever our governments fail to provide leadership to secure the best interests of the people, it is the duty of the people to do what is necessary towards that object. And as it relates to this great crisis, I believe that in festivals and cultural events lie great potential for inspiring and catalyzing positive behavior change in our audiences and indeed the wider populace. Furthermore, I would say that it is especially at cultural events such as festivals that awareness of the crisis must be reflected and responsible leadership asserted because these occasions provide the best opportunities to introduce, inspire, and reinforce the messages and call to action on this crisis on the part of the festival attendees. Therefore, whatever the characteristics of any festival in relation to the prevailing realities in the wider world, it is a reflection of the values, beliefs, and attitudes of the event organizers towards those realities. If the event organizers truly care about those realities, I believe it will be reflected in the event. Like the government and their use of state power in enforcing radical pandemic measures upon the society, the event organizer has the same level of power to direct behavior change in their patrons, even if only for the duration of the event. If the overall experience of, of the event is great and a person wants to attend it, they will abide by the rules. And I'm attesting to this from my experience with New Fire Festival. Therefore, festival and event organizers and artists and artists too 
need to act now in a manner that reflects an understanding of this crisis and that they are willing to use their influence to lead in the needed transformation. Now, there is a reason I mentioned earlier that our consumption culture is at the foundation of this great ecological crisis. I said that because the only way to solve the ecological crisis is to address the consumption culture. No amount of technologies, green, blue, or otherwise, will achieve what a change in behavior, indeed a change in culture, is going to accomplish. One of the most glaring ways in which this culture is wreaking havoc on our natural environments is the staggering volume of waste we generate with which we pollute our natural environments. Unfortunately, festivals, popular cultural events, and social events generally are among the settings where we witness a direct expose of the unsustainable consumption culture, albeit limited to a narrow range of products. This problem manifests in the tremendous amount of disposable solid waste we see at the end or in the aftermath of, uh, of our popular events. Additionally, connected to that waste, and this is very important, it's important to note that connected to all of that waste is a trail of carbon emissions that, and other industrial practices that are also destructive to the natural environment. Our attitudes towards consumption and waste at social events is a glimpse into the massive environmental problem that is critical to us, especially in the Caribbean, perhaps more than any other ecological problem. And it is the one we can immediately start to transform. While climate change is important, it will, because it will have fundamental impacts on us as small island developing states, we are not the ones driving that problem. The large industrial nations with their massive carbon footprints and greenhouse gas emissions are. Our actual carbon footprint and greenhouse gas emissions are still relatively low. And while we should still address that because every drop counts, we must not get carried away and jump on the bandwagon of issues being trumpeted by the metropoles while neglecting what is even more relevant to us. We cannot be clamoring about climate change and carbon molecules in the sky while we are dumping actual waste, garbage, refuse all over our landscape and polluting our natural environment. According to a 2019 article in Forbes magazine, Caribbean islands are the biggest plastic polluters per capita in the world. The article went on to say, the little island of St. Lucia, which produces the sixth largest amount of plastic waste per capita in the Caribbean, generates more than four times the amount of plastic waste per person as China, which is the largest plastic polluter in absolute terms, and is responsible for 1.2 times more improperly disposed plastic waste per capita than China. Further, the article says, of the top 30 global polluters per capita, 10 are from the Caribbean region, and TNT is among that number. Some experts are predicting that by 2050, there could be as much plastics in the ocean as there are fish. Some of you might know about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Some, may, some of you may know about the, the garbage patch we have right here in the Caribbean Sea. These so-called garbage patches are veritable islands of floating plastic debris from waste discarded by humans gathered by ocean gyres. Experts estimate that each year, almost 8 million metric tons of plastic waste ends up in the ocean, wreaking havoc on marine ecosystems and marine, marine life of all sorts. We also know that you can hardly look at any canal, drain, or river in our countries and not see litter, trash of all kinds floating downstream, making their way to the ocean. And we also know that we're small islands, islands surrounded by those same oceans that support traditional, potentially sustainable mar maritime enterprises. And we know that a large percentage of our population depends on those maritime enterprises for life and livelihood. We also know that these oceans, marine ecosystems, and coastline features are the main attractions at the foundation of our tourism industry, which is the main economic engine for so many of our economies. Yet we seem unable to connect the dots between our own negative behaviors related to consumption and waste and the erosion of the possibilities for truly sustainable economies and livelihoods. However, a golden opportunity is now before us to transform that unsustainable legacy. It is in this area 
of environmental damage that events and festivals can take the lead in helping to drive behavior change with our audiences. This is the area where events contribute to the problem, in my opinion, in the most direct and glaring way, the most significant way. And this is the area where new fire festival focuses energy and attention to addressing. We strive to reduce the use of disposable in organic items in every aspect of our festival operation, from early in the planning stage, including uh, in our planning meetings, in the promotion stage, in all the small events that we organize to promote in the festival, and in the festival execution stage, from venue loading and set up to break down and load out. Also, every aspect of design for the built infrastructure, amenities, aesthetics, features, and every aspect of the festival experience is underpinned by a philosophy of aiming for zero waste. And this brings us, and I want to say this in closing, this brings us to Carnival, which is the premier national festival of TNT. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced two-year hiatus on the beloved festival, which defines the culture of the nation. The truth is that in recent decades, Trinidad and Tobago Carnival has become a massive waste generating festival. Best estimates from swim call um, states somewhere in the region of a thousand truckloads of, if I remember correctly, a thousand truckloads of additional waste goes to the landfills in the three days of the, of the of carnival itself, not to mention um, the, the entire season um, with all of the big events, all of the big pets, and the amount of waste that is generated in, in those. Now, we have this golden opportunity to rebrand TNT Carnival for its, re for its re emergence after COVID 19. And we can rebrand TNT Carnival into a festival of the 22nd century, I would, I would even say, that not only serves as a catalyst for initiating a transformation of the behavior of Trinidadians towards the environment but also to recapture the attention and imagination of the rest of the world. Furthermore, and this is very important, the pandemic brought the global tourism industry to its needs. And post-pandemic, that industry will be extremely competitive. Therefore, transforming TNT Carnival is, the way, is one way that the product can be made more attractive to a global audience that is growing more discerning. And, uh, you know, we can really re-inspire people about Carnival. Reading Carnival will vastly improve the quality of the, the quality and value of the experience. And this can be played up in the marketing of the festival. But we have to be careful that it is not a greenwashing exercise. Let us seize this moment to initiate what I would describe as a metamorphosis of Trinidad and Tobago Carnival into a truly beautiful festival in all regards, and indeed, how we do events generally. I know that was a bit lengthy. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening through it. Um, but I felt that it was very important that um, an understanding of how severe the, the problem is um, and why it's necessary that events become green. What I, what I will do now is um, pass the mic to speak to my other panelists um, for them to introduce the ideas that they would like uh, they, they will be presenting and we're going to start with uh denisa denisa you have the mic thanks jerry for setting context so imagine this early 2000s around the bridge in port of spain minutes to four after pan semis and there's this image that i wish i captured on film two older men were pushing a rack with six bases they ran and pushed off cruising with box cart joy i don't know if it was the cackling of one of them or the cacophony of the jumping bases and the wheel rumbling on the pitch that woke up a pattern but mister was vexed and started running down one of them and almost grazed his car so imagine these two older men at 4 a.m. enjoying the playfulness of that moment while a pattern is at their heels. That is the kind of magic that I love about the Panorama Festival. 
and about this Caribbean space. In her keynote address, Dr. Till mentioned the importance of using the resources we have. And I find that there is so much magic when we think about how those same bases, those instruments which make sweet music, the soulfulness and the depth that touches your core, that these same bases were only discarded drums at some point in time. And yes, they were used to store water and, and as garbage bins, etc. But in the middle of a global depression in the 1930s, we took our waste and we created an instrument. And descriptions of that time bear some similarity to the global pandemic that we are experiencing. I think of how we feel in this moment, and I know that there are many people like me who at times don't feel motivated to do squat. And so many of us are internalizing all that is going on and we are not even aware of it. In the 1930s, they were experiencing illness and that just like we are, unemployment and poverty, and they created an instrument. I don't know the real motivation behind this creation, but as we explore becoming more eco-responsible for festivals, it would be good to remind ourselves that we have a history of coming up with innovative solutions to transform our waste, even in the most depressing times. I grew up in a community, a rural community, Rio Claro, where we used to harry leaves as plates for festivals like Diwali. That was very common. We cut heliconias from the yard and they use heliconias to decorate the Catholic church for mass. It was a regular thing. Uh, so instead of purchasing new decorations, we used what we had. There were and are simple ways in which we have been and are eco-responsible in planning events. We had things like palm branches that were used to create privacy walls, and those were done out of necessity. Jerry would have mentioned the dangerous consumer culture that we are engulfed by. Um, in many rural communities, we use the existing resources instead of purchasing new things. And that's something that we need to remind ourselves of. It's also a good reminder that even before the word sustainability and greening became buzzwords, we were doing it. And that is encouragement to not see the task of greening or reshaping our festivals as overwhelming. In 2019, through Global Villages Development Consultants, I was fortunate to guide a team to the Green of Cary Festa held in Trinidad and Tobago. One of the things that I was clear about in the first workshop was that I was simply sharing suggestions, that I was not holding a big stick over them to comply. I was aware that the request was being done at the last minute and that it would be difficult to implement some of the things that were being suggested, like buying local produce to create the meals that they would sell. Many of them had already purchased raw materials and you had contingents from Haiti and St. Lucia that had brought their own spices and provisions. So that's one of the things that in planning festivals that we have to bear in mind, the time factor, and to give ourselves enough lead time to educate and to get buy-in and to involve all stakeholders in planning. So coming out of that experience, I. I have to stress how useful it is to begin education about greening with all stakeholders weeks and possibly months before an event. What is even better is creating an online community of persons who can share information and about how we reduce our carbon footprint in our individual lives and in our homes. So the work of greening a festival really starts with each person in his or her daily life. Two weeks before Carifesta in 2019, a green guide was included in the Carifesta manual and on the Carifesta app. And it included suggestions like carpooling and walking with reusable containers. There was also a separate green guide for vendors. So we would have suggested things like unplugging appliances that didn't need to be powered throughout the time there. We also conducted a workshop to inform food vendors of our plan to collect their fruit and vegetable scraps and we shared tips for them um, about how they can reduce their overall carbon footprint for the festival and beyond. They were quite cooperative and uh, that material was actually used to, for compost 
composting in a community garden in Nayaro. We were very proud to have saved 40,000 singles of the landfill. We had a hydration station and we collected beverage containers uh, for a partnership with EMA Eye Care. It was very easy. It's very easy for any organizer to decide to collect beverage containers to save them from the landfill, but not think, put things in place for the collection of the material. So it's important that the research is done to coordinate, to work out things like storage on site and collection and to ensure that the next step is one which makes most sense. While it was not the case for Carifesta, one can very easily plan all of this and have plastic bottles end up disintegrating in a facility as opposed to going to a company like Flying Tree to be converted to benches and tiles. So one of the things that we experienced on the first day was having janitors pick up the beverage containers and combine it with other garbage. So for efforts like these, it's important that we ensure that all stakeholders are aware of what we're doing and that they are involved in the planning. There were some additional lessons that I feel might be useful for event planners and decorators, etc. What one of the things that we should ask ourselves is what are the existing local green solutions which can be improved on for use? So I would have mentioned Sahari leaves, and there, there's this guy in Mayaru that uses palm plates, makes palm plates from material that he collects from his community for his roost pitch business. That's an example of how we can use the resources that we have locally. One of the things that's also very um, important is communicating with compassion and communicating responsibly. If we are to engage stakeholders, then it's important to understand their language. So if we are engaging the private sector, for example, we need to use their language. For them, dollars and cents spent on greeting must make sense. And an example would be a janitor. An eco solution must be as or even easier than a regular practice for, for it to make sense for a janitor. And that's just the reality. Another thing that we noted during the Carifesta, um, for the Carifesta experience is that if we chuck in environmental elements in our events, like last minute invitations, they will be poorly received. So organizations which are interested in greeting their events need to start with their own operations and their interest should be genuine. They can partner with environmental organizations for support. And partnerships are important because one person or one organization really has all the answers. So if we collaborate, then we'll be able to source expertise from different persons. Like this crisis of humans not living in harmony with the earth is a byproduct of Western culture, which is largely imposing and dominant and quite oppressive. As we use the experience of this crisis and we look beyond the COVID-19 pandemic to reshape our sustainable festivals, we need to share information with party planners, event organizers, state agencies, and this should not be done with the same force or oppression as the very thing that created this crisis. We should be open to mutual exchange. Most people don't do differently because they either do not know anything different, it is not profitable or it's not convenient. This means that we have to consistently share information and find ways to make alternative approaches more profitable and convenient. And that might look like encouraging more corporate entities to seriously consider funding greening initiatives to make it easier on event planners. There's a radical academic who I follow called Bayo Komolafe, who says that the crisis is in how we manage the crisis. And I surely hope that we will make good use of both crises. Jerry, we're now hearing you. I 
I think your mic may have gone again. So maybe Anne Marie could share a bit about. Um, yeah, I'll do. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Denise. And thank you, Jerry. And, uh, hi, Sean. <laughs> yeah, my entry into the, the world of festivals began really with, uh, with Nupai Festival um, as, a, as an active participant. And I have to say that um, I was very, um, thank you, Jerry, for including me in your panel. The, the whole notion of greening a festival is intriguing because, um, it, I mean, everything was green at one time or the other, but now we have to, we have to reverse engineer a lot of what we do as a, as a culture. But anyway, my involvement with New Fire Festival, it was started in 2016. My organization, JTB Homesteads, was founded, let's see, we registered that in 2014. And we began doing uh, composting workshops and uh, designing waste reduction workshops. And uh, when I saw what uh, Trinidad and Tobago Bridge Initiative was doing through New Fire Festival, I wanted to get involved. So in 2016, I was involved as a volunteer. And uh, then uh, from 2017 onwards, I became involved as a waste management, uh, as part of the waste management team, the, uh, the leaders of that team for that matter. And there began the adventure of the, the crazy idea, the crazy notion of reducing waste at a music arts festival. And it was not just a music arts festival, it's a transformational festival, really, because it was in, with, in, introduced into the whole idea of a music and arts festival were the, the, the vibe as well as the information about how to be more sustainable. Um, all sorts of talks and um, workshops and discussions around sustainability, sustainable practices, wellness and health and wellness. And uh, so I was very um, enamored by New Fire Festival. So I, I continue to be involved and I continue to get the, the idea that festivals like that could be more green. Um, I grew up in Trinidad. <laughs> I have seen, but the biggest festival I know is Carnival. Jerry referred to Carnival as the biggest, and it is. It's very important and close to many Trinities. Even if you don't mass, it's part of our, our identity. And that, I, I, I have a dream of Carnival being just that a whole bunch of people having a wonderful time with music and mass and, and performances with no rubbish in the road. <laughs> and I know that's a dream. It's my dream, but there probably are a couple other people who have that dream too. And I think it's possible. Crazy, you think? I don't think so. I think it's, I think it's doable. And it's doable because I believe that uh, the experience of the Fire Festival showed that um, something as crazy as that is doable because in a matter of four iterations of that festival, it got, we got more focused each time, more pointed about the production of waste at a festival. And it came out of each of the team members introducing into their lives the whole notion of um, decreasing their carbon footprint through reducing the waste that they produce. And those team members who were able to really make um, changes in their lives and adopt new habits were able to have a real contribution to the ideas that we needed to put into the festival to achieve just that as a festival scale. 
So the, and this is what we found this out in the first, the first time we uh, approached the whole zero waste uh, messaging. And that's where uh, uh, the, the people in the team really got grounded in what needed to be done. The message of what zero waste meant for our festival was what we took on and sent out continuously before the festival. This really began, let's say, the festival of the New Fire Festival of 2017, the, the, second, the second one. It was important that the messaging got out there. For 2018, the messages were even more, were more pointed, more focused, and there were more people on board in the team because they had started to develop behavior for themselves, change their habits to reduce more waste. And as we were, as the team became more informed about the challenges of doing that, they, the festival became more informed about how to really execute it. And so it, we learned that the secret is getting the message out there, getting the message out in a way that is consistent, um, pointed, um, simple, so that people go, oh, this is what I need to do. This is what I need to do. So for the festival, what were the, some, some of the ground rules? Come to the festival with something to put your drinks in. Come to the festival with something to put your food in. And it, it, sounds, it sounds stupid and simple, but that was it. That was it. And then, of course, we realized, okay, if we're asking people to come to the festival with something to put your food in, we have to create a, a, a way for them to be able to wash those things so they could buy more food for the whole weekend. And that's the, the having lots of food. So those were things that were put in. That's not in any festival. Nobody else doing that. Pioneer again. The Fire Festival of Pioneer in that. So habit change. It's had to be changed. So um, I'm going to, I think I'll stop now and hand over to Sean. And then we can start a kind of a wrong robbing of on all this stuff to be brought up. You want to take over, Sean? Hi, yes. Good morning, or rather good afternoon, because it's past 12 already. Um, I, I have been listening to each and every one, and um, I've noticed that we've all touched on the cultural aspects of greening, or at least we all seem to echo the sentiments of greening our festival being related to a behavioral change or a cultural change. Now, a very interesting term or phrase comes to mind when we, when we have discussions such as these, which is um, culture eats policy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah? And I think I, I see Denise is smiling from ear to ear, and Anne Marie looks like he has suffered this before. And that cannot be further from the truth, because right now, in not just Trinidad and Tobago, but regionally, this has been a challenge that we all grapple with. The culture and the cultural implications and aspects, eating all of the nice policies that we've we've come up with. Jerry had a very interesting um, discourse earlier when he spoke about um, how do we find an innovative way to incorporate our behavioral patterns into everyday practices that are sustainable. So I, I want to just open the floor before I continue for comment on that. Culture eats policy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner because I know we're supposed to be a lot more interactive and I want to engage with this panel um, on your thoughts where that is concerned. And particularly in the Trinidad and Tobago context, I will comment a bit later on the Tobago context, but in Trinidad and Tobago, generally in your experience, how do you see that term as being more or less very, very instrumental in how we go forward in greening not just festivals, but our everyday lives and activity. Denisa, you want to 
Jerry, I think there's some difficulties. I'm seeing the enthusiasm on your face, but I'm not hearing the audio. So, Denisa, could you just um, comment in the meanwhile while Jerry gets that sorted? Well, I don't know if I could think of a festival example, but growing up in Rio Claro and um, also having family in Mondiablo in Pinal, collecting rainwater was a normal thing. You had to do it because you did not have pipe borne water. And I only learned a few years ago that you're supposed to get a permit from Water Resources Agency in order to collect rainwater. You know, so there is policy in place to sort of manage how we use our resources. But in communities where you do not have access to pipe borne water, the culture is that you collect in those same steel drums that I would have mentioned, you collect in, in, in other barrels. Um, and so that is the culture. Right, so you see in some cases, while culture eats policy for dinner, breakfast, lunch, whatever the case may be, whichever meal or snack we wish, we wish to make reference to, there are cultural practices that have been more or less sustainable and they've been passed on from generation to generation. So my point is in this instance, that sustainability is not foreign or it's not alien to us as a civilization, to us as a society, and to us as Caribbean people. Sustainability through cultural um, practices and things that were passed down have actually been part and parcel of what we do. So now it's just a matter of bringing to bear or bringing to the forefront those sustainable practices that are already familiar to us so that's one aspect of it and marie you spoke about your experience with the new fire festival and um how it is you saw a marked change in everybody's lives um that contributed to making the new fire festival happen so Amri, tell us a little about your experience in how those very simple but yet important cultural practices that were passed down played a role in the discussions in planning for the Fire Festival as a green or environmentally conscious festival. Um, okay, well, that's a good question because um, I grew up in the suburbs in Northwest Trinidad. <laughs> a decidedly different environment that, than Rio Claro and, and Denise's are bringing. Um, I didn't know anybody who collected rainwater except a hands, well, one or two who were doing gardening. Right. And, uh, and I only heard about them, uh, that wasn't as a child. So growing up, I did not see anybody collecting rainwater. I did, however, see people, uh, we won't produce much waste back in the 60s and the 70s because uh, plastic had not yet proliferated the, the marketplace as a way to um, package produce and products. Um, people were still using pretty much uh, glass bottles. Uh, the imported stuff, um, particularly um, imported um, personal care items and so on, those were in plastic. That really became more obvious in the 70s, uh, later 70s. Um, and the people who were involved with the fire festival planning came from a myriad of backgrounds, myriad of backgrounds. But, and generally speaking, they were much younger than me. <laughs> and so uh, they were in a, the generation that had not seen, they hadn't seen the, their grandparents do what I'd seen my grandparents do. And my parents. Uh, uh, um, so what you were referring to, I uh, it was a generation removed, and they were more or less in, in born during the consumer culture, as uh, Jerry mentioned. And so to see those youngsters who were genuine about, about taking on the zero challenge themselves, were able to see exactly where the challenges were in their attempt to move ahead and, and try not to produce waste on a, on a, week, a daily and weekly basis. 
the people who were involved in the little challenges that we set ourselves uh, on social media just to promote the festival, uh, Jerry and Pat for this, to have a, um, a competition and, and post post what you did to, to, to avoid producing waste. And people would post that they're taking their containers to the vendor to you know, buy food that they usually buy in a, another kind of container, but they take a container from the house to go and buy their whatever, and they would post their pictures, and that was part of the promotion. But the people who are genuinely challenging themselves and pushing themselves to change that behavior um, said to me, hey, this is not that easy. It's changing habits long. And, and you think a habit is something that you do unconsciously. You do it for so long that you don't have to think about it. So if you are undoing a habit, that's, that's hard work. That's a that's an intentional action, and so this is yeah. what I saw: people who were willing to undertake the intentional change of a habit were able to see results, but also understand the challenges. And so, in understanding the challenges, they were able to support the waste management process at the festival because they knew: okay, people need signs, people need some guidance, people need to know what to do. And, and, and why they're doing it as well. Uh, when Jerry talked about it, why, they, why we have to do it. But, and then the how to do it at the festival. And then people went away saying, okay, I, could, I, I did this over a weekend and I was camping. I could certainly do this as well. And I right, work, so and I really just, to, just to interject yeah. and add to what you're saying, um, you yeah. mentioned in yeah. <laughs> I am so happy that, that you brought up the fact that we are now using modern um, means and um, mediums of communication to get the messaging out. Now, I want to take that and bring it into education. And how is it partnerships and education can be made as playing a pivotal role, made to play a pivotal role rather in how it is we green our spaces, green our festivals, green our events. Do you think partnerships are very important? I'll make reference to SDG 17, Sustainable Development Goal 17, which is sustainable partnerships. So in order to sustain yeah. ourselves as human beings and yeah. as a society, right, Jerry is saying something. Right. So um, so it seems that I'm back on, my audio is back on. Um, I guess the universe thought that I spoke for too long at the beginning, so it kind of just kind of shut me out for a little bit. But since I'm back on, let me say what I want to, um, there was something I wanted to, to before I answer um, that question, um, or before any of us um, begin to tackle that question. And Marie, what, I'm sorry, what I wanted to mention is that it's important for us to remember that um, when we talk about historically our grandparents, et cetera, and our parents, um, you know, being green in their practice, you know, in their daily lives, we have to remember that that was, being, that was in an organic way in that the products that are available now, and, and Marie touched on that, weren't, weren't available then, right? Um, the plastics, right? The kind of disposable plastics that... Um, that we utilize so ubiquitously in everything now. It wasn't available then. So they were practicing that in an organic way because it just wasn't available. And what has happened is that um, through time and, and becoming so accustomed, getting so accustomed to using um, these items now, that, is a, that has replaced that old practice, right? So it's now a re-engineering. Um, I think um, uh, Denisa must have mentioned that. You know, so re-engineering has to happen. But um, as, you, as you mentioned, um, education, right, um, and partnerships, partnerships, you know, what I'm thinking about is the role that um, corporate entities have to play in that partnership discussion because um, for events to incorporate sustainable um, practices or environmentally responsible practices, um, we all know that events rely a lot on, on, on corporate partnerships, right? Yes, um, of course. Um, I want to ask a question. What role do... Okay, here's the, the point I'm trying to make is that um, traditionally, the majority, the vast majority of, our, of corporate entities don't really respond to environmental um, 
issues. Um, they don't really support, um, you know, uh, organizations and events that are, that, are, that are, and I'm talking from my own experience here, you know, that are really with New Fire Festival that is, um, that are pushing that agenda. So what role would you say in that whole partnerships thing and how can we educate using, you know, um, the corporate sector to start to support the thrust by events to become more sustainable? Who would want to, Denise, you want to take on that? Well, I think, as I mentioned, it's important to be familiar with the language of your stakeholder. Um, I said that, you know, the dollars and cents need to make sense <laughs> for them to really decide to increase expenditure on, on these things. Um, there's a new approach that I... Corporate social responsibility, though. You know, corporate social responsibility isn't supposed to be about making uh monetary sense you know it's not about things making um making sense in that kind of way corporate social responsibility is supposed to be an issue that that the, that the corporate sector um you know businesses find as uh worthwhile to kind of support and support it i think that a, that's a very idealistic sentiment Jerry. <laughs> 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 you know if you're running a business uh you know, most of our conventional businesses are about profit. And one of the things that I've been grappling with is how do we rebuild a new system while still operating within the system? The reality of this system is that most of the companies we go to are not going to spend beyond um, their means, what they consider their means. And so I can't answer that question because I haven't been able to do it, but we have to be able to communicate how this makes sense for them. Um, and one of the things that I have also been kind of toying with recently is the idea that the money that you give for these things is not a lie, is not a favor, is not kindness. It is to repair damage that institutions capitalist institutions have done to this earth. So while I may not be attacking individual organizations, I'm attacking a culture that has placed us in this situation. And so for me, festivals provide an opportunity to correct this. And so when a corporate sponsor gives money, it is reparation, so it is an aid of repair of the damage that is done. But, I, but we I, also have to be, we have to be careful you know, of that thing called greenwashing, yeah? That, right. Um, yeah. Jerry, so to, to that, 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 that um, point, I think so pretty and I'm not going to... Uh, so, sorry, Sean. I was just going to say, I don't think corporate TNT need... They need to see the connection between their damage and the environmental issue and the impact on their fine. It has to be direct. It has to be, they have to see a direct connection between their, themselves and the damage that has been done by their activities or in analysis in capitalist activities. Um, we're dying, we're dying from, you know, a disease, hypertension, diabetes, and cancer. I like to call those the big four that are killing us, right? And that is what the Ministry of Health recognized early o'clock, and that's why they were so on the, on the ball in 2020. Because why? Because they have relatives, and, and, and because they knew that they were vulnerable, and they have relatives who, who sick, just like we all have relatives who are afflicted with those I learned, them, I learned them word during the um, pandemic, comorbidities, right? I didn't, I didn't know that word before. Um, but those lifestyle illnesses that, uh, that are making the population vulnerable to the effects of that uh, virus, of the pandemic, the COVID-19. And they need to snuggle like a connection between what they do and, what, and, and the fact that those people are vulnerable because of what they've done. Can they see right. the connection? I don't know. Yeah, and, and I absolutely agree with you, Henri. Um, 
what I what I'm also thinking a workable approach to these corporate entities when you're citing corporate social responsibility would be this a very simple bit of language that more or less invokes some sort of action on their part okay so we all live in this world we occupy this space together for whatever reason there won't they be for profit for capitalism for whatever the case may be if the earth is completely destroyed not usable you can't extract anything from it you can't do anything you can't function there's no air to breathe there's no water there's no trees um this is the most basic or layman's approach you can give all right if the earth as we know it ceased to exist in the workable form that it, it, it currently stands as then how are you as a corporate entity going to continue how are you as a corporate entity going to sustain yourself so without people without the natural environment and without money as the case may be you have nothing so your approach should be to remind them that it is not only beneficial to the natural environment and saving the planet, as we all, you know, kumbaya, we have um, this kumbaya approach at times, but it's a very, very raw and factual sort of basis you have to approach these people on, right? And outside of that, which comes to the more diplomatic approach, um, you have something called sustainable partnerships. Now, civil society, public sector, and private sector have a duty and responsibility on in all their individual quarters to work together because that is the only way we can progress. You find civil society groups, not-for-profit organizations, NGOs such as my organization, Environment Tobago, Jerry, New Fire as well, Denisa, yours as well. They're, they're, we are not-for-profit or non-government organizations and you find that our objectives are to add value to those that are around us if you show that corporate social responsibility does not just rest primarily on your grant or give me a piece of money to do a festival or let's have some sort of contribution to a festival it also rests on being your brother's keeper it may sound like a very, very far-fetched biblical sort of terminology or something even partially religious, which it's not. But planet Earth, planet Earth and the environment, the natural environment relies on us. And if each sector can come forward and recognize how important their role is, it goes a long way. So reminding the, the civil society sector partners, the corporate partners and the public sector partners, which is on a govern governance level, of course, if we remind them how important they are in, in, in getting to the objectives, and in this case, which is to green our operations, green our festivals, and green our cultural output, you will find that your life is made a lot easier. Yes, there are challenges. Yes, there are developmental um, things that we, we, we come in. As, as gaps and hurdles to get over and so on. But um, it is doable. It is doable. You just, as Denisa rightly put it, understanding the stakeholder that you're speaking to, understanding what language resonates with them. And I think once we tailor our messaging and the language, which again comes back to education, so on each level and each um, spectrum or sector of our, our society um we can now tailor the language or the messaging to meet you know that entity on a level that they find relatable yeah what do you think about that Anne marie i see you 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 might have a comment on that well the the, the, the fact is that the, the planet doesn't need the human beings the planet doesn't need the human beings to, 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 to regenerate itself. We need the planet for the very breath we breathe. 
There's nothing else producing oxygen for us to breathe in. You know that? Do they know that? Do people know that? So long before the planet um, it becomes non-functioning as a planet, uh, at least in the way we know it, we would have long gone away. We would not be able to survive. We'd be dead, 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 as we say. <laughs> you can't be dead three times. Dead is dead, dead, dead. That you will be gone. So humans, it's humankind. You are looking after humankind when you look after the environment. You are providing yourself with oxygen. You are providing yourself with nutrients and food and water. We need that to live. That's the very basics of our life is required, is, is fulfilled by the plants on this planet and the plant, the rest of the planet, everything that is natural and natural, we need it to survive. End of story. That's it's very simple. That's it. Nothing complicated. So, so, so basically, we are facing uh, a kind of um, catch-22 situation, if this is one, where um, we're saying on one hand that, um, you know, in order for event organizers to be able to make their events more to get buy-in from event organizers, they would have to see the monetary value, right? So to speak, or it has to make dollars and cents to them, right? Um, but we know that traditionally events are supported by corporate entities. That's how any event person is going to tell you that's how they make most of their money, it's through corporate sponsorship. But if the corporate, <laughs> corporate entities don't buy into that concept, they're supporting that, then they don't get the funds, but we need the events to themselves to also be the channels through which the public is educated on the importance of, of, of the um, environmental uh, issues. So we have a, a difficult situation there. Um, but let us not focus on that at the moment. Let's use the next few minutes to kind of discuss, um, touch on how, what are, the, what are the beginning things, beginning steps that events that you think for both um, Anne-Marie, I think Anne-Marie, in fact, all three of you can probably speak on this because um, Chris, you could also talk about your own experience with um, um, Friendship Festival. But um, I want to ask, um, I'll, I'll ask Denise first, what, is, what are the first things that you think um, event organizers, organizers can incorporate that wouldn't cost them anything? You know, um, that wouldn't cause them anything. It's, it's just simple things that they can start implementing um, to make their festivals, their events more responsible. Well, one thing I would say is don't hang your hat where your hand can reach. And right. the, the issue of greeting a festival or an event can seem like a mammoth task. But when I shared earlier, you know, I would have spoken about using Sahari leaves as plates and, and different things. And I think it's important to tap into the indigenous knowledge and be guided by that and to, to improve on that. So there are existing examples of how we can be more, um, I would say, eco-sensitive in the way we execute festivals and events. So partnering, I think, with people who have done the same is important. I think having all stakeholders have that mutual exchange is important because we all have expertise in different areas. And environmental organizations and organizations like my own global villages, I think we really need to task ourselves with the responsibility of sharing the information with artists, with decorators, with event planners, because as I said, they, they don't do because they simply don't know. You know, so I think you start small and collaborate with organizations that know how to do it. The TT Bridge Initiative has the experience, Global Villages has the experience, Friendship Festival. So we need to make ourselves more available to organizers to be able to guide them. And not in a way, as I said, that is imposing, but simply presenting alternatives for consideration. Right. And Anne-Marie being one of the persons who have been uh, very important in, you know, driving new fires, um, uh, how to say, the, the practices that we have developed. Anne-Marie, you, can you talk about some of the practices that you would say event organizers can incorporate? It doesn't cost any money. We can get going. 
on coming grief? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, maybe just to take a page out of the book of uh, a new fire festival and try some of the things that that that, that they saw you your we do. So what what we did, um, um, developing a, a relationship with the vendors who you invite to your to to your event and coming up with a way for um, for the food service to be um, less waste generating. Um, coming up with, with um, again, it starts with the messaging of the event. So you might want to encourage the patrons to come with um, reusable containers and that kind of thing and something to put drinks in. And then and then really with the vendors about, hey, making this, let's make this possible. Don't be the, don't use your styrofoam cups. Let's, let's, let's have the patron present you with their cup to buy whatever it is, ice cream, soup, you know, whatever, smoothies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are a number of ways to, to you know, intervene in the, waste, in the waste generation of a festival. And I think that's the easiest place that people could stick themselves in to really effect a big change, a noticeable change in what is generated at any kind of large event. Uh, is that has a lot of people and there's food and drink being sold and a lot of exchange of merchandise. So there's going to be waste. Let's see for how we can reduce that by making an intervention in the packaging of that stuff. That's just one. And I mean, once you're going there, there are other ways it will present itself. In the yeah. interest so, of sorry, anybody else yeah. for that? That All right. Easiest to intervene. Sorry, one more time. Yes. <laughs> um, what I would like to add to that is um, here in Tobago, um, the, the natural environment, as it were, is a little more integrated into the way festivals, cultural occasions, cultural events are executed. Um, I think a very important um pillar of the way the friendship festival developed and started in the first instance was through an appreciation for the natural environment so having said that i know um we are wrapping up so to speak um this session i know that the natural environment plays a very pivotal role in the way we do things here in tobago if that sort of thinking and that sort of um, direction in the planning and development of festivals and cultural events in Trinidad can occur, you would see a completely different um, approach into the way the entire thing comes off. Now, um, because here in Tobago and through the tourism product and downstream, downstream economic activities is relying on the natural environment, you see an added form of importance or added kind of importance placed on that aspect. So I think there should be emphasis placed on the actual natural environment and the, the things therein and the products that come out of the natural environment. If that approach is taken, in my opinion, and based on experience, um, we can actually make some noteworthy pro progress in greening festivals and cultural outputs. Right. You know, what I want to say is that um, we have to bear in mind and, and that what we are doing here is, is pretty much pioneering. You know, um, the, we haven't been, we haven't had to, had to um, make events green before. So the work that we have all been um, uh, doing, you know, has been pioneering work um in in this space you know in this region and um and i think it was Anne -Marie, Anne marie who rightly said and, and sean spoke about um you, know, you all spoke about about partnerships about um entities seeking out those who have been pioneering who have been developing some local expertise so to speak some some level of, of practice um so that they can um help to guide Maybe it might be that in the early in, in, in the early stage um, or, or, or um, sorry 
event event um, organizers can reach out to us, um, any of us here, you know, and um, contract us, you know, to help to shape the greening sort of um, direction and all of that. Um, so yes, rightly, I think that um, reaching out to those entities that have been pioneering in in this work to assist in in, in developing um, the plans, you know, for events um, becoming more environmentally responsible. Um, there was one point I really I really liked and I wanted to em em really emphasize. Right, um, it was Denisa. You said you know you you mentioned it first. How important it is that we that event organizers get on board with this or or introduce I should say um, the intention all right, to to make their event more environmentally responsible very early on so that there is enough time to get the important things like um, Anne Marie um, stressed on the messaging right which is key to making um, it's successful to having success in making it, the event more green is getting the messaging there um, out very early. So those those two points that you both of you raised, um, they go where they go well with each other. In that the only way you could get the messaging in, you know, if you get the messaging um, in time and, and and get it into the minds of the um, patrons is to start early, so start very early and also give yourself time to work your, the, the plans um, that might um, be developed to Green the Festival. Um, we have very limited time left. Any closing remarks from each of you? Denise, you go first. I'm seeing you on top of the screen. Well, we don't have time left, but I would just like to thank you all for engaging in this conversation with me. Um, um, really sparking some new ideas in my mind. And I just want to reiterate that we can make ourselves available for those who wish to green their festivals or even small things. So, yeah, we welcome that kind of collaboration. Sean, you next. Okay, thank you for having us. And we um, look forward to continuing discussions such as these. I think it's very useful. And it serves to inspire some kind of confidence in our ability as a country and as a nation to go forward with initiatives such as these. Anne Marie, yeah, and I'll just close. thank you. I'll just close by saying um, it is entirely doable. Um, habits and uh, and greening festivals. It's entirely doable. That's yeah. That's my closing. You know, um, this was my first experience um, moderating um, a panel, and um, it's such a massive subject to really um, begin to 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 really contemplate and discuss, right? Um, and I, I don't think that even the hour and a half. Uh, given that uh, we had some technical difficulties and started a bit late, um, is, it will never be anywhere close to being enough time um, to even begin to scratch the surface of how important it is that um, we transform, um, you know, behaviors, um, transform our culture towards becoming more um, environmentally responsible, more sustainable. Um, so I'm, I would, I would. Um, like to suggest that maybe outside of this, and I want to thank um, you, Lakiti, absolutely for giving us this space to discuss this. It's very important, and we, we really appreciative of this being included um, in in this um, reverb experience. Um, but I want to suggest that maybe we can even begin our own um, series of discussion where we invite people to learn further from us. Yeah. So thank you guys, thank you my fellow, fellow panelists. Sean has left, thank you so much. Um, it was wonderful and we're gonna continue this work. So thank you, um, Music TT. I don't know how this ends. Spotlight.
Spotlight is an artist portfolio development program where Music CT provides skills for artists specific to their individual needs over a period of nine months to one year. These training sessions include stage performance skills, vocal training, and helps us to identify those artists who are ready to take their talents internationally. Music TT conducts auditions every year, so to be in the know, go visit their website and follow all their social media platforms right now. Summer Spotlight artists have been cast in international productions like The Lion King in London and Summer on Tour in Italy, Bali, Singapore and Canada. Some have even been nominated and received awards at various local award events. Spotlight is open to all genres, however, Music TT is making special links with international agencies, producers, and industry executives that has a special interest in artists and music with Caribbean flavors. It is recommended that those who apply have moderate to significant performance experience and are actively creating a catalog of music. Hey, this is Ruel Lynch, and as a music producer, I am always listening out for the latest inspiration for my beats and information on the music business. That is why I am sharing all the information about the Trinidad and Tobago International Standard Recording Code, TTISRC. It is a code that will improve our local industry because it will measure, track, and index sound recordings from our country. Plus. This code is required by digital distribution companies to sell our music online. So for me, any track I'm producing for my artist will have this unique code. Join the movement with me and get the international standard recording code for all your new releases. Music TT Export Academy is an initiative geared towards music business education and capacity building through workshops, conferences, and webinars. Music TT partners with stakeholders in the local music industry to host conferences annually. You want to win a gold medal and you started training last week. It doesn't happen so. So why disrespect this industry by trying to do the same thing? It does not work. It will never, ever work. As Music TT seeks to build capacity in the music industry, topics are determined by current trends that can have an impact on revenue generation, as well as highlighting opportunities that have export potential. What I got out of it, I got a lot of clarity in terms of understanding how um, the differences of exploitation, because we hear the word and we're afraid when we hear exploiting the music. And so I was able to understand how the positive sides of exploitation of music really works for you as a songwriter, as an artist. Reverb is Music TT's webinar series where veterans of the music industry share their knowledge and experience. It's streamed live on the last Thursday of every month and a replay of the webinar is posted on our YouTube page. Be sure to subscribe to be notified. It's Rome, and um, I just want to say that I appreciate what Music TT is doing in terms of the different ventures that they are putting in place to try and help promote the music industry as a whole. Oh, Music TT, yeah. I must say, um, from the live music district straight to the Spotlight program has been yeah. amazing to me. I have done lots of performances. I have grown throughout those performances as well as the Spotlight program. It has made me an all-rounder when it comes to being an artist. I want to say thank you to Music TT for giving me the opportunity to, to showcase my talent. This has been uh, an amazing, an amazing opportunity. I would like to commend Music TT on all the work they've been doing on artist development and artist awareness, getting them ready and kind of creating a platform for a lot of the younger artists to kind of get themselves into the space and get them to people like me which is fantastic.
stop forever forward. I'm Tanila Moore and I'm a singer-songwriter from Trinidad, but I have been living all over the world and I'm currently living in the States, which I'm sure you can tell from my accent. My music is a mix between pop, reggae, and hip-hop. I sing and I rap. And last year I put together a proposal to Music TT for support in the work that I'm doing and was successful in receiving support from them. I'm extremely grateful for that because I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing without that. I would encourage anyone who's thinking about putting together a proposal for Music TT to do it. I think that Trinidad has some of the most talented artists that I've ever met and I've worked with people from all around the world including Shaggy, Mr. Vegas, Bungie Garland from our very own Trinidad and Tobago, John Legend, Pixie Lott, the Black Eyed Peas crew, Michael Franti's team. I'm working right now with some of the producers that work with Chance the Rapper. The progress that I've been making has been incredible. I am currently actually in Las Vegas because I'm working with Erica Badu's management team now. And I've been in LA for the past month I am working with a bunch of producers here. I've been working with Trini producers as well. The most recent was track seven. We did a song together and also I did a song with Kayla Part. I've been doing a lot. I have a song called I Am A Girl that was picked up by the United Nations as their anthem for International Women's Day. In LA, I'm working with some of the people at The Record Plant, one of the best studios in LA to do a relaunch of the song I Am A Girl that will be released later this year with some massive features on the song. With the help of Music TT, I put out two videos. One of them was called Bad Name, which speaks about the importance of consent and is in support of the Me Too movement and Time's Up. So obviously very relevant to what's happening in the world today around gender equality and female empowerment. And then I put out another song called The Grace, and that song features some voices from women in Tanzania because I have an organization in Tanzania called EPIC, where we drill clean water wells and do community growth and development. So on The Grace, I sampled some of the women's voices from Tanzania and used them on that song as well. The video for The Grace was shot and edited entirely with the support of Music TT. Same thing for Bad Name. I think that it's so important that the government continues to support the work of our incredible artists. Truthfully, the talent in Trinidad is some of the best that I've seen. So thank you to all the team at Music TT for supporting what I'm doing and supporting me in this current project. Looking forward to working with you all some more. I have a lot of things in the works some of which I can't even talk about yet, but I'm very excited about. I'm going to continue doing everything in my power to represent Trinidad in the best possible way. Support Music TT, they're doing great things. Red, white, and black all the way. Oh my God, it's been such a pleasure being a part of the third cohort of this Music TT Spotlight program. We learned so much. We learned so much in this program about branding, about marketing, about photography, you know, your image and marketing yourself out there. In this cohort, I got to do a single. Y'all, that was the best experience working with Daryl, one of the best songwriters in Trinidad. I couldn't have asked for anything better. I was really, really excited to work on my new single with the team provided by Music TT. Thank you. I was able to not just sing my heart out, but show off some of my writing skills as well as learn how to improve on it. And I'm really happy with the music that we were able to create. truly learned so much from Music TT Spotlight program. This professional advice, guidance, knowledge. If you want to get that edge in your creativity as an artist, I will highly recommend you be a part of this program. I really recommend the Spotlight program because it's a good camp for artists. It's just all about developing you as an artist no matter how far along you are, no matter where you want to go with it. It's something I would recommend to anybody. Hey, what's up everybody? This is Daryl Zerbe, and I am here to fully endorse the TTISROC codes. For 
any single person that I'm working with. Um, for those that don't know, I am a songwriter and producer. And I love the fact that we now have these because it's a perfect way for us to track our music. It's a perfect way for us to start laying a claim into the world of music coming from our twin island republic. Hi guys, I'm Aaron Eiffel from the Spotlight Program and I support the TTISRC because it helps foreigners, locals, Caribbean people identify Trinidad and Tobago's music. So this album that we release, you all could find it streaming on all, all online platforms and you will be able to identify that as well. So yes, I support them, check out the album and yeah. Spotlight is an artist portfolio development program where Music CC provides skills for artists specific to their individual needs over a period of nine months to one year. These training sessions include stage performance skills, vocal training, and helps us to identify those artists who are ready to take their talents internationally. Music TT conducts auditions every year, so to be in the know, go visit their website and follow all their social media platforms right now. Some Spotlight artists have been cast in international productions like The Lion King in London and some are on tour in Italy, Bali, Singapore and Canada. Some have even been nominated and received awards at various local award events. Spotlight is open to all genres, however, Music TT is making special links with international agencies, producers, and industry executives that has a special interest in artists and music with Caribbean flavors. It is recommended that those who apply have moderate to significant performance experience and are actively creating a catalog of music. Hi, hi, hi. Good afternoon, folks. Two panels down, one keynote down. This is the last day. This is the last panel of the evening. And then we head across to the networking session. And of course, the music showcase to end with a bang. So thank you for joining us again this afternoon. And right now we have up next businesses and live music integration brought to you by Sound Diplomacy. So I'm just going to disappear from the screen and let them come right on in. <laughs> Hello. Can you hear me well? Well, first off, Melissa, thank you very much for having us over. Um, this is what we're passionate about. This is something we love. Anything that pushes towards the visibilization of the importance of music and not only for all of us as human beings, but in a systematic way and what we could do um, towards visualizing it a little bit better and implement ways to make this more of a decent living for everyone who's already doing it and for generations to come. Um, so first off, I, well, I'm waiting to see if Kate is going to show up, but if not, I can moderate, no problem. Um, I want to thank um, David and I want to thank Nigel for being here with us. Um, I'm very interested on understanding based on the panelist experience, what are some of the benefits of live music to the business and for themselves? And also um, what, well, hopefully we'll learn about the different um, models all of us are gonna talk about. Cause aside from sound diplomacy, I'm also the cultural curator for an entertainment district in Costa Rica. And we have been formulating different ways to get the artists to work, to create communal funds, try to get the government involved, 
but also come up with systems that allow us to keep going regardless of the governments as well. Um, so we'll talk about ways to promote and cultivate the music scenes wherever we are. Uh, I know David is in, in Orlando and Nigel, where are you, Nigel, right now? I'm right here in Trinidad. You're in Trinidad? Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, without further ado, maybe we could start uh, with Nigel talking a little bit about what has been um, your experience, um, maybe even before the pandemic and during the pandemic and ways you are thinking about moving forward after the pandemic. Because if, although it's like hard, difficult times, I think that it also gives us an opportunity to come up with systems that, that can very well off stay after the pandemic. And uh, in many ways, this has been a shock to push a lot of the efforts that some of us had been doing before uh, COVID that were not as visible before as they are now. Um, so maybe we can move on with Nigel and then David, and then I can talk a little bit about my own experience and hopefully we'll develop a very interesting conversation from that. Not a problem. Can you hear me? Yes. Am I out of focus? Okay. Um, okay. Well, Part of my bio, in, in addition to writing and podcasting about the music industry here in Trinidad and Tobago, I'm also a promoter. I promote a festival called Jazz Artists and the Greens. We, we were supposed to have our 18th edition in 2020, and the lockdown happened literally a week before the event happened. But the company has been around for quite some time, and we, additionally, we, we put on events. We had this particular series called Songbirds Live, where we engage with female singers, and we basically went to a restaurant and a kind of a slow weekday, slow day of the week, which was a Wednesday. And we would have a performance, a concert performance and thing. So that I, I understand the live music industry and I'm part of it, right? As in addition to writing about it. Certainly the pandemic for 2020 and certainly into 2021, because we had to cancel, the, um, all events were canceled, as you know, in 2021 also. The, the idea of pivoting our live music industry became a kind of talking point and certainly Music TT were offering solutions as well as, you know, trying to help invest um, with stakeholders to kind of pivot towards the live stream or the hybrid systems as we have here. Um, we also have a situation where we also have some of our artists, you know, really, truly really kind of frustrated. And when the opportunity arose for them to travel to Miami for carnivals, they've already gone, as well as opportunities to perform on cruise ships. So, the pandemic has really suppressed the industry. And in addition to mandatory closure of outdoor events and that kind of thing, it's just frustrated a lot of artists. Um, as a promoter, I am aware that I have to work with musicians who've been basically out of work effectively for 18 months. And we've been trying our best to get them on board and try to motivate them to come back on the scene. The economy has kind of slowed down at the same time. So audiences have, uh, a biting at the, uh, what's, the, what's the phrase they say? The nipping at the, at the, the, the whatever that phrase is, where they, they're really and truly eager to get back out to the live music scene. We have to see um, slowly but surely get back up one step at a time, one step at a time. Um, one of the things that Trinidad and Tobago has done within the last few years, of course, via some diplomacy actually, was create what we call a live music district because Port of Spain for years, for decades, has always been a kind of very active and sexy place to be within the English-speaking Caribbean. And the Live Music District focused on putting artists and live musicians within clubs, bars, whatever, on a particular stretch within the Port of Spain area. And it was it started as a pilot project in 2018. I think just after our carnival in March, it started. And it's gone through a couple of iterations. And then, of course, with the pandemic has been stopped. But the potential to restart that is there. We recently, I think in 2019, the UNESCO cited Port of Spain as a cultural city, UNESCO city of music in the world. I think there are about 47 cities, and we are one of four in the Caribbean. There's Cuba, Jamaica, and DR. They also have a music city, Santa Domingo, Havana, Kingston. So that we in Trinidad and Tobago certainly have an opportunity to revitalize our music scene. Um, with all this downtime, I can certainly speak for myself, we have been doing the work of planning because we, although we can't do anything at this point in time, we just have to plan, plan, plan. 
our budget is going to be read on next week, Monday, actually, to, and hopefully there'll be some kind of offerings in terms of financial support for the industry. And on October the 11th, Monday following, we're going to have some easing of restrictions for bars and limited um, indoor spaces and that kind of thing. So there is a light on the horizon. But as it stands right now, it's been very, very difficult for the last year. But we've been trying to work our way to understand how best we can integrate music back into the scene because part of our trend art culture is what we call the liming culture we know how to have a good time and live music is sometimes part of it of course music drink and food is the big thing but music is going to take its place once again it's going to be slow but i'm sure it's going to get there sooner or later that's about it that's great how, how are the government regulations right now regarding the activities you can do and cannot do and like here for example we're closing we have to close the the venues and the bars at 9 p.m and all the venues are we cannot go above 25 percent capacity which is of course it, it changes everything uh, again it breeds opportunity but I, i'm just curious as of what's the situation with that currently um in trinidad we had um at the beginning of when the pandemic started of course there were mandatory lockdowns and closures of indoor spaces and then there was a kind of easing because the the, the numbers had dropped to a point that were manageable for our healthcare system but sometime about just after april of this year there, there was a spike in cases and as a consequence of that there was a mandatory shutdown we actually had curfews in place here so all indoor spaces are closed Certainly all outdoor events were all closed. And that curfew, which is legally only supposed to last 90 days, has been extended. So that um, although we have a curfew that it started at 9 o'clock, it's just moved to 10 o'clock within the last week. From 10 p.m. to 5 a.m., we have curfews and um, limited spaces. Indoor spaces, I think from next week, not next week, October the 11th, I believe they're going to be allowing spaces up to about 50% occupancy. Um, which as a promoter, as a, as a venue operator, it, it, it's economically you know, kind of middle ground. It's not a perfect situation. Because the other thing that happens in Port of Spain, we have, we have a lot of bars and clubs, but places that are almost purpose built for live music, like a club with a stage and a sound system, there aren't that many in Port of Spain. There's a famous one, I could call its name Cafe Blue. It used to be called Kaiso Blues Cafe in Port of Spain, not too far from the hotels. And that has been the premier live entertainment space, but he hasn't been able to open since, as I said, before April. And it's, it's very difficult, but we have had mandatory lockdowns, of course, social distancing. We have that thing. We now have a proper vaccine rollout. Vaccine availability is here. We have a lot of vaccine hesitation, as I see seemingly globally. But um, I think before the end of the year, we should have some sense of an uptick in our live music industry here at Trinidad and Tobago. Great. Uh, just to kind of sum up, uh, you talked about creating the live music district, the situation where artists are leaving Trinidad. That I find that uh, interesting. Then um, it's, it's real. The Santo Domingo being a music city, um, ten, you're closing. Uh, at you know, no, it's from 10 to 5 p.m. and the next week you start with 50% capacity, right? Correct. Correct. Stuff. Yes. Correct. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Uh, David, welcome. Um, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, thank you. And can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you've been doing? Uh, and then, of course, um, not. I mean, I guess it's it's. Uh, well, no, actually, just tell us how how it has changed, maybe in general. Uh, kind of be being very general how it's changed and then maybe we can get more specific on what you've done about it and and how how's the uh, the current state right now one year almost two years i mean two yeah i guess almost two years into the pandemic and what do you see going into the future um and then uh, i'll just keep going with what we're doing and we can start matching dots and stealing ideas from each other <laughs> Sounds good, sounds good. So uh, my name is David Burrell. I represent uh, downtown Orlando to that extent uh, here in the United States, Florida specifically. 
we have had a focus on, uh, well, Orlando in and of itself um, has somewhat of a history of music in, in, the, in the United States anyway, to that extent, uh, and have had a lot of success stories come out of our community. Uh, so it's something that we have uh, attempted to embrace, uh, sometimes better than others, um, 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 throughout our ongoing evolution. Um, you know, back, I want to say about 10 years ago, um, uh, I, I represent a government entity to that extent, a, a decision was made to really heavily invest in our performing arts, uh, 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 inclusive of music, and really create the opportunity for those to thrive uh, by giving them the resources they need. Uh, and what that ultimately entailed uh, uh, at that time uh, was was building several large uh, venues uh, in order to, to host both A-list artists, but also local artists and having all different types of those components. How that, I guess, kind of comports to, to what we're talking about today is one of those venues to, to that extent um, is known here locally as Dr. Phillips Center for Performing Arts. It's a, it's a beautiful venue. Um, it has three different stages in it. Some cater to large events, some cater to just 300 guests uh, to, to that extent, others well over uh, um, 2000. With that being said, um, when the pandemic ultimately, you know, hit us and specifically this venue, uh, we really had to think about, okay, you know, not only did we have all these um, shows scheduled uh, uh, to that extent and similar to sounds like that you all are going through in, in Trinidad, um, you know, we were shut down. All of our nightlife establishments, just even bars uh, outdoor as well, uh, were all completely shut down. Those were the first things to be shut down under the context that when you're socializing, you're you're you're, you're probably not um, you know distancing yourself enough from the challenges of the pandemic. So we tried to work with them. Uh, when I say them, uh, the the uh, the venue to figure out when the time is right. And I don't think any of us really imagined we'd still be where we are today at that point in time. This has has been a learning process, I think, for for all of us. But uh, how do we? Uh, seek some opportunity to that extent through this dark time. Uh, so uh, what we sought to do was really create a safe environment or a safe environment as possible to continue to host events. Um, and, and what that landed on uh, was uh, what we kind of referred to as a pod system. So uh, we were lucky um, in with the venue that I was just speaking of to have a very large gathering lawn, um, it was actually three different parcels of land so in lieu of doing shows inside, uh, um, we built stages outside, had them constructed, and then built um, raised pods uh, um, and separated themselves so that people, people could come and purchase tickets. And it was also free events, you know, just for the community to participate in. Um, and each pod held five people. So it, it was a, with no pun intended, it was a breath of fresh air. Um, we saw a significant amount of demand because <laughs> I think as, Nigel, you were pointing to uh, there were so many people that had been cooped up for so long and, and have a desire uh, to get out, uh, to interact, to take part in in entertainment, right, and be entertained, and 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 it's such a big part of people's lives, and being, uh, you know, required to to kind of leave all that behind uh, for a long period of time was challenging. So that system has actually evolved with us over time. Um, um, though now it, where we, where I am, we are, our, our nightlife establishments, our, our bars, our clubs, our, our venues are, are all open. We, we're open with no restrictions here. Um, uh, it, that is still thriving. So we've extended that context because it worked so well. Um, and, and, you know, who knows what the future holds, uh, for this out new, you know, makeshift outdoor venue that we've created, but the community really got drawn to it. And that's created a lot of spill off business. As, as I mentioned, a lot of our businesses were, were, were forced to close down. And the music scene, at least for us in downtown and in the entertainment scene, um, is a business driver. It brings people to the district. They ultimately come, they'll, they'll, they'll may stop and have dinner before or, or have a few drinks afterward. And losing that driver, that traffic driver, uh, um, while they were still open because you couldn't really have it anywhere, at least in indoor environments, um, was was you know adding uh, what we call insult to injury after being closed for so long. So 
you know, it was by no means uh, uh, an an easy endeavor, and, and we have by no means worked out all the kinks. But it, but I think you know, just trying to be innovated and and not willing to completely let our entertainment scene go um, with uh, the restrictions that may be uh, did help our businesses and, and helped us, you know, kind of navigate through the world that uh, we're now living in. Great. Yeah, there's definitely there has to be some sort of sense of punkness and like <laughs> figuring out ways on, you know, how to how to sell through this. Uh, I'm interesting. There's a question that pops to mind because you mentioned about um, funds that were directed towards the artists to give them resources. How would you say is the associative situation, meaning that how well articulated is the the music industry itself to have access to those funds? Because like one thing that happens a lot in at least here in Costa Rica, and I don't know if in Trinidad is similar is that there's a huge informality crisis right so when there's certain funds that are meant to be for the artist not all of them have access very and and you know not everyone is registered as they should be so that gives out you know a lot of people complain that the government is not helping but it's like also they don't have the proper data right they really don't know uh who's doing what um and that's one thing that I think every country in Latin America should really tackle. Like here we are creating the Costa Rican Association of, at first it was going to be music forums, uh, hoping to legitimize the venues because we are perceived as just normal bars and restaurants. And, and it's really not the same. It's definitely not the same. Uh, we have a very important role in the creatorship of an industry. Um, and part of it is to not just have access to those funds, but also, you know, like even the states just last year, they created the venue uh, association, right? I think that was in March last year, which is amazing. It's like in the states, that's just happening, right? And it's something, uh, I'm just curious about that. Um, if if you think that it, that it's, it's a healthy situation in Orlando, if it could be better. Uh, and then also, Nigel, if you could expand a little bit and if, if that's something that also happens in Trinidad. Yeah, so... Um, happy to talk about it. So the venue association that kind of recently formed, formed around the challenge that was facing them to that extent. To some degree, they ha didn't have a reason uh, to form previous to that. We had a lot of government restrictions um, and they were drastically impacting, you know, theaters. Um, um, you know, Nigel mentioned facing, you know, no indoor performances. We had the same component. And when you think about referencing what I mentioned before, it was only venues that chose to evolve and cry to create um, um, opportunities, like I mentioned, that were able to offer opportunities at all. And a lot of different venues didn't have that opportunity, right? They didn't have either the resources or they didn't have um, the physical capabilities, the space to create something like that. So as the government was ultimately um, looking at different either uh, assistance funds or vice versa, uh, uh, removing restrictions or placing new ones, um, they had to have that singular voice uh, to, to ultimately go to them and say, here's what our industry is, here's why it's important, and here's how you're affecting us. Um, is, to answer your question, is it, in my opinion, working as good as it can? I, I mean, it's still new, I, I don't think so. I think it's great that it's been formulated. I think that's a hurdle in and of itself to get organized. Um, and, and we'll have to see how that continues to unfold. Spe that's a little bit more of a, a national level for us. Uh, locally, um, you know, we haven't really, to be candid, haven't figured out the right vehicle um, um, to financially support um, artists yet. Uh, what we've tried to do is support events to that extent under the context and, and hope that as we're supporting these events, the vast majority um, are having live entertainment, oftentimes that's music, or the majority of times that's music. So we look to that as an indirect, uh, you know, support as as to, as we are, there's some events that, that we fund, you know, $50,000 or, or what have you, to ultimately draw people back into our area and, and provide those experiences. Um, and that is, I don't think it's a perfect 
you know, system. Uh, uh, um, but it's what we have. What it did allow us to do during COVID is um, uh, we kind of retooled that and tried to make it a little bit more focused uh, on really having the impact um, that we desire it to have, uh, uh, which is giving people the opportunity to, to in enjoy all components of the arts, uh, especially music being one of them. So uh, we're just unrolling that now. Uh, we actually launched a new program, two new programs um, um, for either large scale events or small scale events that, that, that offer opportunities for uh, people to participate. So uh, we're, we're hopeful uh, that, that we got a little bit better this time and we'll continue to keep working on it. Yeah, Santiago, you hit the nail on the head when you said data is kind of limited here. The Carib well, the Caribbean, I could speak for the Caribbean and certainly in Trinidad and Tobago. And the other thing that you spoke about was a kind of grouping, a kind of collective advocate voice. That is a deficiency in the Trinidad and Tobago music industry. We have small collectives of promoters, of engineers, but there's no larger group collective that can have a direct advocate voice that could speak to the government. Um, in, for the music industry, large. We have a Calypso Union Association, but they have been they eff effectively funded by the government. So they kind of independent, a hands off advocacy. Is, I, as an outsider, may be suspect of, of it. That said, however, there, um, there are potential voices now that are looking to put together an advocate voice because some rumbling happened, certainly when the, the pandemic started back in March of last year, 2020. Um, the government's response, of course, was we had to provide relief, relief grants to Trinidad and Tobago is not Orlando. They, they're, there's, they're pockets of poverty. And the, although the, the income is, our GDP is relatively high for the region and certainly for this part of the hemisphere, um, a lot of people were losing money and not have rent and food and that kind of thing. And with some advocacy, the government had set aside about 25 million Trinidad dollars. That's about, about 6 million, sorry, 4 million US dollars for relief grants, right? A person would probably get about a thousand US dollars or something like that, the equivalent of a thousand US dollars. as just a grant to hold over, it's just a one-time grant. I guess at that time we never forecasted that um, the pandemic would be 18 months and counting. But that said, um, we've been able to get funding and to, to its credit, the Ministry of, we have the Ministry of Culture and the Arts. They have been able to manage that fund and allocate it to a number of persons. There was about Based on the mathematics, about 5,000 people were eligible. And I think about 6 to 80% of persons who applied have gotten, I should say. 6 to 80% have, um, have received on that thing. Um, as I said, the other area that you spoke about was the data. That is something that everybody's fighting and wrestling with, including music teaching. This is something that we've spoken about when Song Diplomacy did their... Um, the strategic plan for the music, as well as any previous um, consultant for strategic plans. We've always said the same thing. Data is not provided to do any kind of database um, management or strategic planning. And it's, it's probably the fault of the agency, but it's definitely the fault based on the information that's provided of the artists themselves. Artists take this very casually. They don't provide data for varying reasons. And as a consequence, we have to make these kind of gut these gut feeling um, decisions. Some work, some don't work. But um, certainly I think one of the things that has happened, say with the Port of Spain Live Music District that I spoke about earlier, as I said, it was a, it was a, a plan that had been put forward, certainly by Song Diplomacy, recognizing that Port of Spain is one of those kind of go-to cities in the English speaking Caribbean. There's a particular road on um, called Arapita Avenue that has a number of bars. Every, every building is almost a bar on the street. As I said, few uh, specifically for has a stage for live music and that kind of thing. But as I said, Lyman culture is part of our attraction. Um, I guess just like in Orlando, there's the idea of just we have fun. It's, hey, what are you going to do? But um, the support for businesses on that strip, of course, bars had to close mandatorily because of the curfews and restrictions. So they were the ones who were hit. You know, anybody could buy a bottle of rum or buy a couple of beers and hang out in their homes. We had some pretty stringent um, restrictions. They actually limited indoor gatherings to five persons. I mean, there was we had some very, very tough restrictions. But as I said, um, coming up next week, I think some of those restrictions will be eased, which has been forecasted by the Prime Minister and the Minister of Health. So we should be seeing an easing of that. But this last, certainly for the, was this eight months? We're now in the ninth month of, we've just finished nine months of, 2020, of 2021. It's been hard. It's been very, very hard. And 
carnival is our main creative output here in Trinidad. And have not having carnival for we had carnival in 2020. We were lucky because the, the pandemic came the, the um just after, about a month after. No carnival in 2021. There were some innovations in terms of creation creative creativity. Our soca singers and our Calypsonians who drive that carnival and basically our our national music as it was. Some artists opted not to release new music because a lot of the music is geared towards that festival. Some waited, waited, waited. As I said, they've gone to Miami. Miami Carnival, I believe, is next week or something like that. And there are a number of artists. Most of the major artists are actually in Miami right now because there are events happening there. So that Trinidad is recognizing that we are now like a diaspora nation. There are Trinidadians here in the island, and there are pockets certain in New York and in Florida, in Washington, D.C. I think there's some in LA, and certainly there are a number across the pond in London. So we have to expand and innovate to get out there. The government is listening to us, an advocate voice. I could convincingly tell them, okay, you probably need to do some more investment, some, some uh, more enabling environment, creation of a more enabling environment for business investment. That has happened. I mean, they've already, they've allowed a uh, $12 million. If you invest, let, let me make sure I get this correct. As a tax incentive, if you invest up to, I think it's up to $12 million, you get a write-off in your taxes. This had been... It's, it'd be serially every year with that double. It was three million, then six million, now twelve million dollars. Um, the uptake of that tax incentive in terms of businesses investing in the creation of music for entertainment hasn't been perfect, but it's something that the government has done. The conversation is that between an advocate voice and stakeholders and the wider public in terms of getting the getting the world to know that Trinidad and Tobago music industry, live music industry, is a real thing. It's been wanting, but it's getting there sooner. So now is the time, as I said, post-pandemic is when we started ground zero almost, and we see what happens. And I think things can look up. As a stakeholder in the promotion side, I can see that happening. Great. Um, thank you to both. It's interesting. Um, we're definitely aligned in the importance of the placemaking, right? And how like we're all using... Uh, arts and music as something to give identity to where we're located at and to, you know, help business uh, increase. Um, I really cannot emphasize enough how important it is to for the, the industry to articulate themselves. And as you said, have this representation. Um, also for it, like uh, David talked earlier about creating the, the safe environment, that requires an investment, right? You have to, you know, condition your venues to have that. And it's hard for venues to do that if they don't have, if they're not perceived as someone who actually needs that. You know, the government is like, all right, you can do, like, at least here, it's like um, the protocols they gave out. It's like, okay, now you can have music, but you need to invest this much money and condition in your place. And because it's not like, you know, because we're not articulated in that way, we might not have access to some of those funds. Some venues might have enough to save money to do that. But like every hour you take away from, from a place like this, it's really like 25% of income that it's being lost. It's, it's really hard. Um, so those are like two key takeaways that, that I want to emphasize the, the fact of like really articulating the industry to have that representation and the placemaking which is in essence what we're really trying to do right like just use music to give uh, I guess not not use music like it because mm, it, it's kind of been there already right like every every place has this identity uh, and it really that comes from the culture within it it's just that now it's more evident than it was before, I feel. Um, if it's okay with you both, I would like to talk a little bit about what my experience has been here in Costa Rica and what we've been trying to do. Because uh, I, I think it's, it, it kind of, it really relates to what both of you are saying and, and uh, there might be something in there. So you have bars, right, that they, they're, value proposition has been mainly parties and DJs and whatnot, right? Occasional live music shows, but not really. It's been mainly parties and DJs and, and whatnot. So they've never really 
needed to involve music and the arts as part of the core business. What's happening now is that because we have to close so early, we also have to open up early, you know, in, in order to have, uh, to kind of work with the, like, I don't know, it's just like activate the places for more hours. So we're opening at like 11 a.m. in some spots. It was a challenge for us because like the first year, no one really wanted to still invest in music. It might have been too risky because the return, how do you know the return and whatnot? So what we started doing is we started doing a series of cultural events uh, where it was not just music. We had scenic arts. We had uh, artisans. We had uh, theater. We had people selling paintings. And we also have the live music. So what that did is that we were actually able to come up with, with a series of events that we've had in two days, around a thousand people showing up in the different venues, but never going above the 25% capacity because each place has a different activity in it. So the people are constantly rotating. So that was very interesting. Uh, I'm very happy to say that it was the event. It, they, those were the events or, or are the events with the highest utility since the pandemic opened. So it's like we are indirectly showing the sponsors, the brands, like the, the beer brands or the alcohol brands that, that sponsor the bars, showing them a different way of investing in content without them even really noticing because what they do, they'll give out the money to the bar and they don't really expect to know what it was spent on. They just wanna know how many, how, many, how many drinks you sold. So that's good because it, it's also creating a different source of financing, um, a, a different line of income for, for the, the industry. Uh, another thing that I really liked uh, that I'm especially proud about is that because we're at 25% capacity, it really gives us an opportunity to involve emerging bands and emerging projects because now we don't have to have that many people over because we can't. So it's easier for these bands to have to actually accomplish the amount of people we need. So that has created a whole series of events that it's been visualizing emerging bands that for the past year, uh, I was interested. I, I, I noticed that you said, Nigel, that a lot of the artists chose not to put the music out when it's when the pandemic started here. It was kind of the opposite. And it's shown to prove positive results because what it did is it started engaging their audience and now the the audience actually wants to see this band live so when the emerging band comes out it, it actually has people over if you just don't, let me just stick up in here for i the, the yeah. thing about the trend that music scene we have this very we have a very kind of seasonal kind of addiction of our music carnival as i said carnival is a driver of our music economy i think about 80 percent of our music economy is, is focused on carnival and between Christmas and Ash Wednesday, which is the day after Carnival, soca music drives and dominates the airwaves and it dominates the lives of a lot of Trinidadians. But it's it's a music that is a participatory music as it was. So if there was if we had already been told that there would be no carnival in 2021, so that's why some of those artists chose not to release songs. Some artists did. We had a few artists who had released songs, some very nice songs actually. But a lot of them opted op, opted not to do it because that association of music to carnival is critical and key in our music industry. So gotcha. that's, your, that's your little stick pin. I just want to make that clear to you and your listeners. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, yeah, here, I guess it's not, would, would you say like in Trinidad, there's like many different genres going on or not? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, um, as I said, I put on an event, my event is based on jazz. And it's Caribbean jazz. So it's jazz with a Caribbean flavor, Caribbean accent. Nice. Um, we I have our, <laughs> the, second, yeah, no problem. the second largest music in Trinidad behind soca, which is dominant, is gospel music. Right? So that we have a we have a pretty large, significant Christian population, and they listen to only praise and worship music. And that and they have three radio stations dominated by um focus on that music. We play, we had because of our history, we have Indians, um, East Indians had come here and they've created chutney music, which is a kind of variation of, I wouldn't say Bangra, but some kind of Eastern, Eastern harmonies, melodies, and rhythms with a kind of African feel and drumming sung in, in a language that we sometimes don't understand, or in English with a kind of risky, um, risky story. 
At mm. Christmas time, you have a thing called Parang. I think it's called Paranda in some parts of in Latin America, which are Christmas songs, but it's, 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 it came via the Venezuelan immigrants who came here at the turn of the 19th century. So we have music that is very seasonal, and we have a wide range of music, as well as pop and hip hop and rap and rap, so, and that kind of thing. So Trinidad is very eclectic that way, unlike, say, Jamaica, where it's reggae and dancehall that dominates the music scene, 80 mm. 90 percent. We have, as I said, soca music, Calypso, definitely. And additionally, something I didn't mention, I should, and I'm probably going to get licks for this, the steel pan invented in Trinidad and Tobago, and that is music. And at carnival time, the activity of moving from one steel pan yard to another, we call it a pan yard crawl, is an activity that by itself is almost like a music activity. Musicians are rehearsing for a large steel band competition. Mm -hmm. And audiences by the hundreds just move from one steel pan yard to another. And it's along a particular strip again in Port of Spain. That's a parallel road to the RPT Avenue called Tragic Road. The four, one of the four biggest bands in Trinidad, all on that road. So you can move from one... It's, you, I don't know if anybody could go into a Rolling Stones rehearsal space, but imagine you're just able to, to walk into a rehearsal and hear a steel band practicing. They may be doing things on the road and over and over, yeah. but every now and then they play the whole thing through. And that by itself is an experience. And our live music industry, it's based on experiences. Yes, we sit down and listen to music. Yes, we hear music. We love music. We, we absorb all the music from all over the world. But the experience of live music is more than just sitting and listening. It's being part of it, the energy, and of course, food and drink. So that's what yeah. we do. But I, I, I love, I love the fact that is. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'm perceiving is that like, it's always taking something that it's abroad, but with your own identity. And I feel that that's definitely crucial in allowing the artists to even go out to Miami. Because there's a demand outside because it's it mm -hmm. comes from curating that identity within mm -hmm. right uh Definitely. that that doesn't happen here in costa rica at least not not as much because we're always uh trying to not i might get some people might be pissed about this <laughs> but there's a lot of bands that are really welcome trying, to the club <laughs> like yeah like just versioning something that already exists which might work here, like uh, you might, uh, you know, like a band might be like, uh, they'll get super happy because someone told them that they're just like Black Sabbath. So they're like Costa Rican Black Sabbath, that's great, but the world already heard Black Sabbath. They don't need another one that is not gonna be Black Sabbath. <laughs> so the demand is not there. That's very interesting from a, from a music export strategy point of view. We, um, we have we have rock bands here in Trinidad, but the rock music the rock music scene has once created a kind of ecosystem. So there are bands who play, as you said, we, have, we play death metal and all kind of hard genres of, of rock. But they also have their core audiences and they produce their own music and CDs. They don't necessarily get a lot of radio airplay, but they do a little economic activity among themselves. And it's pretty cool yeah. to observe, and I, I really like that. And one of the bands, a band called... Um, Lynchpin, they went to Wacken, Germany at this big heavy metal festival. They, they qualified for this region and they went there and they performed in front of tens of thousands of people playing death metal from Trinidad. Nice. Go figure. Yeah. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, let me just finish quickly with, the, with, the, with what else we're doing in Costa Rica. Um, what else we're doing in Costa Rica? <laughs> so we're doing a... One, one other interesting aspect, uh, this, uh, this I feel is very important, is that government, they, you know, they have their assets, like they have their own venues and stuff, but they're not being able to execute a lot of the events. And a lot of artists depend on these events to work because they're on their yearly agenda. So there's an interesting phenomenon going on that because now they're seeing we're doing this, they're actually latching on their agenda to ours because they need spaces that are doing this. And I run, and thankfully there's a lot of those assets that they have, those buildings and, and spaces that they have that are very close to where we're at. So we're actually creating routes. And by creating routes, we're doing this placemaking strategy that allow us to latch on even more to the tourism sector. So one of the goals is that eventually when you're going down the stairs in the airport, even the plane, one of the things you'll see is visit Distrito Carmen and because like people don't usually stay in San Jose, our capital for more than one night. 
they come here and they spend the night, they get here and then they'll go somewhere else. And then once they're back, they'll spend the last night and then they leave to the airport. We are not really retaining people in the city but because the urban experience has not been um, just just overall enjoyable. You know, it's, it's always been just partying and things like that, which is fine. But that also uh, not thinking about the whole nighttime economy aspects of it and how it really relates to the cultural ecosystem uh, makes the cities a lot more insecure. So hence you're not uh, retaining tenants as much as you could. Um, so that's one other thing we've been doing. Um, now we're really focusing on also documenting everything and creating our own registry of shows and artists and, and really trying to latch on on more on the, the orange economy aspects that, that International Development Bank recommends, right? Like really trying to, to have us latch on, like pretty much have the businesses work as a TV station and as a studio and as a radio station in that sense. Uh, and that's, I'm surprised people don't do it more often because that's pretty much uh, like Morris Levy being a gangster as he was, uh, he was one of the, the originators of the music industry, but he was really smart in that he started recording the shows at Birdland, his venue. And then he, he signed that, you know, to a record label. Same with, um, what's the name of this famous rock producer who used to own the Fillmore's? Um, Bill Graham. Yeah, he did that with the Fillmore's as well. It's, it's a, they've been doing, they were doing it so long ago and we kind of, we just thought of this is the venue and this is what it's like. And uh, these type of things I love um, and I would love to see more of them also because it, it's it's really that's just the way the world is right now and it, it goes with the whole concept of music registries and and whatnot um that i just i just i personally find it uh, fascinating i think it's it's a it's so useful and and underexploited. i feel uh david i'm interested in uh what do you what do you think are, are, are nigel and myself crazy <laughs> Not at all to that extent. I, I wish we had a little bit more of you guys here here in Orlando to, to that extent. You know, but it's interesting to to hear, you know, the various different ways. Um, and even that you, Santiago, were mentioning the the collaboration or potential collaboration that's starting to happen with the governmental entities and realizing the context and in ways you guys have been able to evolve on your own and, and them saying, okay, let, let, let's go ahead and try to latch on to that. For, for us, you know, it's it, it's been interesting because our to some in some ways, some might say our our nightlife area to that extent, as we call our nighttime economy, um, is almost too vibrant. And, and, and that can sound weird in a conversation like this. Um, um, but what we've been trying to do is how do we expand that? And when you talk about and I say expand that, I mean, expand it in duration of time, um, because when you talk about. Uh, like previously, you're saying you have to open earlier uh, uh, to that extent because you're having to force down to close late. Although it's not the same, uh, um, and this kind of goes into what you were talking about, music registries, in a little bit maybe, but and I, probably not as cool as uh, the steel drum or the steel pan component that you were talking about, Nigel, is, is we're trying to to bring the music and artists into more of our daytime environment. And, and quite frankly, the daytime environment at least for our community, is not the same as as you'll find at 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. or midnight. It's mostly, uh, you know, the business community that, that, that that's coming to work at eight and, and and leaving at five. So we've been working with our our arts district. We have an arts district in downtown to build a registry of artists that would be willing ultimately to showcase their uh, their talents, whatever it might be, whatever whatever their choice of instrument might be. Um, throughout our throughout our downtown core uh, as a placemaking initiative to, to that extent. You know, you talked about a little bit just about placemaking and, and trying to retain some of that tourism um, that's kind of coming in and out of, of your capital there in Costa Rica. So um, um, the way we've kind of outlined it in a, in a hope is, you know, in full context, our, 
our downtown to that is, is not, it, we don't have the same amount of people we had pre-pandemic. So even though uh, we have lots of large office buildings, they're, they're not as full as they were. Um, um, people are, are working differently these days in, in the professional environment. But that has a very real impact on our businesses. Uh, and, and when we thought about how do we impact that, um, you know, as you guys just heard, it was potentially trying to isolate some of that, uh, that energy, the ambiance, the identity, the excitement, the fun uh, that, that music brings, <laughs> right? It just brings enjoyment um, 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 to that with the hope um, um, that it drives people to re-experience our downtown because um, it, it's not that there's no one here, but it's definitely not the same. It, so when we, this is similar, but different um, at night, we do not have restrictions as I've mentioned already. Um, but in working with our venue operators and talking to them and, and um, incorporating live music in, and it happens in a multitude of different ways, um, kind of large scale or small scale, has been interesting from an evolutionary component because I think as we work with them, what they found is that as they've integrated live music into some of their more lounge type establishments, um, their goal is to kind of uh, it extend the, the the dwell time of their customers, right? To to kind of prevent the bar hop mentality of okay, we're going to stop at this establishment and, and have a drink here, and we're going to walk down the street. And I think what we found or, or they found, we found through them is that when they do provide those components uh, for a local musician, uh, um, you know, to, to, to kind of have the corner, if, if that's all they have or a mini stage, if they have that, it, it just places a new vibe, so to speak. Um, people stay longer, uh, which ultimately, you know, end up then buying more, more drinks, having a good time uh, and then wanting to come back. Uh, um, um, so they kind of, uh, in, in some extent, have evolved different nights around jazz, let's say, or, or piano or what have you, uh, to provide different experiences for people. And, um, you know, it's interesting to watch it evolve. And it, it, it by no means doesn't have its challenges. Uh, um, there are definitely those. You know, we also have a large living population in, in our downtown. And um, any, it, it's funny with music, one person's music, it can sometimes be another person's noise, right? So, so when, when, when you, when you kind of cross those barriers and, and, and you have people that maybe aren't appreciating whatever the, the, the night's choice of music happens to be, that can be, um, you know, a pull and tug as, as, as we say, and we haven't found that, that balance yet, but, um, it, it's definitely, we're, we're trying to, because we want to continue to embrace it. So. That's great. That's definitely another way we can like we can show that it's it's uh, one of the hidden blessings of the pandemic, right? Like having people starting doing these things and then they can stay once the pandemic is over. Uh, definitely, and music is not just bands, right? Like you have like in, in my venue, we we opened up like this is even two years before the pandemic. We were doing. I think we did 870 something shows in two years, but it was because we were opening early in the morning. So we would have uh, an activity for a foundation that worked with kids. Then we would have a, a punk show. Then we would have a reggae show. Then we would have uh, an electronic music uh, going up after party. And then the same with the next day. But what I mean is that, there's so much like you could have music for corporate events. You could have music for foundations. You could have music for academies. You could have music for all sorts of things that is just alternative revenue for the business. That is just, if you don't do it, you're missing out. It's there already and they need spaces to do it. So I, I think that's, that's a, it's, it's great that you guys are, are doing that. Um, there's one aspect that I forgot to mention that it is, I think it's very, very important for what we're doing with the with the music shows. And I think this is something that could be implemented both in Orlando and, and anywhere in the world, in Trinidad, anywhere. Um, we negotiated with the producers that 5% of the door is gonna go towards investing back in the music ecosystem or the arts ecosystem. And 3% is gonna go towards a communal fund that for now that communal fund is being used mainly to ease off production expenses right if we need to pay for someone to do lightning or whatever that so that it doesn't affect the artist 
but that is still feasible for the producers. And this is working at a 25% capacity model. So it can only get better. And then what this does is that one of the lessons we've had is uh, an overly dependent industry on grants from the government. And so this is a way to tackle that because after a year of doing that, if, you know, once we get back to full capacity, 3% for a whole year, that's a good amount of money. And 5%, like 8% total, it's a good amount of money that you can then use to pay for uh, mappings. You could buy insurance for the for the artists that work in your venues. You can really curate in a more active way, which is gonna create an engagement, a different engagement with the artists. Uh, there's a there's this guy, this Canadian guy, uh, his name was Peter Gatien. He was known, I don't know if you know about him, but he was known for being the biggest club owner in the world at some point. Uh, he used to own the limelight uh, um, venues and all these things. Like He had like 28 huge venues in the world. And uh, in his biography, I, I this was written, this was done a long time ago, like 20 years ago. And I found it fascinating that he said that he's like, He's like, all right, whenever I used to go somewhere new, I would buy the shell, right, like the building, and the first thing I would do is get the creative the creative community involved and have them design everything for me and all the experiences. And that's what gave each place a unique experience. And he's the largest venue owner in the world. <laughs> so it must work. Uh, unfortunately, what happened after uh, was that once Rudy Giuliani became mayor of New York, of course, the, the war, the, the so-called war on drugs, they found a guy um, or someone, someone was selling drugs inside the club and they created this whole case for him. They, they actually, he ended up being innocent, but they bled him out in, in legal fees until he had to just stop doing it. And then once he, once he was bled out, I was like, okay, you're innocent. <laughs> But what I mean is like, it, 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 it works. It's just, it really works. You have to use for, for any business, like having the creative industries uh, involved is like, it's gonna give you something so unique. And, and like, it's such smart people of trying to just having to find their own way in the world makes you do things differently. Um, so that that's something I, I just find fascinating. I'm, I'm glad that it's also happening, uh, that it's happening everywhere really. Um, to a certain point, so much to do yet still, right? <laughs> There's something I want to add, if you don't mind, um, yeah. in terms of kind of economic systems. Um, of course, we in Trinidad, we look at television. We know what's happening in Florida. Your governor in Florida doesn't believe in mass mandates, and he just says, let's open up the city and get the hell with anybody, right? Our, our, our government is a little more, ad admittedly, a little safer. So we have to follow certain rules, probably a little heavy-handed, but it's we are we are alive as it was but one of the other things that happens is that your economy in orlando say and i'm not sure what happens in costa rica it can be localized you have state tax i don't know if you have city tax i don't know if that's a thing if i buy a bear in orlando some money goes to the, the state of florida and some goes to the federal government is that correct just yes or no uh yes and no we, we only have a state tax um but okay. the state divvies that tax up and and passes some back to the city. The city doesn't have its own that it charges. The only city taxes that we have are, are property taxes. We, we pay taxes on property that we own, um, but like sales tax is all paid to the state. So. Yeah, well, we do ours, we have value added tax so that if you buy a bear, there's a, there's a little tax that you, you don't see it because it's all part of the price. Mm -hmm. But everything goes to what we call the consolidated fund, which is like the central fund. And as you speak about property tax, um, we have a property tax regime that's going to be rolling out soon that is going to be kind of centralized. But I think the Minister of Finance said that each individual city, borough, count, come, we call them corporations, regional corporations, will receive that money for themselves to run their own areas, right? Yet still I'm also hearing that the money goes into a consolidated fund. And as you said, in Orlando, it's divvied up and paid back to the individual um, cities or whatever to run their, their corporations as it was, their municipal corporations. So that that is the thing that always was a little different, as I said, uh, the state of Florida has money and the state of Florida can then spend money on Orlando, Miami, Hialeah, wherever the, the cities are. But um, in Trinidad, 
but Port of Spain being the capital, being the, the city of Port of Spain, yes, they get an, I think their annual budget is about, if I, I actually wrote it down, is about 200 and, 240 million Trinidad dollars. That's about, what's that, about 6 million? 240, let me do my maths quickly. Divide that by six, 40 million. Hopefully, I hope, I hope that's correct. About 30, 40 million dollars US is the expenses. But the income from fees, vending fees, whatever it is, is about a million dollars if so much, right? So there's this great disparity. So that that difference has to be funded by the, the central government as it is, right? And that has put a kind of strain in terms of the efficiency of how these cities are run. So as much as, as I said, Port of Spain is now a UNESCO city and we've opened a live music district and we clearly are an attractive city with a nightlife and that kind of thing. The, the um, how businesses earn their money is, I guess, similar to Costa Rica, just selling beers and having a DJ as opposed to having a live event. The, the money that is paid and that is for drink sales don't necessarily go back to help the city. It goes into the individual um, property owner's um, pocket and whatever taxes go to the central government and then it goes back out with that deviant process. And of course, the impact of the, the pandemic has affected how budgeting has done. I think incomes have dropped generally in terms of revenue incomes um, region, nationally. And um, it's, it's been very difficult. And uh, Trinidad, have, we, we have a savior. We have oil and gas. So we earn a lot more money than other countries. We don't depend solely on tourism. But we have to diversify the, company, the country because oil and gas is limited. It's, it's kind of running out as it was. And the tourism angle is something, of course, that we've been pushing. And part of that tourism product, Tobago, which is our society, they have the perfect beaches. Trinidad is more business oriented. But we've been pushing the idea of a music ecosystem and having a live music space. And as I said, carnival, definitely. And the whole lemon culture as something that is attractive to our tourists. If you want to come to a party, just like Ibiza in Spain or, or off the, they have those islands are, are party places. Trinidad and Port of Spain certainly is a kind of has that energy to be a party place. But um, how the city of Port of Spain earns its money as opposed to the country and whether that money is, is spent properly, those are the differences, I think, in, in the economics, the, the economic models that vary between certainly Orlando and Trinidad. I'm not sure what happens in Costa Rica. I'm going to be really interested in what happens in Costa Rica in terms of state tax versus national taxes. Well, we have... Um... We definitely have taxes for the local governments, uh, which is it's, uh, one of the reasons why we are creating this association I was mentioning earlier is to try to, how can I put this? It's, 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 very, it's very weird because I, I can open a venue, even though I'm in San Jose, if I am in Escazú, which is the town I live, the regulations already changed in Santana, which is the next town, even though it's in the same province. So they might tax you differently regarding where you are. Uh, in some places, they'll charge you just like an overall fee to be able to do those events. Other municipalities will charge you per event, which is extremely annoying and non-practical. And of course, it gives way for a, a very lack of proper control and free corruption and whatnot. Um, and then there's also like the national taxes you have to pay, uh, the, added value, uh, the added value tax you have to pay for sure. Um, and then I think another very important aspect is also getting the permits to do these activities. Um, that's, that's another, that's another uh, monster by itself because you have to, for example, you need to get from the, from the health ministry – you need to get uh, what's it called in English? It's it's a it's a functioning permit based on the activities you're going to be doing. Once you have that, you can get the actual license to do those events. So that's another thing that it's it's super unarticulated here. Like uh, I could do I could have live music. I could have the the, the health permit to do live music and live spectacle but I might not have the one to have an art gallery or to do anything that it's uh, qualified more specifically towards years or places like that and, and vice versa. So that's like an, an unnecessary setback, right? It's, it's like, it's, it's an, it's an obstacle that's been there for like a hundred years 
and it just hasn't really been tackled yet. It's again, one of the things that the pandemic has made us like really kind of stand up a little bit more and, and analyze these things. Like, why are they, are these things there? And I, I, I mean, it, it's glad that we're all doing this on our own way. Like, you know, fighting from our own spot because it's, it's the, uh, the hope is that we'll visualize these issues and uh, we'll make them visible enough for people to actually start conglomerating and support these initiatives and, and kind of create new alternative regulatory plans. And even, you know, tax systems that can make, if I'm allowed to do all these activities, as many as I want a day, sure, I'll pay your taxes. I don't mind. I don't mind because I'm also winning. But, but you know, it's, 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 it's hard. It really changes depending on where you're at in the country. And um, yeah, it's 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 very regular. I'd say it's not the same opening a venue here, in in where I live to two towns over. Even though it's in the same uh, here, we call them provinces, but uh, for you it would be a state. So it's like if you're doing something in Orlando versus in I don't know uh, in Miami, it's it it's a whole completely different thing. It is. So it, it, we, we have the same, I think, challenge from an operator standpoint in that each city to that extent or locality, uh, as it may be informed, has the ability to some extent um, to create their own rules as to how they want to manage, you know what I mean, their community. Uh, and what, what it's created oftentimes is, is our our industries to be to be very site focused. So you will have some um, that start to say, okay, we have businesses that are in Miami and Orlando and Jacksonville. But more often than not, um, we'll get industries that really focus on one and we'll have five places in Miami because they know how to operate in Miami, but it, it doesn't happen the same as you have in Orlando. And then vice versa, we, we have establishments that have multiple you know venues here because they, they haven't figured out how to operate in Jacksonville or Tampa or, or what have you. Um, and, you know, there's, there's pros and cons of, about that. I think when, when you think about it from the operator standpoint, some of them feel that it, it's their advantage, right? They, they understand this locale better than anyone else. So, so, so they have the opportunity to, to work within it, uh, um, and without having too many, as much competition, but vice versa. Um, I think it, it, it tampers diversity to, to some extent, right? Because we, we want to encourage um, influencing and mixing and, and, and the component for opportunities uh, for, as I was, as I, you know, referred to earlier, one person's music is another person's noise. You, we need a multitude of things because uh, everybody has so many different tastes and, and it, it's hard for any one operator or any one venue to, to master all of those to, to that extent. I mean, we do see people bring in promoters and, and host various nights and, and try to cater to, to various different genres, but, um, it, 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 there, there's an obvious context of, of when one operator or venue, um, you know, has, has a really good host on whatever type of music, whether it be R&B or, or, or Latin or, or something of that sort, that typically works better. And, and it's it just, you know, it's one of those unfortunate things that I think that is rooted in, in just some historical things, how, how they've unfolded. Um, and we have a similar challenge. Um, we call them here event permits. Um, but they, they're, they're per event that you throw. It, it's not something that once you get this event permit, you know that you can throw this same event um, every every week or even on the same day every year. It, it's per event and it's looked at. And there's reasons for that. I mean, they want to make sure that there's enough police and safety involved and, and that people will be safe and, and that they can take care of people and that there's no issues with traffic. But it is difficult to, to that extent to, to really forecast and make sure you're booking acts in, 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 long enough ahead of time and have the assurances to, to make things come together. So um, we, we're still working on that here as well. I'm glad you brought up permits because it seems to be a universal theme. Um, as I said, my, my event is an outdoor event and we have to get a temporary bar license, an alcohol license, and that's a process. You have to go to court. And while you're there, you also have to get a copyright clearance license, so a kind of blanket license for playing music. An EMA um, variation for noise. We have a noise pollution, con noise control rules. And um, as I said, the bar license. But that the act that controls that is a national act. I mean, we're not trying to emphasize of Orlando, but 
everything is national. So as a consequence, you, our, we have a law called the, Dan the Theater and Dance Halls Act. That act came into place in 1935 when Trinidad was a colony. We've, we've evolved and, and amended the act to include you know, new fees and, and where the money is paid and who the money is paid to and that kind of stuff. That kind of stuff. But the act still has within it a kind of restrictions in terms of what can be done, what cannot be done on a stage. So there's a kind of almost like a, an, a, an area of censorship within the, the act. And that notion of getting a permit is like an exercise because all you get the permit, you have to advertise in a newspaper that you're going to have an event and the noise level is going to be high and you have to put that in two, ten, two, or six weeks before the event. It's just a long process that doesn't seem very practical as to use the word practicable because... Um, if you're going to be promoting live music industry, music industry generally, we have to make sure that these systems for regulation are fair. I mean, you, you want to make sure that there's safety and, as you say, policing and traffic and that kind of stuff. But in terms of getting the thing, it should be, it should be like pulling teeth. We're supposed to have this thing streamlined. And admittedly, one thing that the pandemic has done is we've, our whole government has gone online. So most forms and applications, you cannot go online and get them. And that is gung-ho if you didn't like the government you love them no because they put everything online but um the idea of and even payment systems online that is we're slowly but surely getting to do the payment systems online but um i, I think that there are certain elements of the, the infrastructure and the what they call the enabling environment for the health music industry that still has work to be done here in trinidad right as i said it's not it's not 100 perfect it's better than it was at least 10 years ago but at the same time, those are the hurdles that we have to overcome. And I'm just thinking that hopefully that in terms of how the, the budget, as I said, the budget is going to be read on Monday, that whatever regulations happen, it takes into consideration that the music industry, which was literally the last industry to reopen, every other industry, manufacturing never really closed. The oil and gas industry never closed. But the entertainment, um, restaurants and, and music industry, they were shut down effectively since March of last year. And they effectively the last to reopen. So that we're looking forward, certainly come next week, Monday, to hear some good news in terms of how the, the budget and the allocation of terms of investments, development budgets, and whatever new policies are gonna come up that could ease the, the, the transition back into the music industry so that we could start getting up there and be back where we were at least two, three years ago. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's some changes being made for sure. Uh, here, I guess what the government has focused more, it's been on well, the sector and the government. Um, it's been more like really setting up the protocols for these activities. Um, the sector was, of course, shut down. Also, the huge blow for everyone. It's it's been it's been tough. I mean, I, I'm seeing because I'm an artist myself. Uh, I start I started as a drummer. <laughs> Everything's been because of drums, really. Uh, but so so I I I I've been affected both ways, <laughs> both in the in the venue world and also I cannot play as much as I used to before. Um, but what what I was gonna say is that they focus more. There's this process going on with UNESCO, which is more like fomenting associative processes and like uh, giving out courses, uh, you know, on like how to a business manage your project and whatnot, which is nice, but it doesn't get people to work right away. Um, so it's again, the punkness has to come in and be like, okay, how, how, what am I going to do about this? Cause, cause it's really, um, you have to, the private sector has to help the government and vice versa, right? You can't just leave. There are some things I, I really feel that the private sector, at least here, it, it's in charge of innovating for sure. And then the public sector uh, gradually starts adopting those innovations. In some places it's different, but here I feel like that's been the, the way to go. And uh, luckily, you know, like a, a lot of people are getting more more involved in this and like really just, you know, like in, in Latin America, but again, here it's a very young uh, cultural, the, the Ministry of Culture is super young. It's 1948, right after Costa Rica abolished the army, but the educational platform and the way it used to work, it's really, 
it was based on how it was before. Like even to this day, there are still some some state bands that depend on the police's budget on what they have. And and that's in in municipalidad of Liberia in Guanacaste. That should not be. That should definitely not be. You know, like it's 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 this this whole. We have to understand why things are the way they are. And, and I don't remember which one of you said that. That it's 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 derivative of a systematic thing that it's inherited. Right? Like there's there are things that go changing as time goes, um, and and it should not stop. You know, it should never stop. It can't stop with 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 us. It has to, we have to figure out ways to like really translate all this information to a way that it almost feels like a TED Ed video. <laughs> that is like something in five minutes you can understand and it's easy and this is, this exists and this is the way you can go about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, we have, we have five minutes left. Um, I don't know if, if you guys, maybe you, you could go on, uh, and do like your closing statements. This has been on my end. It's been great. Uh, I really love talking about this. I've learned a lot. Uh, I love the contrast between one location and the other and things we have in common and things that we're all doing and things that we're not doing. And, uh, I'm stealing a lot of stuff. <laughs> Um, hopefully, hopefully I, I, I provided something that you guys could steal as well for, for the greater good. Um, and this is what it's all about, like really talking amongst each other and figuring out ways to collectively improve the whole situation. Uh, you know, we're part of a, this is going to sound so cliche, but we're part of the same world, <laughs> you know, one world, we're doing one thing. Yeah. So we got to... <laughs> We gotta keep pushing. We gotta keep pushing, and uh, I'm happy to hear that uh, about what you guys are doing. And I, I commend you for it. I think it's great, and hopefully this would serve as some sort of motivation to keep pushing forward. So that being said, um, maybe I don't know if Nigel wants to go on and with his closing statement, and then David, and then hopefully we'll see Mitch after this. We should definitely. I can't wait to go to Orlando and go to Trinidad and. You have to come. You guys are more than welcome Check to come down here as long yeah. as you want. Not a problem. Let me just say that um, this has been an interesting conversation because what I've gathered is certainly listening to the Costa Rican experience, I'm recognizing that there's probably a Latin American or Caribbean and Central American thing that clearly differentiates us from North America. So the Orlando scene, although there may be people who speak Spanish in Orlando or in Miami, not being, I don't want to be that, that guy, but... Um, <laughs> I recognize that there are certain things that we we have in common and there are certain things that we have to evolve upwards towards. And as a consequence, I think that um, we're, ad admittedly, we're not as advanced as the United States of America. I'm not going to fool you. And I don't think anybody's going to recognize that, but we're getting there. We have attached ourselves to certain systems and, and models, business models that have been working. And if they've been working, let's try it all, all the same. Attitudes are a little different to change. Um, just like Costa Rica, we have bars that open here, clubs. They don't necessarily see that live music as, is as lucrative as just having a DJ and selling bears and that kind of stuff. We also probably have to you know, train audiences to understand, which is a thing that happens over time, that live music is a thing that's happening. But we're going to get there. And I think, um, I think the, the critical thing here is that Having that advocate voice, which is something that you have a venue association in Orlando, and I think you spent you said the same thing in Santiago in Costa Rica, where people can actually advocate and make policy, almost make policy decisions and get them enacted in terms of funding the three percent and the five percent kind of thing. We that is something that Trinidad and Tobago has to step up to because our advocate our advocate game is not where it should be. But um, as I said, come Monday, budget, the week after, we're going to be reopening um, the, the, the bars and everything, and we'll see what happens. And hopefully, if we have this conversation again in six months' time, we'll be able to know um, what's happening. So all the best, and I hope to see you all again. Bye. <laughs> Likewise. Yeah, so no, I'll, I'll just mention a couple of quick ones. So, so first of all, thank you for, for, for having me this afternoon. It's been great chatting with you guys and, and just getting to share. It's it's been amazingly interesting, as, as you guys have pointed out, how, how different maybe um, socially and structurally our, our countries are to that extent, our areas are. 
But I think our challenges, they, they all have very uh, distinct and, and, and pointed similarities. Uh, um, and, and I think it goes to some context of that when all of us are, are trying to tackle them, but even from our own little perspectives, when you get together and have conversations like this and, and, and get to share ideas and context, I think there's benefits that, that hopefully come out of that, that, that we were able to, to share and grow from. So uh, I know we're uh, immensely happy to be a part of that conversation. We want to continue to do so. And, uh, you know, uh, Nigel, I wish you guys the best of luck with opening, opening back up next week. I, I hope you see all the, all the resurgence and activity that, that we have been fortunate to have because our governor doesn't believe in, in closing things down anymore. So, so I, I hope you find the same level of, uh, of energy as we have. So thank you both. Amazing. Okay, that would be all for us. Um, thank you, Melissa, again. Um, this has been very interesting and amazing, and uh, I'm proud of everyone who's been a part of this process, and uh, we all have to keep moving forward. It's going to be fine, <laughs> eventually, at some point. <laughs> it can only get better. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for being a part of this panel. I know the chats on YouTube and Facebook were on fire. Um, so I know a lot of persons will have questions um, in our Q&A coming up. So hope somebody is able to, you know, pop in and, and give some, um, answer some questions there. So okay. I guess I'll see you all later. Cool. <laughs> Nigel, bye. David, it's been a pleasure. Take care. See you, man. Bye, all. Bye. All right, all right, all right. So thank you so much to Song Diplomacy and panelists for that engaging discussion on businesses and live music. At this juncture, it's Friday, y'all. <laughs> it's Friday. It's day three of the event. And we are almost finished, almost to the end of the Reverb Experience 2021. I would like to extend a hearty thank you to all of our presenters, panelists, and partners who participated in the event over these past three days. Um, pages in my notebook are filled, like lots and lots and lots of notes. So I hope everyone was taking notes studiously. Lots of gems being dropped on all the different panels. Um, so yeah, thank you again to you, the audience, for attending and for all the social media posts that y'all have been putting out and tagging us. Thank you so much. We appreciate you spreading the word with your networks. Um, if you have any friends or colleagues that you think should have heard any of these discussions, please feel free to send them over to our Facebook and YouTube page. The full lineup of sessions will be available for viewing till the 31st of October, after which, yeah, Oh, well. <laughs> so the 21st of October it is. So up next, we have the Q&A and networking event on Zoom at 3 p.m., where we, we, we will be joined by some of today's panelists. I don't know what just happened there. Um, <laughs> you can access the link via the conference website, www.reverbexperience.com. That's R-V-R-B experience.com. Feel free to share the link around to persons. Let them know this is happening. Yesterday's discussion for the um, Zoom was really, really good. Um, first day, you know, people were warming up and very shy and hiding behind the chats yesterday. You know, we had a more vibrant discussion that they didn't want to end. Um, so we actually went over time yesterday with that discussion. So we're hoping for, you know, that vibrant discussion to be happening today. So just under the topics area on the website, you look for the red button which says access the networking event here. Very easy. Enter. There's no passcode or anything. You shouldn't have any trouble joining. So after this event, uh, we head back over to YouTube and Facebook for the music showcase featuring Music TT Spotlight program alumni 
and current Spotlight participants. So on that note of Spotlight, Music Titi does have our Spotlight call for open call for applications um, open right now. Uh, it closes the 19th of October. The application does take some time to do. So please do not attempt to do the application um, in two days, in three days, in four days. You need to give yourself some time. So I'd say check it out now. If your producers, feel free to send it to your clients that you think would be eligible for the program. Um, or a right fit, I should say, for the program. Uh, if you have friends, colleagues, etc., who are recording artists, notice I said are recording artists, then yes, they should be eligible for the program. This includes musicians as well who are session musicians in that they have been um, working with other recording artists uh, if they haven't been their own solo act, that is and recording their own music, and you've been working in the background as a live musician in the recording um, studios, recording industry, then you are eligible to apply. So please feel free to check out that application form. All that information is available on our social media sites, which you can access at Music of TT. Um, and it's also available, of course, on our website. So Spotlight, be sure to check it out. And yeah, so thank you for joining us. We love you. We appreciate you. I am Melissa Jimenez, General Manager of Music TT. Thank you for joining us for the Reverb Experience 2021. And we look forward to what 2022 has to offer. It will be much better each year. We're striving to go better and bigger. So looking forward to 2022 already. Have a good afternoon. Have a good Friday. Spotlight is an artist portfolio development program where Music CT provides skills for artists specific to their individual needs over a period of nine months to one year. These training sessions include stage performance skills, vocal training, and helps us to identify those artists who are ready to take their talents internationally. Music TT conducts auditions every year. So to be in the know, go visit their website and follow all their social media platforms right now. Some Spotlight artists have been cast in international productions like The Lion King in London and some are on tour in Italy, Bali, Singapore and Canada. Some have even been nominated and received awards at various local award events. Spotlight is open to all genres, however, Music TT is making special links with international agencies, producers, and industry executives that has a special interest in artists and music with Caribbean flavors. It is recommended that those who apply have moderate to significant performance experience and are actively creating a catalog of music. My God, it's been such a pleasure being a part of the third cohort of this Music TT Spotlight program. We learned so much. We learned so much in this program about branding, about marketing, about photography, you know, your image and marketing yourself out there. In this cohort, I got to do a single. Y'all, that was the best experience working with Daryl, one of the best songwriters in Trinidad. I couldn't have asked for anything better. I was really, really excited to work on my new single with the team provided by Music TT. Thank you. I was able to not just sing my heart out, but show off some of my writing skills as well as learn how to improve on it. And I'm really happy with the music that we were able to create. truly learned so much from Music TT Spotlight program. This professional advice, guidance, knowledge. If you want to get that edge in your creativity as an artist, I would highly recommend you be a part of this program.
I really recommend this Spotlight program because it's a good camp for artists. It's just all about developing you as an artist no matter how far along you are, no matter where you want to go with it. It's something I would recommend to anybody. We've come so far, not far enough. Some days we fall, then we're rising up. Dream till it's real. I'm Tanila Moore and I'm a singer-songwriter from Trinidad but I have been living all over the world and I'm currently living in the States which I'm sure you can tell from my accent. My music is a mix between pop, reggae and hip-hop. I sing and I rap and last year I put together a proposal to Music TT for support in the work that I'm doing and was successful in receiving support from them. I'm extremely grateful for that because I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing without that. I would encourage anyone who's thinking about putting together a proposal for Music TT to do it. I think that Trinidad has some of the most talented artists that I've ever met and I've worked with people from all around the world including Shaggy, Mr. Vegas, Bungie Garland from our very own Trinidad and Tobago, John Legend, Pixie Lott, the Black Eyed Peas crew, Michael Franti's team. I'm working right now with some of the producers that work with Chance the Rapper. The progress that I've been making has been incredible. I am currently actually in Las Vegas because I'm working with Erica Badu's management team now. And I've been in LA for the past month. I am working with a bunch of producers here. I've been working with Trini producers as well. The most recent was track seven. We did a song together and also I did a song with Caleb Hart. I've been doing a lot. I have a song called I Am A Girl that was picked up by the United Nations as their anthem for International Women's Day. In LA, I'm working with some of the people at The Record Plant, one of the best studios in LA, to do a relaunch of the song I Am A Girl that will be released later this year with some massive features on the song. With the help of Music TT, I put out two videos. One of them was called Bad Name, which speaks about the importance of consent and is in support of the Me Too movement and Time's Up, so obviously very relevant to what's happening in the world today around gender equality and female empowerment. And then I put out another song called The Grace, and that song features some voices from women in Tanzania because I have an organization in Tanzania called EPIC, where we drill clean water wells and do community growth and development. So on The Grace, I sampled some of the women's voices from Tanzania and used them on that song as well. The video for The Grace was shot and edited entirely with the support of Music TT. Same thing for Bad Name. I think that it's so important that the government continues to support the work of our incredible artists. Truthfully, the talent in Trinidad is some of the best that I've seen. So thank you to all the team at Music TT for supporting what I'm doing and supporting me in this current project. Looking forward to working with you all some more. I have a lot of things in the works, some of which I can't even talk about yet, but I'm very excited about. I'm gonna continue doing everything in my power to represent Trinidad in the best possible way. Support Music TT, they're doing great things. Red, white, and black, all the way. Hey, this is Ruel Lynch. And as a music producer, I am always listening out for the latest inspiration for my beats and information on the music business. That is why I am sharing all the information about the Trinidad and Tobago International Standard Recording Code, TTISRC. It is a code that will improve our local industry because it will measure, track, and index sound recordings from our country. Plus, this code is required by digital distribution companies to sell our music online. So for me, any track I'm producing for my artist will have this unique code. Join the movement with me and get the international standard recording code for all your new releases. Music TT Export Academy is an initiative geared towards music business education and capacity building through workshops, conferences, and webinars. Music TT partners with stakeholders in the local music industry 
to host conferences annually. You want to win a gold medal and you started training last week. It doesn't happen so. So why disrespect this industry by trying to do the same thing? It does not work. It will never, ever work. As Music TT seeks to build capacity in the music industry, topics are determined by current trends that can have an impact on revenue generation, as well as highlighting opportunities that have export potential. What I got out of it, I got a lot of clarity in terms of understanding how um, the differences of exploitation, because we hear the word and we're afraid when we hear exploiting the music. And so I was able to understand how the positive sides of exploitation of music really works for you as a songwriter, as an artist. Reverb is Music TT's webinar series where veterans of the music industry share their knowledge and experience. It's streamed live on the last Thursday of every month and a replay of the webinar is posted on our YouTube page. Be sure to subscribe to be notified.